What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Time is the Only Luxury. Today, we have my king, Andrew Birchwell, joining us. Andrew Birchwell is from the great state of Ohio, went to Ohio State, worked at Battelle as a geologist for several years, and is an absolute genius. He uh, left Battelle a few years ago and got into the world of Bitcoin and blockchain. He is uh, leading the charge for Bitcoin and blockchain. Uh, all over the United States and particularly uh, Ohio and Texas. Uh, he is the head of the Ohio Blockchain Council. His Twitter handle is Salinator, S A A L I N A T O R. And uh, Andrew's a genius. We've known each other for several years. We met through Bitcoin and Twitter. And when I moved back to uh, Ohio from California, we connected and we've been building a great relationship for five or six years now starting online and transitioned in IRL and um, it was great to sit down and talk with him today. We talk about everything under the sun. We started drinking whiskey halfway through. Uh, I hope you all enjoy the conversation. I had a great time. Enjoy the show. We got Andrew Birchwell, one of my kings, joining us today. He's absolutely brilliant. Uh, my man uh, worked at Battelle for many years and recently ventured into the Bitcoin world and is deep in oil and gas industry, is deep in um, basically lobbying right now for Bitcoin in the state of Ohio. And every time we speak, are you having trouble with that? Yeah, it's coming in and out. Is it? Here, let me, yeah. let me just do this. Here, take it out of there. Mm-hmm. Get that. Let's go. Better? Yeah. One, two, one, two, that that works for me. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry. It's not no, no, good, no. It's, uh, it's the, part of it. <clears throat> the other, I haven't, I've never, that's a brand new cable. I literally just opened Fair. it. Fair. So it might not be a great one. Um, um, what's the what's the line? I, I'm I'm not a lobbyist, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn last night. Hey, like that's, yeah. So I yeah, I know you're yeah. not a lot, but that's like the yeah. easy. I think the easiest way to say like you uh, are. Uh, I am an advocate for advocating yeah, for. I am educating towards. Amen. I'm teaching the people. Well, it's it's. I think that's what we're all doing here. Uh-huh. You know what I mean. So I appreciate the the intro, the foresight. I, you know, I can I can uh, acclaim myself in many different ways, but at the end of the day, what are we doing? We're showing up and we're talking about what matters, right? Showing that's, up, baby. That's yeah, it. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So tell me, what have you been up to lately? I'd love to, why don't you give me uh, and everybody else, you know, I, I was hyping you up saying how brilliant you are and he really is incredible. His, uh, his Twitter handle is Salinator with two A's. I like Salinator. Salinator. I like that. Okay. All this right, was, right. So this was a throwback to Latin class in high school. Uh-huh. We were, you know, you choose your name. You're like, you got to fit in with the ethos of the culture. And uh, Salinator is uh, it's Latin. It's like man of salt. You know okay. what I mean? Which I didn't even intend for that to be useful or interesting to uh-huh. me back then. It was just like, all right, I'll pick that one out. That sounds good. So I've carried that moniker with me for a while, but... Uh, as someone who studies the earth and mm-hmm. is someone who is a, a humble man of the earth, right? It, it, geology, right? That's right. Yeah. Yes. So geology, geophysics, Ohio State. Ohio State. What year? Uh, 2016. Awesome. That's when I graduated. Yeah. Cool. So that was, anyway, uh, how, I, how I led to be called that on Twitter, which is kind of secondary. And I, I have this thought all the time, should I just put my real name on there now? It's like kind of the time for that. It is the time for that. You got to stand out in front. Yeah. You know, it is yeah. what it is. But. Evan just met, made me change mine. We were to, really? Well, we had this deep talk about um, the little dot on. So he has the extra logo on Twitter now. It has the uh, company affiliation. There's yeah. We'll get into that. Uh, but we yes, will. Thousand yes, dollars yes. a month. Is that right? And fifty dollars per employee. I had no idea. And Evan said you pay the protection money. <laughs> and and I was like, man, this the whole conversation made me like. So I need to change my profile pic to my brand and he was like absolutely fucking literally and I'm like oh okay. sure I literally did it like as soon as we hung up as, as soon as we were done talking I picked my phone up and like changed my profile picture to my logo and ch- didn't change my name so it's I'm still it is heaven as my regular name but I think there is something to be said about you're at a time where you are very visible you are gaining momentum in the mm. space. And yes, you probably should be going by your name, my king. So continue. I appreciate that. Well, the brand is my name. I think you're the it same is. way, right? Yeah. And it's just towards what direction are you using the brand for? And so I just got the blue check mark, right? That was my Amen. step in the Amen. right direction, Good right? Job. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So I was like, all right, I'll participate, you uh-huh. know, whatever the cost is. That protection money. 
Yeah, I, you can look at it that way, absolutely. Um, even as it relates to protecting yourself against uh, false prophets, right? People yeah. using your name in vain. Yep. Uh, this is, so this is an interesting part is that I think I've watched a lot of people get recognizable enough to be imitatable, mm -hmm. like, it, it, whether that's malicious or otherwise, right? Oh, it takes us one split second interaction to be effectively malicious. It doesn't take fair. a long... Yeah. Right. We're always on the knife's edge, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. It's uh, so in that way, right? There's value in protecting that brand. So, like for you, you've built over a decade's worth of content that just mm -hmm. sits there under that moniker, and therefore you should blast that from the mountaintops yeah. as best you sure. can, right? Even sure. if it's just on a t-shirt. I love mm -hmm. the which mm -hmm. I need to get the green t-shirt by the way. I know I've, I've yeah. got it. I wrote it down. I've got a yeah. whole list of merch updates to make. I'm good. just like right, I right. got a lot of content coming. So good. That's good. Well, I was just listening to Quench on the my way king. over. It's, my king. It just gets better every time. Thanks. I appreciate, I appreciate you. that. Thank you. But uh yeah, so in that way, right, um and I, I said this recently, like, man, I kind of miss being anonymous mm -hmm. in some ways, sure. right? Because there is value in there not having is. those stakes associated. Yeah. But the games are real. And I think if they're meaningful enough, you do stand out in front. You mm -hmm. do like, all right, I'm going to put my whole reputation on mm -hmm. this behind this because mm -hmm. it's important, mm -hmm. right? So that's the moment. That's what we're doing. And whether that's for Bitcoin, I think, is secondary. I think there's there are so many things that are worth doing right now. Yes, so. absolutely. Well, I think... Our energy has been. I mean, we bro a, another king here that I was. I met through Bitcoin. If it weren't for Bitcoin, Andrew and I would not know each other. Um, most of my friends in my life right now, if it weren't for Bitcoin, I wouldn't be friends with. Bitcoin is really what resonated internally that brought us the gravity, brought us all together, which is very interesting. And it brought us together in a time when Bitcoin wasn't the Bitcoin we know today, and now it's really gained. The, the density and the gravity that we knew it had years mm -hmm. ago, but now it's picking up in the populace and that's manifesting in your life. I've seen recent pictures of you at the state building in DC. Can, what are you, what are you doing? Where are you at out there? What's, what's the goal? What's the agenda? What are those trips looking like? Well, most recently, right, I was in Miami, so that's a very different Amen. type of state house, right? <laughs> <laughs> you were, yes. That is, that is not the same conversation, <laughs> um, but they're similar. I mean, I think we had two presidential candidates get up on stage in Miami and, wow. and speak to Bitcoin, right? Awesome. Accept Bitcoin in terms of campaign donations. So pivotal moment, like mm -hmm. these things are moving. Um, you know, what's happening behind the scenes is a lot of conversation. This is the advocacy education part of it, which is that there's so much to talk about that's new. Mm -hmm. How do you effectively communicate that to stakeholders that are thinking about a million things mm -hmm. and aren't necessarily picking up on this topic is topic number one, right? Mm -hmm. I think it is for a lot of good reasons that are nothing to do with tokenomics, for mm -hmm. instance. We can get into that. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's like the communication channels are still so analog. It's literally, you got to show up. Yep. You have to be in the building. And in order to get in the building or into the room, you know, it helps to know the process. It helps to know the people. At the end of the day, I've noticed things happen at the speed of relationship. And Amen. therefore, the relationships are the most important thing in the world. Mm -hmm. Like you talk currency and value, mm -hmm. right? We talk about this all the time. It is truly showing up. in relationship, showing mm -hmm. up for Trust. those. Right? Yes. yes, all of those things are built and inherent in that process. So D.C. or Columbus, either way, right? Mm -hmm. The federal or the state, state house, um, there is this process of deliberation that requires good input. We are only as valuable as our information set, right? So if it's bad information, mm -hmm. you're going to make bad decisions. And this sure. is part of the process. And I'm learning about that process where I used to maybe think it's kind of a dirty game, this politics. And it can be. We're seeing sure, that right now. It like can be. We're in the middle of the largest. Everything's you know, dirty from the outside well, looking in. And, and, and certain things can be especially dirty either direction, right? Like we're going yeah. through this public corruption scandal in Ohio that's just enormous. What is that? Tell me. I'm not even hip to this. I'm sorry. I don't want to derail us. No, no, no. Come back, but it's, I'd love to hear this. It's actually relative. Um, so Larry Householder is the name. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a, a former representative, I think Speaker of the House. Uh, don't quote me on that, but basically uh, was involved in a public corruption scandal that related to energy company in Ohio and, and decisions that were made, you know, through various means. And so basically the implications of it being that, um, you know, the energy and politics intersection became very 
uh, corrupted by the relationships and by the decisions made therein. And therefore, uh, this is a person that's now under indictment, you know, Ooh. soon to be sentenced, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So was this money, money laundering? Is this like giving people deals or like, uh, what? I, th- I think it was illicit deal making through allegedly. You know, t- yeah, sure. Right. I think it's still in process, <laughs> yeah. but you know, the, the whole thing is playing itself out pretty apparently that there was, there were some, you know, conversations that were had inappropriately and decisions made therein because of that. Mm-hmm. And, um, especially because it relates to energy, which is a big topic for mm-hmm. you know all kinds of reasons, especially as it relates to even the types of energy that are involved here, right? So like you're talking about my background with oil and gas, which mm-hmm. you want to talk about an industry that is viewed from the public perspective as a, a maligned industry for a lot of reasons. You can say that it is for sure. Um, you know, nuclear is kind of similar in the same way, which is that if you build something large enough, it has its own gravity and thus its own politic, and therefore it needs to be treated with care. So this is the nature of big systems and big games is we need to treat them with care, right? Um, and I don't think that there's anything more primary than energy. This is like, Amen. right? So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, that's the biggest game. Mm-hmm. And when we talk about Bitcoin or anything else, right, it is fundamentally about the energy that's created, that's given, that's, Mm -hmm. you know, um, distributed, right? Mm -hmm. So it is an example of how we can take the public system and do it ineffectively. And therefore, you know, we're sort of holding this example up as a way that we can showcase, well, at least we're going to hold those people accountable if they do things improperly, right? Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the, the one side of the spectrum. The other side of the spectrum is simply just that, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a farmer from a rural county in Ohio, my politic is not necessarily going to have me be focused on uh, information systems or information technology. So how do you reach those people, right? How do you speak to the promise of Bitcoin or any digital technology to somebody that's thinking about how to maximize the number of bushels of corn that they're going to generate sure. in any given year, right? So like these are these are translatable, but they are very different things. And so that's... Largely what I see my role as right now is being the translator. Uh, this is all about language. It's all about the words we use and making sure we use the right words and say them with intention. and To the right people. Right words always. to the right people. The, yes. the right things at the right time with the right uh-huh. people, right? Like right. this is this yeah. is the game. So Awesome. So how was Miami? Really good. Really different than last year. Mm-hmm. Oh, been, you went last year too. I've been the last three years. Good and for so you. you get to you're see. You're out here now, boy. You out. You're in Texas all the time, yeah, DC. Yeah. You're in Miami. I've got you're, that Miami tan over. right now. Yes, yes, you do. You if, do. If it were not for Bitcoin, I would not have gone to Miami ever. And so, you know, being able to see the differences, being able to see 2021 to 2023 and kind of the ebb and flow of the industry, mm-hmm. um, this year was a very subdued year as, as sort of we feel within this space right now. But the people that show up in those times are the people, yeah, right? Like yeah. that's where the signal it's like Bitcoin's, is found. I feel Bitcoin's never been more exciting at the agree. at the moment. I would agree. And the people who are excited about it at the moment, I feel, are most most not maybe the most knowledgeable group of the people paying attention, um, or at least most interested at, at the moment. Maybe not most most knowledgeable. Some may be tuned out at any time, mm. but it, at least tuned in. And like the whole ordinals things, and like you brought up fetum, and I never heard that word until last time we spoke. Okay, and I've seen it, yeah, a hundred times. Right, I must have just been scrolling by it, not thinking anything of it. But now I'm seeing it in articles. I'm seeing it on Twitter all the time. And so, what when you go down, what does that look like? What, how long were you there? What's the what are the events are you hitting? And like, what's your goal while you're there? Is there real agenda based hmm. movements, or is it uh, really connecting dots and just networking? may get myself in trouble here. Um, I am the type of person that does this best when I'm able to flow with it. Amen. Yeah, And absolutely. therefore, I try yeah. really hard not to over-prepare or plan. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are certain things... You got to be ready to go to the party. You never know where the party is, yeah. necessarily. And so I was there Thursday to Sunday. I kind of took a light week because we had an event here in Ohio that I had to go to on Thursday, which it would be worth talking about, too, just because there's a lot of fun stuff in what Ohio, as we know. Oh, it's uh, Ohio X is the group, and they threw uh-huh. like a tech summit. And this was the oh, yearly cool. event. Uh-huh. Uh, and this is where at. This was at the Ohio Union on campus, oh, Ohio cool. State campus. Okay. Um, so Chris Berry, Ohio X, they do a really tremendous job of doing for tech what I'm trying to do specifically for, let's say, blockchain, just generally, right? Mm-hmm. Which is advocate, spearhead, really organize the industry to notice the moment that's happening here in Ohio. Mm-hmm. And it's a lot easier to notice that when you can pull in the intels of the world, sure. right? So that's that's the kind of game that we're playing right now is showcasing 
you know, the economic development promise of Ohio. And through that, the relationships and connectivities that are being built to create the Silicon Heartland. Have you, like, are you hip to this moniker, Silicon Heartland? No, I've never heard that. That really piqued my interest right when you said it. And I was like, Silicon Heartland, that's mm-hmm, a pretty mm-hmm. cool term. What's, so we're, this, this is popping up now? This we're is what branding. it is? Yeah, so I'm wearing uh, Built in Ohio, yes. which is uh, the t-shirt that's maybe the second iteration of what Chris and Ohio X has done. The first one was the Silicon Heartland t-shirt, which you may have seen around and, and maybe oh, just not keyed into it. Uh-huh. It's like the state seal kind of, but it's with the Silicon Heartland moniker, which is obviously to capture some branding and attention from Silicon Valley and mm-hmm. find its home here in Ohio. And so obviously with capital flight and you know tech flight moving mm-hmm. away from the coasts, we're looking for where the next place is, right? Austin is very hip to the community and the scene kind of. <laughs> But they're kind of past their moment in some it respects, feels, right? It, my boys that live there say so. They, I, would, they I would agree. say so, yes. And therefore, what's next? I think we kind of keyed into this very early, yeah. and it's the same vibe, which is this is coming here. It's coming here in a big way. Absolutely. Let's be ready for it, and let's lean into it by talking about it in a very positive light. And so Silicon Heartland was... You know, I think it had a little bit to do with a lot of the data center development that was happening out sure. in New Albany, for mm-hmm. instance, right? So, like, you could see the first entrance, and, and we actually see this in Bitcoin the same way, which is, like, you need servers to do all of this no matter what. Yeah. So that's the first step, and where do you put those? And that became a huge economic development potential for Columbus and the general mm-hmm. region. But then built on top of that's all the other stuff that's really interesting. And therefore, let's also talk about it like we're meaningfully trying to be the next place to be. You know, Silicon Valley really captured the hearts and minds. Silicon Heartland is just bringing it, it good. back. It sounds good. It sounds really it good. It really flows. Was this a decision made of like, we're going to start branding this and we need to do this at some level? Mm. Or is it just this bubble up organically and has become its own thing? Or is this like official... We're trying to push this. Somebody definitely curated that, and then it became a proliferation technique. And so I think Chris and others latched onto it and said, we obviously want to promote this idea through our platform. And then then it was on shirts, and then you saw it everywhere. And now, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just just what we call it now. Sure. You know what I mean? It is interesting. I mean, several people I know, including my brother and one of my best friends, Brooklyn, both moved back here, and they're both tech guys from San... Not from San... They're from here originally, Mm -hmm. but had good starts to their career in SF, were there at the peak and came back here. And the last two years, conversations have been, they can't believe how much capital is here. Mm -hmm. They can't believe how many VCs are here. They can't believe how much funding is being raised all over the place here. And it seems like there is quite a shift in the tech landscape. And I know they pushed this in Ohio. They started pushing this in like 2007, eight of like, tech in Ohio is the next big thing. And it seems like those cats were just super early. Yeah. They knew what, uh, when I was leaving Ohio and like, I got to get to LA, I've got to get out of here. Those people were like, tech is coming to Ohio. And we were like, no, it's not. (laughs) We're going to San Francisco in LA. And like my brother's getting his first job at Box. Brooklyn started up an app. And then 10 years later, 12 years, 13, COVID hits, and bam, tons of people we know are back here in Columbus working at those same jobs or similar companies, global monsters, working from home in Columbus, Ohio, little small towns all over the place. And now you mentioned Intel, Johnstown houses are going for six, seven, eight hundred bands mm-hmm. for small 1,500 square foot, two bedroom, three bedroom ranch houses and whoo yeah i mean it hasn't even started yet it well, literally has i mean it started but it hasn't started officially like, i still feel very early yes and it's like where is this really going to go is this really ready player one that mm. we're ramping to right now with uh, this server farms and everything i need to read that book first have you not read it <laughs> no, i haven't even <laughs> yeah. seen the movie i'm sending it to you tonight as Thank soon as you. we're done yeah. i'm sending it to you well and i keep referencing it too because i know the context of it and i know the timeline and so i think that's worthy as a reference point to say all right what would columbus look like in 2050 assuming this mm-hmm. this rise but through that lens right like 2007 we barely had the iphone at that point like, yeah think of how yeah. far ago that really was mm-hmm. in terms of where we are technologically 
So of course n- you didn't believe that this was coming. Sure. Nobody did. Yeah. 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 The economic developers were not sure about it. They were like, <laughs> it was a guess. That this would is be amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, and to hear them, <laughs> to hear them talk about the process of even bringing Intel in, mm-hmm. like I've, I've heard the Lieutenant governor talk about this very specifically about the process they undertook and what it used to look like for them to try to do this compared to what it looks like now. Mm-hmm. And the speed at which we were able to do this, the, um, the, the premier position they held within the basket of candidates to do something like this really speaks to where Ohio's promise always was uh, in terms of available land, resources like water, right, a workforce that mm-hmm. could be developed to work around it, like truly a unique and special place to do that exact thing. It just felt like for the longest time people were thinking like you were thinking, which was, yeah, but like I'd rather live by the beach though, yeah. right? Like yeah. there's something else there too. And you've been there. I have not really spent much time. I just think it was the internet. <clears throat> so I mean, it was a slow internet that really did it. If I couldn't transfer hmm. files and you need to be at the party, you mm-hmm, know, for mm-hmm. some, you need to be at some parties. Like it just has to happen and you have to be in person. It's, you can't meet all the people I've met in the music world in Columbus, Ohio. It's true. At, you couldn't in 2007, eight, when I left in 2005, you definitely couldn't. And like, I mean, you're going to Miami to meet people. You're going to DC to meet people. Yeah. And it def and it definitely works. Yes. Anybody listening, definitely go show the fuck up Always. where where you think the people are. That's definitely where they are. Like, I wouldn't have met Kanye if I wouldn't have went to LA and yeah, like yeah. wanted to meet Kanye. Like, you gotta w- see it and then put yourself where the seeing it is. And that's how I think all the things align. And it feels. To me, that that's starting to come to Ohio. It's still mm-hmm. we don't have enough people here yet, but I have been out at some places here in Ohio in the last <clears throat> several months where there are some hitters out in the at a steakhouse or wherever, and it's like, oh shit! Like, we're, I just found out. I can't. Even, I guess well, how when's it come out? Cut it out. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So I just found out that Dave Chappelle mm-hmm. is doing a show in Bell Fountain sure. at a tiny little theater, like a you know, thousand people, and I'm like, what? Mm-hmm. I'm definitely going, yeah, and yeah. like. The, that to me feels like a step in this direction of even the accessibility to earth and all spaces has expanded. So why wouldn't you go where the best land is, the best water, the best workforce? And mm. where's, I don't, you know. Truly, right? <laughs> yes. And this is, um, this is what was underappreciated, except if you have been here enough to see it in depth, because mm-hmm. it takes, a, you have to look a little bit to find it, I think. And part of that is the story of, uh, let's just say, the rust beltification of it all, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I I think 100 years ago, this was a glorious place all around. And then we built some factories. Those factories went away. Things fell into disrepair, et cetera. Like, I can see see a narrative of why people wanted to leave certain places at certain Mm -hmm. times. Definitely don't uh, get confused about the differences between places like that in those moments in time. But now it's like we have the internet everywhere, like you said. Uh, people are orienting themselves around things that are a different value set than perhaps they used to, yeah. right? And so, like, maybe music aside, because you're absolutely right, LA is the place to be there. Um, at the end of the day, I think most people want security, they want community, they want, uh, let's say, they want the potential of being able to do grand things no matter what those things are yes. and therefore yes. you like you said you have to be where those grand things are happening yes. it's gravity always right so imagine if you know the silicon valley vc money that concentrated tech talent in san francisco san jose etc um could also potentiate itself out of cincinnati mm-hmm. that would be interesting cincinnati is yes, a pretty great place pretty great uh, city right? absolutely a lot of uh, permanence in in cincinnati and a yes. lot of heavy hitters already mm-hmm. png ge mm-hmm. fifth third like all of these places were headquartered there people just forgot because you know the attention economy moved elsewhere for a while um but what what is there what remains is this spirit of is this like vestige of greatness Mm -hmm. just ready for it this is why like joey burrow was able to come in you're right good just like yeah rally the spirit of the whole community behind him as a young leader 100 percent. what they needed was a spark of hope Mm -hmm. and yeah and now now it's looking like every year like everybody's back to the super bowl champs and like thinking like we got a shot every year again it's on and you're right it did just take a little bit of hope and i feel like 
you know, and over the last year getting to hear your stories, it feels like you're kind of that guy. You're waiting for the team of the Bengals to really stamp you as the quarterback of this. And it feels like that may have began to ha- begun to happen. And like the ball is rolling of you're one of the guys they're trusting with the ball to start throwing these passes around Ohio. I, I appreciate that. I, th- uh-huh. I think so too. I'm, I'm humbled by that always when we talk about this. Uh-huh. I think, I think you're right. Um, and I can't throw the football a little bit, you know, so it's, it's not, <laughs> Shout out Kobe. And not a, dis- <laughs> yeah, right. I, I do need to prove myself in that dimension always. Um, but there, there should be no question there as far as my ability to throw a ball. The, the, the real work of it, and you're right, is you know, how, do you, how do you rally the team to do big things, mm-hmm. to um, achieve extraordinary results in whatever dimension you're playing in? I ask myself all the time, what's well, the dimension we're playing in? Like, what's the real game? What are we actually doing mm-hmm. here? Right? And um, I can think about many different ways to describe the process and the technical work. But this is a, a political lens at the, at the end of the day. And I think what I'm actually trying to do is uplift whole communities mm-hmm. into the new digital economy and through that revitalize the spirit of hope everywhere we go. And in order to do that, you need to give people something meaningful that they can latch onto, that they can understand that benefits them right now. Mm-hmm. Um, that's actually a tricky problem when it comes to the industry we're in. How do I showcase digital technology that's innovative is going to benefit you. It's actually Mm -hmm. a really hard problem because it's technical, because it's complicated. Um, But you show up in a town that has very little and you simply develop relationships and showcase um, abundance mindset, Mm -hmm. right? Um, I don't need you to know exactly how we get there. I just want you to believe that we can get there. Mm -hmm. Like that's that's the hope. This is is. is what you... What you sell if you're, you know, trying to garner votes. Thankfully, I'm not running for election right now. So, yeah, it, yeah. right yeah. now, yeah. hit him with the right now. Yeah. Amen. Uh, campaign finance laws are real, uh, but at the end of the day, you are showcasing that it can be better than it is, and that we can do that together. And I think that, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. There is a there is a very strong team organizing itself right now to do this in Ohio because it is meant to be done in Ohio. And I think for that reason, it is really fun to be here right now and to notice yes, that and is. to be early. It, sometimes it can be very painful to be early because mm-hmm. everybody doesn't see what you see. But when you see it and when you believe it and when you find other people who also believe it and then you build in unison, oh man, it like yeah. better than you could imagine mm-hmm. is, is the word, right? Yeah. And yeah, that, it absolutely. feels like that's Ohio's moment the next 10 years is it's going to be better than we could imagine. I think so too. It feels, you know, I just moved back. I was gone for 15 years total, um, two chunks. But to come back to Ohio, Columbus in 2021, really been ama- amazing. I don't know another word other than amazing. I mean, it seems... I'm getting more done than ever before. I'm working with all the people that I've met all over the country. And it took having those same connections in LA or the people I knew in SF, but it also really took the infrastructure of high-speed internet, podcasting, FaceTiming, iPhone, to where we're all so connected that I'm seeing people in LA via FaceTime as much as I see some of my family here in Columbus and like to me, I I don't know about how you feel about FaceTime, but I've done FaceTime enough now that it does feel like I'm just hanging with a person. Like I can just leave them on and like, they're just kicking it in the room with me. I can be working on whatever. And that has really opened the door to collaboration that I did not see possible for years. And with internet as fast as it is now, I'm sending whole sessions in two minutes, you know, a a huge session in 10 minutes or something. And they have it in 15. Mm. They're ready to, they're working in 15 minutes. And it's like, the only thing better than that, that I could imagine is maybe we had some headsets on and I could see you in the room, some AMR, you know, mixed reality type appearance to where we could jam together. But that's not, I don't really need that. And I question if I want it because I am more creative on my own, alone in a room for three hours than I am usually with a group of people. And at least my personally, but that's just a personal, you know, a personal anecdote. But it's, 
it definitely feels everything feels way more connected and way more achievable right now. When you talk about abundance, that's really all I see out here anymore. It's it's really tough to not see abundance unless you're not in a great headspace at this. Like it's impossible to see like how much food, we're, like we're wasting food. Mm-hmm. Like if, when's the last time you talked to somebody that would like disagree with the fact that we're wasting food? <laughs> and like the problem becomes like, how do we not waste food? How do we get this waste distributed to where people aren't starving? It's like, well, it's either not profitable or they don't want that. They want people to starve. <laughs> and like that is... <clears throat> The energy I think that we're trying to get over now is what world do we want and really trying to have a collective vision and it's about how are we presenting it and like you're sharing the abundance energy, I feel like that's where we are is we need visionaries at the moment that see what the world looks like in 10 years or at least have a good idea of what a better place could be and I don't know if those ideas, and maybe I'm wrong, are as achievable in a place like San Francisco today as they are in Columbus, Ohio, or surrounding cities that have cities, suburbs that are still mm-hmm. tons of space to build, tons of uh, natural resources available. It hasn't been uh, mined yet. Ah. If, <laughs> if you, you know, it's ah. like, <laughs> and, and like we can see the potential. Yeah. And we can, and we also have this very recent history that is like homelessness, crime, whatever you want to call it, uh, epidemic in San Francisco. And we see that there are better ways to do this. And it's like, I don't know if we saw better ways in 2016, 2017 SF. It was like, this place is fucking insane. They've got the Warriors, they've got football teams, they've got the Giants, they're winning all the World Series. Like, Seem like this is it, but it only lasted for eight years. Yeah, give it give it a decade for the benefit of doubt. Mm-hmm. Everything works until it doesn't. I think that's the moment, and so pay attention to the logistics of it all. Why 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 is San Francisco where it is? Is mm-hmm. a fun question. I think maybe it was you that tweeted a thread about that at one point. It walked through the history of the gold rush. Mm-hmm. I have and, some things about it, but I don't know. Super well, and, and, and I, I won't get it right here, but I think directionally, what I gleaned from that was that there was a <clears throat> there was a logistical reason why San Francisco ended up where it is, of course, right? Because mm-hmm. you want to settle and center around something that's meaningful from a resource allocation and distribution perspective, right? And especially when the moment was gold, right? This was mm-hmm. 1849. We're just digging and we're, you know, like (laughs) literal movement of an entire population of people to go to that place specifically because of the promise, the hope, the potential Mm -hmm. of getting rich digging for gold, right? Mm. Somebody said to me at the Ohio X event last week that it feels like the moment here in Ohio right now is our 1849 moment, truly. interesting. And I, I, I had to triangulate that a little bit to kind of get after... You know, it's pretty obvious, right? 1849, like the 49ers, right. it, that's that's a gold rush term, right? Mm-hmm. There was a moment in time where it was just like starting. The seed had been planted. The spark of hope was building around it. And then the gravitational center that was San Francisco was born out of that. Um, and so like you said, all of that attention, all of that capital, all of that talent, all of that ambition and spirit of possibility, the thought of what could be is moving here now. And and there are a few different reasons I think we could tangibly talk about why that is. There are some abstract ones that are fun to talk about too, mm-hmm. but uh, Mark Fahmy of Drive Capital formerly, or I think he's still on the, the board, um, was a San Francisco VC guy. And I think from Ohio, and he you know was trying to convince people, trying to pull them back, trying to say, you know, hey, the moment's going to be there. Right, mm-hmm. so let's get ahead of it, and that was kind of a hard conversation for a little he while. He was an SF guy, huh? Yeah, yeah. I think I think spent several decades uh, doing that that and game out there, now. and I think he's back here now, full uh-huh. time. Um, I don't want to speak to where he lives, but right, the right, point right, is, he's right, building right. in Ohio yeah, and sure, focused yeah. on Ohio Stop now that, from yeah, the sure. from the perspective of what we're saying, which is that um, you know people are looking for something else now. The gravitational center of ideas 
is moving and it could move to many different places, but mm -hmm. one of those places is definitely here and it's definitely. worth figuring out why mm -hmm. and it's worth leaning into that. And just like that 1849 moment, it's, I don't think anybody could have ever envisioned what San Francisco would have become out right. of that initial gold sure. rush. That, that would have been insane, mm -hmm. right? Like, try to imagine skyscrapers and mm -hmm. iPhones, et cetera. But that's kind of where we are right now is that we actually have no idea what's coming. We just kind of yeah. know it's being built out of this. And so therefore, you know, the responsibility part of this comes in very quickly to me, which is like, all right, we've been given an opportunity. It's mm -hmm. a really big one. Um, we have to we have to treat this with care. We have to be really, really thoughtful about what we're doing here because it will matter a hundred years from now. Mm -hmm. And that's an that's an old idea because the spirit of industrialization was built here in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that they understood that what we were building was a new type of machine. We're just doing the same thing, but this machine is orders of magnitude more impactful in ways we could not predict. Uh, so the Ready Player One of it is kind of that pseudo dystopic perspective of man we can really build this in ways that are complicated mm -hmm. right and i think that's always the possibility um so what are we building what are we building for dave Chappelle's is a good example of thinking thoughtfully about community yeah, absolutely i don't know if you know much about his entrance into that uh, housing battle down there in yellow springs um, i know some small things but if you have some details i'd love to hear them i think just um, generally speaking i think he is on the side of trying to maintain the spirit and vitality of Yellow Springs as a small community, right? Because mm -hmm. he is his own gravity. Sure. You can imagine how just that one seed right there will will attract this yeah. force mm -hmm. of new development of, you know... Comedy club, whatever it whatever is. Whatever it yeah. is, right? And I, I, I think that, you know, he may be painted as somebody who's trying to argue against low-income housing or something like that. Like, I don't think that's the spirit of what he's trying to do. I just think he sort of sees that, like, hey, I've seen what L.A. can become, right? Mm -hmm. Like that kind of downside risk of a community getting too big for itself mm -hmm. in some respect. Uh, and anyway, I think that that's part of the reason why he probably settled here was to get away from that. And I think at the end of the day, you know, we as community members ought to be very thoughtful about... Um, the way in which we grow and what we grow towards. And, you know, I, I do think that's the moment. Like we've talked about this, Johnstown, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, we have an opportunity to build whole communities now. We're revitalizing whole communities, turning 10,000 population centers into 50,000 population centers. Maybe, maybe way more. What does that look like? Yeah. yeah, how do you build that? How do you build that well? How do you build that such that you don't remove the soul and character from the place, right? Like, those are the questions we should be asking. The means too are, are sort of secondary details. I think the, the real important question, which is unsolvable here, but worth talking about is what actually is worth building? Mm -hmm. what, what, what would we like to spend the rest of our lives doing? Uh, there's some simple answers to that. You know, like mm -hmm. if I could chill by the water, just yeah. hang out with friends, you know, mm -hmm. live a good life with the family. Like that's a pretty Get straightforward. Get Amazon deliveries. Whatever sure. it takes. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's not a drone dropping them over my house. Yeah, you know I what think I mean? That's like, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in the name of efficiency and logistics, we make choices, right? And this is, I, I think that's the story of San Francisco. I think uh, Jeffrey West writes about this really elegantly in the book Scale. We've talked about that a little bit. And I reference that often when I think about the positives and negatives that come from centralization and concentration. And that's when you do things from a logistics and efficiencies perspective, you will get the downside uh, externalities of, you know, for instance, crime, homelessness, drug addiction, Heaven et cetera. Means you right? get to feel hell too. <laughs> Energy. Amen. Amen. Um, and, and perhaps that push pull is always there. This is, so this is the tough part about abundance. Yeah. You mean it's going to go up forever? Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's mm -hmm. a hard thing to think about. There will always be challenges. It's interesting to talk, to think about that. And that's, was one of mine and Kay's early complaints uh, coming back to Columbus, uh, early we were getting Ubers going out a few places and grabbing lifts someplace, Uber someplace, trying to see what we liked here, as opposed to Southern California, you can get either one, you're fine, good to go, they're there in three minutes, whatever. Here, we got some lifts early on that were not lit. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, like one night we left uh, Marcella's in the short north and got like the cheap lift. And that's what we got in LA is in LA, a cheap lift is a nice, usually a nice, a pretty nice newer car. Uh, here we had a, maybe a 1998 Blazer on like 24 inch spinners. 
Hell yeah. With the driver smoking a black and mild with the windows down and like smoke coming out of the car as we're approaching the car. I'm like, this is definitely our vehicle. Not great. It's like, hey, you for Cameron? Yep. Yep. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And like, we just giggle and get in and like, yeah. All right, we'll make a different decision next time. And like, right. It is what it is. My brother, who lived in San Francisco for eight, nine years, he says, you can't get the level of service and excellence of San Francisco unless you also have people shitting in the street. Hmm. It just doesn't. He's like, it's not happening. You're not getting, uh, like here in Columbus today, you can't get Uber Blacks. Mm -hmm. You can here and there, but a lot of times you're going to be waiting 15, 20, 30 minutes to get a nice SUV to come pick you and your three or four guy friends up that shouldn't be riding in a small vehicle. In LA, they're all day, every day. It's literally what they, you know, it's like whole fleets of vehicles that are teamed together using Uber, pooling tips, doing all kinds of fun crowdsourced experimentations to get the most, to milk the most out of that system. Here, there is not that level of competition yet to drive that level of service. And that goes for restaurants, that goes for pretty much everything. And that's what I'm interested in seeing uh, advance is I would really like to see, and I don't, that's where I, it worries me of to get the handful of a, a Michelin star, a couple Michelin star restaurants around in the area what, how many people have to be here to support that? And how many people with money have to be here to support that five, seven days a week? And then what is the population or the, the infrastructure required to get those people here? And it feels like we're really close. It feels like because we already have Polaris, New Albany, Dublin, um, casino area whatever you want to call that and then grove city um and even i guess maybe reynoldsburg out black lick area those are like pretty good strong hubs Mm -hmm. that are their own you can call them a suburb but like dublin's barely a suburb dublin's Dublin city in in the waiting yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. and like what is that what is it going to look like as we move forward and we do like is it going to be is this Are we seeing the early visions and the early ideas of like what LA is of like Hollywood, North Hollywood, Santa Monica, Venice, Long Beach, like Long Beach is far away from Hollywood, but they're both LA County. Yeah. And like, that's a 30 minute drive, 40 minute drive and an hour if you're in traffic. And like, is that what we're talking about in Columbus in the next 10 years of a... Yes. Very, um, very explicitly. That's the plan. Whew. It's it's not a what if. It's how. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can look at the map right now, and you can already see the second outer belt. It's, it's yeah, it's yeah. Built, you can right? see it. Like yes, it's, absolutely. It's already yes, you're there. Right. It is. It is pretty shocking. Like when you zoom out a little bit of like, oh, there's already highway yeah. there. It just needs expanded. So right. Make it a little wider, and yeah. then we're talking. Right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's it's inevitable in that way. I think the question you asked originally was, can you have, does one necessitate the other, right? Yeah. That's a harder question for sure. But if you just look at the direction we're heading in general, it is on that um, wave of a magnitude change in terms of quality of life, in terms of infrastructure, mm-hmm. in terms of even just how many tall buildings there are, right? right? This is right. what's any good metric for how large or, you know, say wealthy a downtown area is, is just how many tall buildings can you count? What's the skyline look like? Yeah. yeah so that's, that's the centralizing force. Okay, so we did it that way. Why did we do it that way? Why did we build big, tall buildings in the first place, right? We did it so that we could get the most amount of people in the same place at the same time most effectively, all right? Okay. It's the way we had to do it. We didn't have the internet when we started the skyscraper sure. trend, sure. right? Like sure. it was- That was the, the building that was, was the, the internet. internet. Good the call. the CIA yeah. literally yes. invented- vacuum tube systems of communication within a single building because they wow. needed oh. speed of logistics of communication. They needed that OODA loop shortened. This is all where it comes from, right? So, but that was the way we had to do it then. Mm-hmm. Is that the way we have to do it now? I think is the question I ask. And I don't think we do with the internet. And therefore I do think if we're creative, we can have the Michelin experience and not necessitate the homeless crisis mm-hmm. at the same time. Um, 
I don't think I have the exact answer, but I do believe that like having enough open space to think creatively about where to put everybody is like a good opportunity. Mm -hmm. At the end of it, it's like food. It's like we we absolutely have enough land to hold all the people, right? It was what did we need to do in order to get all of it in one place? And what that led to is, you know, these waves of gentrification, of course, like, you know, as soon as you want to build a new nice area, you got to put the not so nice area somewhere else. And then how do you move those people? And can those people move? And sometimes they get stuck and there's all these problems. Um, like the the Chappelle Yellow Springs circumstance, and we were talking about this this weekend, it's like an open question. When you do a new housing development, do you build the full spectrum of housing? Do you say, well, in this lot, we're going to build homes that are 100,000, homes that are 500,000, and homes that are a million dollars, right? We'll have everywhere, like everybody there all at once. Won't it be great? Like community, right? And I, like, yeah, that's kind of equitable, but I don't actually think that that's robust. Mm -hmm. I I think you're going to, you can't organically build community that way, right? You can organically build community through creating a place where everybody can be and then making the commons accessible to all if they want it. So this is how do you get from Newark to Columbus quickly, right? Mm -hmm. If Newark is the new suburb on that second outer belt to Columbus, that's a 45 minute drive Mm -hmm. more or less. Uh, but can I live in Newark and experience the joys of the Michelin experience in Columbus effectively at any time? I think the answer is pretty simply yes to that. And I think I, you're right. It just requires thought and decisions on like rails and sure. transportation and thoughtfulness about those people and those communities and those experiences. Right. Absolutely. Well, and the trick always has been, um, if I live in Newark, do I have a job that I can meaningfully affect that's close enough to me, right? Mm-hmm. This is why people would want to live close to downtown is those were where the really good jobs were. And I want to live close to that because I don't want to waste time on commute. So it's all that body and space problem over time. And I think through the internet now, we've alleviated some of that pressure of needing to be in the same place at the same time, right? It was all about putting minds in the same room. Mm-hmm. We could do that now through FaceTime, like sure. you're saying. So like that physical space limitation is gone now Mm -hmm. and it's pretty much accessible to everybody, um, you know, soon to be anyway. So I think then you think, all right, uh, how do we build with that understanding and that assumption, which we've never done before. So it's like, it takes an entirely new type of community development to think through those problems. And then, you know, I think all that looks like is thinking through profitability in a different lens. And I think building things that last versus building things that are quick or cheap. And then I think at the end of the day, the hardest problem in all of this, which is what I like thinking about, what we talk about all the time in terms of where we want to go is what does it take to build a really robust and resilient community in and of itself, regardless of where you are? Mm -hmm. And that takes people intending to do that. This is why churches were really powerful. This is why uh, like, getting all of those people on the same page about some idea, even if that idea was just let's survive this winter, right? Like Mm -hmm. we forget how hard it used to be. Um, I think that that, interconnectivity at the local scale is most important. And then, yeah, if I want to live an hour from the city and sometimes go see a crew game, cool. Like, I think that's mm-hmm. great, but I, I do think that's mm-hmm. secondary to this. And It is, and for sure. Like, But I do think the Michelin experience is coming here. And I think we get to be the example of, can we do that without the homeless problem that San Francisco mm-hmm. has? And I, I, I do think we can solve that. I do think there's going to be some hard steps in the middle because that, that takes real work. Like showing up is work. You know what I mean? It is actually hard to do. It takes you getting out of the comfort zone. It takes you getting out of the air conditioner once in a while. Um, But I do think that's our moment. I do think that's like Ohio's potential is it's literally proof of work derived. It is. I was just going to bring this up in a different manner, but go ahead. Yeah, no, it is like the, the showing up of it is the proof of Mm -hmm. work and that interconnectivity is derived from that work therefore the, the, the proof is in the work. Like there's, I I spend a lot of time talking to people about the technical aspects of proof of work. I really love the social aspects of it. I think that's actually what's happening right now is we're all just showing up we're figuring it out and what's going to come from it is going to be better than we could imagine. I I think so too. And that's, so, um, I have some family lives in Akron, lived there forever. Uh, lately when I go up there for the last several years, my energy is like, what the fuck is going on here? Like, the roads are atrocious. 
They make tires. It's known for making tires. And the roads are the most fucked up roads. You hear this acronym, most fucked up roads in the United (laughs) States of America. Ain't nobody got more fucked up roads than y'all. Whoever is responsible should be fired immediately for this circumstance that you all are facing. But that being said, the proof of work is so interesting to me because of what you're talking about of like the abundance energy. What you're really talking about is inspiring thought and inspiring a mindset that is the seed that grows into abundance. And that's something I think about and have talked about with people really close to me for years of, you know, there are bad areas of towns. Why are they dirty? Mm. Is it because the people that live there just don't have any pride or they're not inspired to take care of them? They don't feel like anybody cares about them or their space. Like, it's nobody's fault that nobody comes to your Burger King because your Burger King's a piece of shit or whatever. No, sorry, Burger King. I fucking love Burger King. <laughs> <laughs> like, literally, I tweeted yeah. just the other day, best cheeseburgers yeah. in America. I love Burger it was, King. It was a toss-up between Burger King and McDonald's. <laughs> we just, yeah. And, yeah. like, so, like, what is, like, there's a reason that that uh, center of activity is not booming to, for whatever whatever it is today. But at one time, if all those places were built and all those places then have economic activity of employees, they have customers, they're making tax money, how does that go away? Mm. Like how, what, is it the inspir? is it the idea, is it the seed of inspiration and abundance and love that is lost that causes a community to diminish? Like where... How can a community diminish if you show up and do your fucking job? Like, if you just show up and you're cooking the best burgers and like, like I'll tell you right now, like, if anything happened, I know I could go, I could just go work at any fast food place and in a week people would be like, well, you definitely need promoted or somebody would be like, you need a raise, you need promoted, we got to do something else. Like, you can't just be clean in the bathrooms. I'll be like, I'll keep these bathrooms the cleanest they've ever been. Ah, take a shit, let me see. (laughs) I will, and like, that's just who I am of like, I will keep, I care so much about where I am at any mm-hmm. moment that where I am is going to be the place. Mm-hmm. It's going to be clean. It's going to be respectful. It's going to, when you come in, I want you to have the energy I have and I don't care what it takes. If I have to show up every day for months to get this place to where it needs to be, to where when you walk in, you're like, dang, this is where I want to spend some time. That is just in me. And I don't know if that's inspiration. I don't know if that's ab- abundance energy, but how does an economic center lose that? Like, how do you get to a place where you're only hiring people that aren't inspired and don't think about abundance? And then your entire city is now run down. And we're, I guess my question is like, what is, is that really just the the spark of hey, we can do this, and they need a local leader that really takes charge and is vocal about like what the what's going on here, let's fix it. I think that's definitely part of it. I, you know, Shout out to LeBron, too. It's not his fault that Akron did that, right? And I think you yeah, can do agreed, what you can yeah. do, and there's obviously much more to be done. You know, it's like, like you said, maybe it makes... Maybe it takes two months for you to be recognized as the bathroom cleaning champ that yeah, you are, right? Yeah. Like, day one, it may be actually hard to affect the culture meaningfully. Sure because of how downtrodden it was when you showed up. Mm -hmm. So you are this bright light, the most joyful toilet cleaner that has ever existed. And you show up and they go, wow, Mm -hmm. we've never had toilets this clean. Shout out Lux Bidet, I need a sponsor, baby. Long time coming. (laughs) Um, And and so you can see how these things take time to be affected in the positive. You can imagine that it was a long time coming in terms of it being affected to the negative. And so you ask like, is it the love? Is it this or that? I think... Love's probably one of the last things to go. That may be all you have left at some point when you are in one of those communities. Mm -hmm. What went first was the factory. All right, so I show up and I do my job the best I can do it, wherever it is. It's some factory in the middle of nowhere. Mm, Okay. Some international conglomerate comes in and says, we can affect some efficiency on our bottom line by moving this whole factory to Guatemala. Mexico. Wherever wherever. it is, Yeah, yeah, yeah. And therefore, you don't even get to show up to your job anymore. Sorry, fam. It's gone, right? So I can see how the rug has been pulled out from underneath all of these people and over time. And when that happens, the forces that necessitated that that happened, so to speak, um, 
also create the condition whereby nothing else is coming in, right? Because the sure. efficiencies are elsewhere. They're gone. Yeah, 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 you're right. Okay. All right. So the spirit of the people is secondary to these mm. global forces of price signal that have determined that in a global just-in-time economy, we should make those widgets somewhere else. And that's mm. been the way of it for a long time. And so therefore, well, all right, we have land, we have some resource, we have some capability um, do we rebuild here or is it better if I send my daughter to the city to get educated so that she can go work somewhere else because, you know, not a lot's happening in podunk wherever, right? Mm -hmm. So I can see how short-term necessity creates a sort of gravitational force of output of just leaving. It's, it's easier, it's faster. Um, we love where we're from, but, you know, not working in that factory the rest of my life. Like, this mentality plays itself over generations. Absolutely. So, this like, is a story I've heard many times before. It's, it's yes. everywhere. And, and therefore, how do, you, how do you think about revitalizing that spirit when there is nothing? So this yeah. is the thing about abundance is it's, trust me, it's coming, mm -hmm. right? This is, um, and they've heard that story before. This is also the other thing about coming from the oil and gas industry. Um, especially promises, especially as it relates to like Eastern Ohio, Western Pennsylvania, like the shale boom, you know, late 2010s, uh, but none of those promises fulfilled, uh, like abundance was coming and get ready for it. And there was a small boom and then there was a big bust once again. And so, yeah, all of those promises were not necessarily realized in ways. And so distrust starts to occur. And then all of a sudden you're not going to listen to the next promise, right? Sure. So it is what it is. He's and the then, same founder as before. That's right. Yeah, there are, there, all these sharks yeah. are extractivists, et cetera, et cetera. And again, getting to the logistics of it all, the story of the resources of the 20th century, 19th century were um, collect, dig up, and distribute elsewhere. It was never, I'm going to dig up this gold here to keep it here in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. It was, I'm going to dig it up here to sell it to somewhere else. Or send it back to Worthington, Ohio, yeah. wherever, it, wherever they came wherever from, wherever was. family was. Yeah. Wherever it was. And so therefore, um, this idea that local geographies and populations could take advantage of the resources they had at their disposal is like an old village idea. Like back when you were using the river to spin a mill to do this or that, like that was a localized economy. And then that went away. And then all of a sudden, these centralizing forces caused all of the resource to be collected and transmitted to centralized nodes because that was efficient for us to process, whether that's any type of, you know, commodity or information, right? It's water, it's food, it's, you know, precious minerals, et cetera. It was better for us to send it elsewhere, and thus the value was often realized elsewhere. This is the story of every coal town in the, you know, Appalachians is mm -hmm. essentially um, it's the benefit is not for you, coal miners. The benefit is not for you, coal mm. town. Mm. Um, you mm. are just a means too. And oh, by the way, you can only use our local coal town currency. And good luck trying to go use that to go buy goods elsewhere. Like you're kind of stuck here. And and, and and then you know sooner or later the the coal mine goes away, right? So like it's it's all the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, I think largely that's a story of price signal. Uh, information arbitrage and just the ability for some people to have a shorter OODA loop of information than others. And therefore the advantage was always who do you know that can get things done quicker, faster, better? Yeah, sure. And where are those people located? Those people tended to congregate in places that they enjoyed to be. So the coasts or mm -hmm. Malta, I don't know, wherever, wherever <laughs> these, you know, financiers of sorts Malta. go. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and therefore you ended up with like, Small town West Virginia just not being a very interesting place for a lot of reasons. Um, beautiful though, if you've ever been, like, can I'm every sure, place be interesting? Though? I think so. I, I, I really do in its own way. I don't think every place is equally as interesting, and I don't think every place everybody wants to live. This is the uh, this is the heterogeneity of it all, which is fascinating to me. Um, it can't all be the same thing. Like you know, this mm -hmm. is the Kanye line. Everything is the same, same thing. thing. All right. Yep. Yes. Yeah, is, yes, in yeah. one dimension. No, in many others. Yeah. I need uh, Disneyland and Six Flags. Yeah, yeah right. Whatever and, it is. And, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I need it in Florida and California sure. and Tokyo. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think you do get these local pockets. This is where I, I find most interesting this conversation leading to is that it is not that you build the same thing everywhere. It is that each place is its own place and you build it to what it's capable of and utilized for 
most beneficially. And therefore, that's why we were talking about like move to a river town, man. Mm -hmm. Like that's when I think about where the best places are, it's usually co-located with water. I think there's something very meaningful about that. Uh, to say nothing of just the logistics of it, right? Like, well, we actually used to build civilizations based on where the water was. We mm -hmm. don't quite do that anymore. Like, go to Phoenix right now and look at a strong example of, you know, we'll just build it and then we'll bring the water here. It's mm -hmm. it's easy, right? We'll just yeah, there's plenty of water, right? So, you know, as it turns out, that's also a hard problem. Um, so I think yeah, I think certain places have certain unique advantages that are worth taking advantage of, not in terms of like an extractivist thing, but just in terms of recognizing and appreciating it for what it is. It's the be here now of it, right? So the be here now of it of Ohio is we have a beautiful climate, we're resource abundant in many dimensions. We have a spirited population of people that are desperate for something meaningful to work towards. And we have this opportunity to be uh, resilient in our humility. So this is what's interesting is I think arrogance always leads to downfall. Mm -hmm. This is why whenever somebody tries to gas me up, I, I dislike it, right? We talk mm -hmm. about this a lot. Mm -hmm. Like you do have to stand out in front and you have to say what you're good at and what you're here for. But it's about the work. It ain't. I mean, you can exactly. have arrogance, but like if you're not working, I'm like that's. that's right. I don't like the word arrogance. Just because right. the word, I just feel like it has such a negative connotation, and it's usually a person that doesn't understand greatness mm. using the word arrogance. Okay. And, uh, and from my perspective, like people in my life have told me forever, like when I was a huge Kanye fan growing up, people were like he's so arrogant, so cocky. I'm like. I don't think you understand. <laughs> like, like he's not arrogant. He's on. He's literally just being honest yeah. about like I've made the best music for an entire generation, and like I was the biggest music connoisseur. So was my brother. Neither one of us were arguing. You're not even a listener to this music. Yeah, we completely agree. How is that arrogance? I agree. It's, right. it's, Apparently, so, arrogance. No, yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah, and, yeah, and that, yeah. I understand yeah. what you're saying. It's it's a false. It's um. It's arrogance without the work of like yeah. it's like a it's like assumption mm. it's like uh it's like entitlement yes it is not it word. is not um it is not arrogance usually usually yeah. i feel like the word arrogance is often misapplied and like i, would agree. I don't run into many arrogant people of, of all the people i'd say i'm the most arrogant human being i know but i say it in that in i say the same thing i feel like i'm great when i show up and apply myself and like i'm never um I'm never saying I'm great at something I'm not. Mm. I'm I'll be the first one to tell you, like, show me how to do that. Yeah. Or you're better at that than me. And like I, I like all my friends know that. I say I'm wrong all the time. I admit when I make mistakes, but I feel like there is some energy of like, how do we get over that? Of even right now, just with the Ohio talk, we're starting to be able to enjoy areas outside of major cities. Because the way life has, the cards have kind of shaken out of like, Kendra, Kendra and I are looking at places well outside of Columbus right now to live and yeah. buy a house because Good. of the potential that we know is right there for the taking. Mm -hmm. It is just, it's a better familial life, smaller, more local connectivity to uh, a hub of people a smaller group of people that you can really know and uh, have be on a first name basis with in your small community of your kids going to school together, whatever it is. And Amazon delivers packages <laughs> and you can talk to anyone on the internet or FaceTime. And right. uh, something that, I, and I don't want to derail, I don't want to change this here because I think it's still, Kendra, uh, we, we went to DeGraff, a beautiful area in Ohio, um, to a friend's house to pick some stuff up the other day for our baby. Um, that's not here. It comes in October. Uh, <laughs> King Kane. And on the way home, I thought to myself, why are there so many fucking huge trucks on the highway? And it started to make me think about the rail system. And we all know, like, the they were trying to show us train wrecks for three months. It's we really thing. We didn't get on board with the, sure. with the episodes. We didn't want the season of train Some wrecks. Some of those were very real, but <laughs> yeah, yes, they were. I'm with you. They were. Yeah. We just, that we could have, I think uh, people could have been more... Uh, into the episode of train wrecks and we could have fixed the trains but i just wonder why is a tr a truck loaded up a shipping container and driving from let's say bell fountain ohio to the other side of columbus let's say grove city or wherever it is or grove city to bell fountain why is that on a shipping container on these concrete rivers if you will as we're talking about living on a river um it is a a a movement, uh, uh, a good way to get your your goods moved somewhere. Mm -hmm. 
but I feel it's super inefficient. And why would you not just have the trains whipping all the time and quick on and off and those trucks be local? Like those truck drivers shouldn't be driving thousands of miles or hundreds of miles. They should be making many short trips to and from a loading place to their destination. That is keeping them off the roads, keeping roads open. That would allow for much higher speed transportation for vehicles, especially when you start talking about autonomous vehicles and things moving forward. But you can't do that when there's literally on the way home from California, it was almost a train bumper to bumper from LA to St. Louis. I'm talking like a fucking train of individual semis bumper to bumper for thousands of miles. And it's literally all you saw. Like you very rarely saw a couple other cars or a moving truck or just somebody in their pickup truck driving down the road. No, these highways were straight, were moving goods to another place. And I just wonder how is the highway with all this fuel burning, taking up space, bad for lo- local communities, bad for the truck driver, not with his family, driving all over the place. How is that where we've landed? How is that more efficient than something here local where like if we did have a high-speed rail or even a good rail system, we could be experiencing the joys of Columbus 40 minutes out. And like, why? how has that happened? That's how New York became New York. The reason New York became New York is because of the train system in and out allowing that to happen. And of course, the now, I don't know if you saw this article, one million buildings. New York has one million that. buildings. That's not like 980 yeah. some thousand. Sure. Is, is, and like, that is a lot of fucking big buildings. It's, it's so its like, own gravity. Yeah. yeah, so how, like, I just wonder how we've got a way, like it doesn't seem like we're always moving in the efficient or the best efficient way. Yeah. And it seems like we're, we're making some big mistakes to be ex expeditious in the moment as opposed to most efficient in five years. This is uh, where efficiency loses me. And I think you're absolutely correct uh, in certain ways about short-term versus long-term thinking. So I can think of a few reasons why semi-truck transportation would be more efficient than a rail car system, for instance. Um, At the end of the day, uh, a truck can make turns, right? So like you get this extra dimensionality of movement that a a railroad system with a single or double line doesn't have. Uh, You also get the flexibility of being able to have consumer goods and people moving at higher volumes, right? Like the one thing I can think of right now that's concrete road uh, beneficial versus sort of rail car deficient is the throughput, like the volume of transfer. Um, unless we just, you know, proliferated rail lines, Mm -hmm. I don't think we could handle the volume in terms of rail like we can with a semi. Um, I I do think to some degree what we built was born out of, uh, wartime Mm decision-making. Okay. So the inner, uh, the intercontinental highway system was built as a military logistics. Eisenhower, yes. Yes. Uh, And as a result, we benefit from it, but didn't necessarily plan to build it for consumer goods necessarily, right? Or just people. Uh, So you can see how it sort of plays itself out. But that moment in time that that was built and the way in which we've built things since then is exactly like the rest of the conversation we're having about cities, civilization, society, right? Um, the, the price signal of it all, right? So we're, we're in this moment now where, um, you know, it works until it doesn't. Like we're at this point where we have to really decide, all right, where do we go from here? Does it make sense to build out based off of what we have or to reimagine it entirely? This was like the Hyperloop thing was gonna come in and say, well, no, we're gonna add a whole third dimension to this. Right. Let's go underground, right? Mm-hmm. Amazon drone delivery is, we're adding a third dimension to this baby. We're gonna go, up in the air, and then Amazon it's going to change everything. Yeah, hovering, right. dropping down anything out the blimp, sitting over your warehouse it's over the not city. Not the first moment for blimps. <laughs> until you talk about Akron, you know what I right, mean? Right, like right, they're right. still sending out the yeah. blimp. Um, that if you think of anything in terms of Akron, it's that Goodyear blimp yeah, now. Amen. So, yep. so it's an interesting question, right? Like, how did we? How did Akron end up with the worst roads? How did we end up with this? Logistic super highway that is semi well. This is um, Ohio has one of the most interesting and beneficial road systems, even if maybe the surface condition is in disrepair. 
Uh, and that's kind of the moment we're in as, as a state is to notice the logistics potential of it because everything is logistics, but also asking better questions about what does it mean to have efficient logistics? Like you're saying, like mm -hmm. what's the long-term net positive of continuing to do things the way that we're doing it? And I would fully agree. It's probably not the best we could do, but it is where we ended up with the best we could do 50 years ago or whatever mm -hmm. it was. And so there's just a lot of that sort of learning and process. And I think getting to the point where you can even ask creative questions, like what if we just re-envisioned this entirely, mm -hmm. right? I actually think that's the fun part about where we're at. And you guys are talking about, we want to look for a new place to live. Where is that? Um, the benefit of being long-term thinkers is that you can see a place that is maybe not where you want to live today, but could be 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. And then what is the work it would take to get there, right? This is sort of circling back to the proof of work of mm -hmm. it all. The proof of work of the last, let's say, 80 years was concrete superhighways. You Amen. can't argue with that. Evan said the other yeah. day, he said, it's you can't argue today. Yeah that it's uh, more efficient to transport. If you want to move a petabyte of data or 100 petabytes of data, you would not uh, send it over the internet. You would throw those hard drives into the back of a truck and drive them to New York City from LA. You would not say, hey, I'm going to upload this file. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, like, that's, he was like, that's what we're talking about with transportation and trucks yeah. and like being able to throw something in the back that just takes like a direct route right there and you know it's there, and ex you know exactly how much time it's going to toil. You know, if all all goes well, you know exactly when it's going to arrive, how much is coming, no loss. As a internet file transfer, you could spend a week sending it, and then there's an error, and we got to start over. Evan's so smart. He is Shout so smart. Shout out to Evan. He by is the way. incredible. Yeah, he also brought up uh, we, they just figured out how the Romans built concrete. Are okay. you up to this? Tell me more. He said like there's a thing in Turkey that uh, supports like car roadways and shit that the Romans built. Mm. And their concrete is far superior to ours. Like their concrete's lasted hundreds of years. Our shit falls apart in 30, 50 years. 50 years max is right. our like lifetime. Of course. And he says, we just figured it out. But what it would take to make concrete at that level uh, is too much for our producers to do today. It, like it would be more expensive? It'd be more expensive and like we're mass producing and pumping out and mm -hmm. pouring it nonstop and their procedure was quite a bit longer, right. more uh, resource intensive. I don't know all the details. Evan was Evan's the expert here. I'm just parroting. Yeah. Um, but to me, it's very interesting that somebody figured out the air quotes right way to do something. And let's say it was a 10 on a scale of one to 10 and we, were, we, we went with the six because it was faster. Bro, we went with the two. We, okay. We're going with the, the two to three at all times. Is that what it is? Well, really? imagine, imagine that boardroom meeting where you go, all right, it's going to be four times as expensive. It's going to take 10 times as long, but it'll last for 2,000 years. And they're like, nah, we'll be dead in 100. Just go with the cheap one, right? Wow, okay. So yeah. it's... This is the process is we get to say, well, I want a lot of it and really quickly. And so how do we get that done instead? And then all of a sudden our bridges are in disrepair. You know, it's all like, of them. You, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know how many you want to talk about bridges in New York or uh, buildings in New York? You know how many bridges there are in this country, right? It's it's too many to a be lot. in that state of disrepair. Uh, so that's just where we ended up. And that that mindset is that's the same mindset that leads to a dirty Burger King. That's the same mindset that leads to a community in disrepair. Like it's all this, everything is the same thing there, which is mentality, which is what are we building and how long are we building it for? And if we're not building for our grandchildren's grandchildren, then yeah, this is exactly what you would expect You're to right. get. Here That's we it. are. You're right. So You're of, of right. course it is this way, right? Um, moving to a better understanding of what is meaningfully worth building for uh, the longest time possible you know, like the family unit, the the DNA extrapolation of the human, you know, condition itself is the longest time span we consider because that's like an infinite timeline. Yeah. You go to like buildings and then you could say, all right, well, how do we build a building to last a hundred years even? We're building them for we're building them for fifty. They fall apart in twenty five. That's kind of the state of it. We used to build them for a hundred, they would last for fifty. Uh, how do we build it so that it does exist a hundred years from now and is livable, right? Totally possible. Like been done. Uh, it's just, do we have the will to do it? Does it fit within our Excel spreadsheets of revenue models, for instance? And I think that's 
Like that's where we got crooked. I think that's what I'm interested in getting back to is a better sense of the true price of things. All right. So we've been paying a price for things and that is not the real price. Mm -hmm. Today's price is not yesterday's price. Mm -hmm. And in the same sense, we are not really extrapolating the true value of the things that we are producing or the cost of things that we are procuring. And there's a lot to say about the money inherent in that. I think at the end of the day, mindset is going to be fundamental no matter what, which is that, um, well, uh, what's the, there's an engineering principle that is like, if you are an engineer and you are building a bridge, you get to be under that bridge when the first cars go over it, mm. right? So you better be damn sure that that's a good mm-hmm. bridge. I, I think it's, I think directionally that, which is that we need to have some skin in the game as it relates to the things that we build, which means we need to build where those things are and we need to be where those things are down the line, right? So um, the logistics economy of the last 80 years has said, go anywhere, do anything. The world's your oyster. And that freedom, I think, allowed for certain experiences. I think that's well, I think that's how the boomers, quite frankly, ended up with the lifestyle that they got. And I think it's why we're in disrepair now, which is that they forgot about, um, you know, manning the homestead, so to speak. Mm. They just, you know, happiness was always elsewhere, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think our moment is to build resilient communities where we are and figure out a way for that to be exactly what we want, right? Which is like the heaven. Like I was heaven, just going to yeah. say that. I, I feel like this energy... I feel the heaven energy has really picked up mm. in the last couple of years, and I don't pat myself on the back. I will pat but, you on the back you. for that. Yeah. But I really do feel that like other people are really starting to come out and say like like I, there's a country song. Uh, they say heaven's on the other side. Mm. Well, I ain't waiting. Hell, I'm thinking it's a state of mind, and I don't know what song it is. So um, good. But it is so good, and yeah. <clears throat> that's I know. I was just going to ask you. You said it's not the true price. Uh, the things that we have and the things that we're doing are not, we're not realizing the true cost of those things. Do you think the true cost is, are we saying that's exponentially higher because we're not looking at the people that are being diminished for these things? Or do you think it goes both ways? And then uh, on top of that, is this really a, a, anybody's fault for building things that are within their lifespan of, I want to get this built. I, I mean, why would you, if you were even, you know, the Rockefellers or JP Morgan, whoever, if you're going to build a skyscraper, I'm trying to see this bitch, you know, like <laughs> uh, if you're building a pyramid, I'm yeah. trying to see it. I don't yeah. want to, I don't want to have my body around for 200 years. And then you, I'm trying to, I want to see the celebration unfold of the ribbon cutting the, I want to, uh, use my little tiny shovel and have my picture taken of groundbreaking, whatever it is, like all these moments, it feels very human and it feels very human to build things that are correlating to our life lines. Do you mm-hmm. think this is like three questions here? Yep. Is the price of things more expensive? Mm. Is is it anybody's fault that this is like isn't this just what we're doing and like is this solved by longer life? Mm. Like if we were like if if AI is able to push us to 150 it feels like we're right on the verge of that. Of like Jamie brought up the other day he was like I I don't know when Joe's going to quit his podcast sure. and I said to him I feel Today, crazy cam energy, it seems to me like the odds of Joe quitting his podcast in the next 10 years yeah. are almost the same odds, or it's less likely than the odds that we have some major health breakthrough that like pushes us to yeah. 150 years old. And then like then every, everything everything we've thought is fucking off the table. Never stopping, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, this is the Lindy in effect, right? Yes. It's the longer yes. something lasts, the longer it is expected to last. And and I tend to agree with you. So, okay. Uh, yes, we are often not paying the true price for things because we only think in certain dimensions and not all dimensions. And that like that's just an inherent perspective of the human brain, which is that um, we'll think in terms of, like when I say price or cost, et cetera, like we're talking in dollars, but what True. is the Good cost yeah, to the yeah. environment right. when you, yeah. you know, leak some stuff into the river, right? Like money's so interesting. It is. It's, it's the most interesting. And so like in that respect, of course, we're never paying the true price for things. Um, is that somebody's fault? No. Like, you know, unless you 
get really deep into the philosophical argument about good versus evil and you sure. know what i mean like then you start to get to the root of that question but i think putting that aside from the human perspective no of course it's necessarily human that we think in those terms this is why i don't think well, it's not that I don't think the humans built the pyramid. I just think it was a different type of human that built that kind of structure because it took a mentality that was outside of the I, uh, outside of the individual self. Mm -hmm. The collective consciousness of it all would make that a lot easier because it isn't ever about my life, right? Mm -hmm. It is simply about life, it, right? The infinite mm -hmm. game. And I think that's how you end up with a great pyramid I think in order to imitate that, we often do things that look like them, right? So like the obelisk mm -hmm. is a skyscraper, is a rocket ship, et cetera, et cetera. And we are simply building these um, manifestations of higher consciousness in the physical world through whatever means we have available to us. And that could be stone, that could be metal, that could be glass, et cetera. Um, but we are simply trying to build temples and totems to that which is sort of above and outside ourselves whether that's building a rocket to go to space or you know whether that's i don't know um we can talk about the pyramids being a, an energy harnessing device etc mm -hmm. like i think it's all the same thing at the end of the day but in order to do that really well interesting to put that that way that it's an en energy harvest harnessing device when we when you just compared the building to the internet yeah and that's right well yeah. we're we're it's all about how you aggregate the information and use it effectively. So the information from a physics sense could be the energetic, you know, force yeah. vector that is, yeah. But I think when we talk information, we're talking sound all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Like it is what I say to you. It is what um, is communicated through your music. For instance, it is even to the degree of how sound feels in any given room. All right. So if I'm building a building to last 500 years, it's likely I'm thoughtful enough about the architecture and the materials of it that I can build a specific room to serve a specific function as it relates to sound. Sure. Of yeah. course, I'm going to do both because I'm a master builder, right? And that, mm -hmm. that that's what I came to do. Is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and um, what I am building is not necessarily for me is the other part of it. So this is Amen. the tricky bit. Um, yes. But you can, I mean, some, look, say it takes 20 years, right? Like that's mm -hmm. still within the span of a human lifetime. So we're not completely removing the need for you as a person to enjoy the fruits of your labors. It is just to say that there are some things that take time. So I think buildings are a really good analogy for um, the spirit that is manifested in the human, the spirit that can be manifested through a community of humans. I think we, we built these buildings. This is old churches. These are Masonic temples. These are all of these things were meant to be a gathering place so that minds in space could vocalize their ideas and that energy could be harnessed, mm -hmm. right? It's just all different dimensions of the same thing. And I would, I would argue to a certain degree, we stopped doing that and we started uh, building for a different type of efficiency, like we're saying, and what was lost was soul. Like we lost mm. the spirit of doing those things in these types of places. And instead we ended up with you know, a schizophrenic hive mind of activity mm -hmm. that works until it doesn't. And so, you know, for me, it's like building better communities looks like starting with just, you know, being more intentional about the buildings we build, being more intentional about the spaces we curate. I can tell you in my life now and in the, the world that we're sort of delving into in the relationships world, uh, I'm learning so much about what it means to affect a positive outcome by creating the right space with intention. And I think even you and Kendra do a tremendous job of that. You're extremely hospitable people. And when I show up to your place, I feel very welcome. You make me feel very comfortable. You have refreshments for me. You have a dog that I can pet and I love it, right? So like those little things and all in combination create, uh, well, hey, Cam and Kendra's place is the place to go hang out and just enjoy yourself. And I think that simple act can be magnified to many different degrees mm -hmm. all the way up to and including like the most important meetings that we have on this planet to talk about the most interesting things. And in order to do that, you need a space where people can feel comfortable. 
in order to do that, you need to build a building that's intentionally for that purpose. Mm. We just forgot about that step. We just thought, ah, it'll be the same thing. You know, we'll build it out of wood. It'll be Is fine. Is that what Google's doing in Apple with like entire campuses that are, hey, bring your kids, bring your laundry, live here, eat here. Is that the energy there? And uh, on top of that, and you're so brilliant, by the way. I just love hearing you talk. I could do this all day. Like, Gas just, me up all day. I love I'm it, fine with it. I love yeah. it. And on top of, so like... A, and then B, did you hear Trump talking about the new super cities or whatever? Did you see his clip? <laughs> okay, first, and, yes, that is what Google and Apple are doing, too. Let's go into that. I've not heard this. Well, he just said, like, uh, he wants to, he's talking about his presidential campaign. I saw, like, a little little clip, like, okay. like two, maybe a minute and a half, two minutes of super Trump energy talking about we need to build new cities in America, completely new cities from scratch. The best cities. The best You've cities. You've never seen cities ne- like this. This is exactly what he says. Yeah, of course. And he's like, we need to rethink yes. the way all structures have been built. In the mm. way. And like, he's not fucking wrong. Like, he knows how to build buildings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, okay, is this the guy we trust to build the super cities? Yes. And, and is that what we need? Mm. Do we need... Mm. Do we need super cities or we just need better energy in the cities we already have? That's like, just like, I really think like a conversation like this, like if you were just going into a building Mm -hmm. and like say a whole building has, every floor is a different company and they, the whole building hires Andrew. Hey, Mm -hmm. Andrew, we need you to reinvigorate the building. Every floor. The building, not even, fuck the people. Uh, we need the energy of this building blessed mm-hmm. in a new way. We mm-hmm. need the energy here to change. We need, we need people to feel inspired. We need people here to think about life differently. Does that start by standing at the front door and saying, good morning, today's going to be fucking fire. To the building. D- to the building, maybe. Yes, but yes, like, yes. The, as the people come in, does that resonance of people uh-huh. change? Yes. Does that change the city shape? Like... It's very interesting to talk about this with you, and something I keep thinking about over this conversation is when they reintroduced wolves to Yellowstone. Okay. And are you familiar with that? Yes. And everything changed. Of course. That is just, you can literally just introduce GM on Twitter in the mornings, and like Twitter changed when the GM thing mm-hmm. happened, mm-hmm. Uh, at least in my world. It, yeah. it definitely changed uh, the way you're interacting with people. Yeah. It became a real town square yes. where you start your day by saying good morning What's the and being cordial. And that is the key now to found to building a foundation that is a relationship. Mm. And like I don't I don't know if that is is it that easy? Is it literally just showing up with like a good a uh, positive light and then the, the whole thing changes, or do we need new fucking cities? That is part of it. Um yeah, the, so the meme is like the girl begging the guy doing the thing and he's like, Not now, babe, I'm saying good morning to all the kings. Yes. <laughs> yes. It is part of it. So yeah, you you have to do that as a step. The question is, can any place be reinvigorated with that, right? And I would argue what we were just talking about prior to Trump is exactly that idea of not every place can be invigorated in the same way. And Mm. let's just stick to the concept of buildings. Not every building can be attuned to the same frequency. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can affect all of the people within that easily by standing outside the door and and going, good morning, you know, and and adding that hundred dollar bills, dumb and whatever it takes. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Sometimes it's just a high five and and a smile. Um, the idea of new cities is really interesting because it's exactly what we've been talking about yeah, here. Yeah, we built the these time. cities as Goodyear cities. Yes. All right. This was the Absolutely. Move. All right. So it's interesting that the Goodyear city of all the cities, the roads don't work real well. Yeah. Right. So what? I'm talking six, eight inch holes in the middle of the road. I'm not talking like, I'm not talking like little problems. Ohio has all the weather. They have trucks. They should have some rough roads here and there, but this is where the problem should be solved, not where the problem should, the heart of the problem should be. Yeah, and the problem's not that we can't build good cities. The problem is we uh, made efficient the materials we used to make the roads, and therefore, sooner or later, Mm. you have to keep repairing them. And then if you run out of tax revenue, you can't repair them as often as they need. And so, boy, if you would have just, that one time when you were in a surplus of goods, built a thousand-year roads, we wouldn't be talking about this, but we didn't. So I, I do think that... That period of time of logistics and efficiencies, it was born out of sort of the World War One, World War II, and uh, post-World uh, War era. 
uh, created all of these things uh, just because it was a new way of doing business. We had new materials that we'd never dealt with before. We didn't quite know what to do with them. We really like underestimate how fast things have moved from 1950 to now. Uh, like we have no perspective on it because we were born right in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. I like look at my grandma as an example of somebody that saw the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I go, what? My dad's birthday is today. He was born 1950. Happy birthday, Papa Portwood. Happy That's, birthday. That's beautiful. King Portwood. Amen. Thanks for life, my king. I love you. Amen. That's, um, and that, that exact perspective of seeing all of it and knowing where we came from, I think is really valuable now. And we're like about to lose that in many respects. And I think it's really important to capture whatever we can of it, of what was before, uh, because I think we did some things directionally correct in ways we don't do now. But to Trump's point, probably. Uh, this is the trick, and I ask this all the time. Can we revitalize every place to the maximum effect of what is possible in that mode of abundance? I don't think so, necessarily. I do think I think some places just have bad energy. Mm -hmm. uh, like this is the heterogeneity <laughs> okay, of it, right? right. <clears throat> I don't know how else to say it. I, some cities have bad energy. Some... Some places were not meant to be built on. Some buildings were not meant to last. Like this is, I don't think we need to think we should save everything, right? Mm -hmm. I do think let's in the next wave of development, which is like all he's talking about is let's let's drum up trillions of dollars of economic development by putting new stuff where there isn't stuff now. That's like such mm -hmm. a builder mentality. It's sure like is. sure looks like a good plot of land over there. Let's mm -hmm. stick some buildings on it, mm -hmm. right? I happen to know a guy who builds buildings. <laughs> and so there, there's some dimension of that to me, which is very just, of course, the real estate developer is talking real estate development. Mm -hmm. Like that's such an obvious bent. But in the dimension of what do cars post good yearification or what do cities look like post car, post good yearification, I think that, you know, that probably does look very different than the cities we have right now. I don't know what it looks like, but I would imagine it's not what we have. Um, and so that, then it's, it's worth talking about if you have that opportunity, what might you do differently? This is the whole conversation. Yes. What might we do differently that has a more maximal effect towards that abundance? Because as we know, energy builds on itself or it destroys itself. There's, there's really no stasis. It's one or the other. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that gravitational force of New York, of San Francisco, et cetera, worked until it didn't. It, and therefore it's collapsing on itself now because it, it had no sustainability based on the way it was built. Mm -hmm. um, not every place is like that. There are much older cities, for instance, right? So how did much they- Much older, yes. Like crazy older, right? Great, That's, I was talking to Evan, like thousands of years old yeah. cities. We actually have <laughs> like no Istanbul. idea yeah, here, like, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. And so, you know, look at what they did right. You know, obviously it was a very different time, but there are ways in which you can affect a culture a community through just building uh, more, more soulfully. Frankly, I, I like this is the conversation I get to <clears throat> when I'm really interested in talking to any person. It always comes down to the soul of a place. Yeah. So the human body is a temple and it's contained within yes. it is that soul. And whenever we show up to any physical space, that soul is present in a different way, and it is worth thinking about how to curate that uh, to get towards most soulful, right? Like that mm -hmm. spirit is that abundance which flows through us and we are able to give to others, okay? So this is why you could be the guy to stand out in front and say good morning to everybody and lift them up. Mm -hmm. I don't think there are many people like that. I think you're sure. very special in that way. Thanks. And really therefore, too. we have to be the ones to do that. But directionally doing that looks like building better places, building better cities, um, and making sure that the right people are in the right place at the right time, talking about the right things. Like mm -hmm. this is what it comes back to too, is not every place is for everybody. Mm -hmm. And how do you self-select the logistics of the human spirit in time and space? That's where, um, that's where you can't actually do the mapping as far as I can tell. Like maybe central intelligence tries real hard and that's kind of their game. But at some point that's up to God as far as I can tell. And what I'm noticing for the same reason that you and I were drawn together, for the same reason that a lot of our people are finding each other, I, I think about this all the time. Like for some reason and serendipitously, we are finding each other. And mm -hmm. there's something really special inherent in that as far as I can tell. I, and I, I simply... Something very magical happening. It, yes. Magical, exactly that. And so yes. we were talking proof of work earlier. Mm -hmm. It's about doing the work. Yeah, the work to a certain point, but there's something else outside of that yes. that is not us, mm -hmm. right? So it yes. is like, I Absolutely. humbly accept that I'm simply here as a vessel to mm -hmm. do the work, mm -hmm. but knowing that there's a 
There's a larger work, work at where play God here. showed you up. Yeah, that's yes, right. Yes. You know, we're talking about building cities and like I keep something I've t- shared with you for like the last year is I keep thinking, I just want to build a city with all my friends. Yes. And I want to make a homestead that we all agree upon. And that always brings us to talks of currency mm-hmm. and, you know, how money works. And something Evan and I talked about, we were talking about it yesterday of like, everything is money. Yes. You know, a handful of dirt. Nobody's, nobody, most people wouldn't trade a quarter in their pocket for the handful of dirt that you have outside. But if you get enough handfuls of dirt, somebody will trade all the money in their pocket for that dirt. You could just walk around picking handfuls up of dirt from people's yards all day. They won't even notice. Right. And you just take them back and drop it off. How long until that becomes money? I don't know. To the right, have to find the right buyer. But there's something to be said here about like, our exchanges of energy and the way we're tracking this energy and the way we are gravitating towards one another based on these energies. And you talked about building a city of like a neighborhood of million dollar houses, $500,000 houses, uh, $100,000 houses, or whatever the numbers you want to pick out are. Mm -hmm. Can those, can we co-mingle if the money was better? If the money was better, would we get along better in society if things were more properly valued or would it diminish even further? And I guess like it comes to proof of work for me as like, this is kind of the question is, are we, are we truly valuing human beings or are we only valuing their output? And like, it seems like we're always paying people based on like their tangible output, but there's so much more to be considered Mm -hmm. for an employee that you hire. Like how many burgers you make a day is not really, shouldn't be like what your pay scale is based on. That's right. Did you lift up the fellow employees while you were making the burgers? There's so many things you could say could be providing value outside of that unit economic, you know, parameter of burger per hour. Um, All right, so the soil, the dirt is always money, right? So you were saying, how much dirt do you need in order for it to become money? It is always money. Always. How much dirt do you need for it to be monetizable in a way that's meaningful to somebody? Because I could argue that handful of dirt's really valuable, but just in really specific context. And and maybe I don't have the the bit of information that is one-to-one. This is the trick of... um, well, you know, like uh, how many how many decimal points or how many how many zeros beyond the decimal point are you in terms mm-hmm. of relative value, mm-hmm. right? So, um, you know, I would say that we just have a really clunky money. This is kind of everything is money. Our approximation of it has been crude to date because we're working with the weights and measures we have accessible to us at all times. Which is, in the world of gold, it was always how much gold could you meaningfully measure and to what degree of accuracy. Okay. So a gold bar is really easy to see and to weigh. A gold coin, similarly. But what about an atom of gold? Hmm. What about just a few clumps of gold, right? At some point, your measurement becomes inhospitable to the environment, right? (laughs) Sorry, uh, I can't do anything with that single atom, sir. Could you get a few more atoms of gold to make this worth my while? Uh, Make a phone call with four (laughs) four atoms of gold. I I need five more (laughs) atoms, stat. Yeah, and how can you, can you ship them through mail? No, I can't send that over the internet. Uh, So we have an information transference problem that is at play here. And so we tried to make that more effective by lowering the threshold of denomination, by creating a currency that was more easily transferable. This is how we got cash in the first place, right? Which was just a lot easier to transport than gold. Um, And then we moved to bits to say, well... This is a lot more divisible than the money we have now, and maybe that has its own benefits, right, such that we could parameterize and monetize a handful of dirt versus everything else. Um, The trick then becomes, is everybody operating under equal weights and measures? And in doing so, how do you level the, as you said, the human output factor of this all, all right? So directionally to your question of would life be better if we had a better unit of money i do believe so and i think some of that just has to do could we all get along is like yes we don't get along right now because i think it's obvious to a lot of people that the ceo of a company making a thousand times more than the frontline worker probably is a bit too much of a difference Mm -hmm. like i was talking to somebody over the weekend that used to live down the street from the 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 executive of gm 
down the street from him. He made maybe five times as much as the, the local, right? He, he was obviously the executive. He was obviously in charge of more. He was obviously making more money. But it wasn't so much that he couldn't live near all the same people. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't so much that people were ready to bring out the pitchforks and mm -hmm. hold him to account because of it. And I think when we disrupted the price signal, we also disrupted the value signals. And then that led to a perversion of what we value. And then we're just sort of here now in this place of perverse value where in a capitalist system, take the example, I saw this example of apples today. All right. So I'm somebody that stewards the apple tree. All right. So the apple is valuable. The apple can be provided as sustenance. I can use the interior of the apple to make more apple trees. If the apple falls off the tree, it returns to the soil and it provides value therein. I didn't sell that apple, but that apple was providing value to the ecosystem. And how do we value that? Well, right now we don't at all. That is not a value at all. That's actually a negative on the balance sheet. So we have corrupted the ecosystem of value by thinking unidimensionally. This is why I left my, my primary mission as an early career geologist because we were focusing on the carbon dimension. I always felt like we're thinking way too much about carbon. Mm -hmm. There's so many other you know, atomic principles at play here. This is just one lens through which to view the world. It felt like the wrong way to account for things. And that's just kind of where I think dollars are at. That's where I think the monetary system is at now is that we're not actually properly valuing it, the human spirit, mm. the, the, the output of our work, for instance. And what that has led to is us not getting along. I think that's what that has led to is the Michelin experience right next to the homeless experience. Mm -hmm. It's all the same thing. Uh, I think that in order to get back to that, we have to get back to thinking about value in terms of holistic thought and collective conscious. And in that way, remove ourselves from the well, uh, I did this and therefore sure. I deserve that. Um, you didn't build Amen. that as a real, you know, people I haven't really, built anything. You people <laughs> really maligned Obama for that, but I'm telling you, um, this is exactly what we were talking about before, which is that yes, this is happening through us, but there's no way you can say it's only because of you. And if right. you take that position, you are arrogant. You yes. missed the point. This Evan brought this up the other day. He said, I, none of the shit I use, I built. Of course. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I guess none of the shit I use I built either. Like I the the biggest thing I could say that I've built that I use is like my workout playlist, I'm very happy about this, has like forty percent of my own music on it, which is to, to me, yeah. I am using something I made, but it's not uh, my phone. It's not this table, it's not this microphone That's or right. this or this recording machine here or the computer. It's I didn't make any of that very meaningful, high productivity, uh, increasing my output. Mm -hmm. And to think that I could do all of this alone or any of this alone, there would be no purpose to do it. So, you know, I, I love your ideas here. I want to ask you a question that kind of changes the subject, but it's still in the same. What do we do with like mental health stuff? Like how do we account for that when we're thinking about these new cities and we're thinking about new ways of life and new ways of living, new communities? Uh, I've seen a lot of things on Twitter lately of like, when they shut down, um, when people started leaving mental hospitals, crime started skyrocketing. Mm -hmm. Like as the population of uh, people in mental hospitals declined, crime and poverty rapidly increasing. Mm -hmm. how, how do we think about those types of things in these new cities where we are caring about things? Do you have any thoughts on that or, or like insight sure. on the way we would handle that? I think you could look at mental illness as a symptom of the city itself, right? So this is part of what I think about is what are the reasons why somebody becomes mentally ill in the first place? And obviously there's a dimension of this, which is there's just an immutable dysfunction at the level of, you know, cellular autonomy or brain function that creates it. And that that's fine. And I think that's one of those things where you're just always going to have to deal with people who don't quite know how to fit into the scheme. I also think there is a, strong dimension of mental illness today that we have created ourselves and we could alleviate simply by building better communities, like period. I just genuinely think that when you put people in a concrete jungle and you isolate them from people and you give them no hope for any meaningful purpose in their life, naturally they're going to trend towards mental illness because I'm kind of stuck in a prison 
of my own body and there's nothing really for me in this society, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Like there, and, and then you get to some of the downstream effects of like, well, maybe I'm just unhappy because I'm, I was born in the wrong body. And like all these extrapolations start to occur really quickly where you just don't feel like you're settled in the right place to be doing what you were, you were meant to do. And I think that's just a, you know, frankly, from a personal perspective, I think that's, that's an isolation from oneness from, from God, whatever you want to call it. Right. When we isolate people, they naturally tend towards mental illness, just period. It's, uh, you know, the experiment of putting somebody in, in solitary confinement proves that very clearly. Um, so in order to, you like have two problems at the same time, which is how do we deal with what exists and how do we remove or reduce that from occurring in the future? Right. And so it's always the two things at the same time when you have an inefficiency or a, a, a wasteful aspect, which I would say, you know, uh, somebody who's dealing with mental illness uh, has their potential wasted because they're simply suffering, mm -hmm. right? So how do we reduce we that? We all have their potential wasted, which is That's like, what, exactly. that needs to be yeah. the thought. So yeah, it's, a, it's a communal thing. We all uh, could be benefited from that um, symptom of distress being alleviated, right? And in order to do it to the population that exists, right? Like uh, there are all kinds of ways you can get through to that, but providing a circumstance that allows for uh, a little bit of flexibility and hope is supremely important, right? So not trapping somebody in the despair of poverty and creating a condition where they can maybe just pull themselves up a little bit through help, through an ability to access the hope and potential of a world that, you know, maybe they didn't realize was out there for them. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always going to be a certain subset of people, I think, that you're just going to have to care for. Yeah, so it's going to manage, ask, right? Yeah, like, yeah. That's inevitable. And so I think you know, we're kind of going through this with the uh, with the subway in New York, the incident there. Right? I'm not familiar. Tell me. Uh, this was where um, I think a young black man was choked mm -hmm. by a guy uh, on the subway. Um, this just recent? I think this was a couple of weeks ago. Okay. I'm not sure. Um, the point being that somebody died. Somebody died on a subway because he was being subdued by a chokehold. And so there's sort of this divide between, well, what's the right way to deal with that situation? Because... It seems apparent that the person who died was mentally ill, was dealing with mental illness, and was outwardly expressing that on the subway in New York mm -hmm. in a crowded subway full of people in ways that you know maybe weren't very comfortable for them, right? Let's just say that as a minimum. And so, you know, I think in one circumstance it got so aggressive that somebody tried to de-escalate the situation, and in doing so, actually ended up killing the person because Jeez. it was a chokehold, right? Mm -hmm. So um, terrible all around. Like nobody wins here. Uh, but you have some people on one side saying, this is murder, this is terrible, et cetera, et cetera. You have other people saying, hey, this guy was kind of arrested many times for threatening, harassing, kidnapping, literally, like all of these things, very clearly in mental distress. And he was simply just allowed to roam. Like there should have been something for us to do for him that wasn't keep him on the subway doing the things right. that he's doing, right? So like We're we, all, we yeah. failed in both That's dimensions, how I feel. right? Yeah. So it's tricky, but you know, we also ended up in a place where uh, mental health treatment was perhaps not seen as most cost effective versus just, you know, whatever it is we're doing now. And that's, again, uh, unidimensional thought process that isn't thinking about the holistic ecology of it all. So, you know, you'll necessarily have to care for certain people. But again, I do think if we are thoughtful about this, I don't think we end up with the same magnitude of condition that we're in now. I do really think uh, so like the mantra on Twitter is often just like go outside and touch grass. Like there's something mm -hmm. so meaningful to that that yes. we've forgotten Yes. that if we just even root back to those types of first principles, we're going to go a long way. Just literally uh, send people to horse camp, you know, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. Um, just do something that reorients them to the real world, the natural world versus being stuck in a hellish concrete prison of your own thoughts and expectations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, that's bad energy. That's like we built those cities to be that energetically negative. And I think, unfortunately, um, that's not going to stop until we do something different. So to Trump's point, like he's probably not thinking about that dimension necessarily. Mm -hmm. But um, the idea in general that we can do better is pretty obviously true. Like we're, yeah. we're not doing so great right now as far <laughs> as I can tell. So That's a good point. It, it does to me seem like there are a lot of hard questions to be answered, and I'm not sure they can all be answered. So I, I would ask you, do you think like this is like, I don't want to call it utopia because that's not what we're talking We're not talking about utopia. We're talking about better. Mm. Do you think it's possible that we can 
have these better things without a change in the government level. And mm. do you think, do you think that that's possible? And it, it seems to me we keep getting the same people. You know, it, it's like even with DeSantis's energy, he's very recently, let's say last six months, definitely cranked up be more like Trump mm -hmm. because that is what gets you on the news. That is what gets you energy. That is what gets you at the end of the day, free marketing for your presidential campaign. And the bottom line is you need to be in the conversation mm -hmm. about being president. You can't be running for president and me hearing about it from one other person. I need to hear about it literally nonstop or you're not fucking running for president. You're li you're not a candidate. You can call yourself a candidate. I could call myself a fucking candidate. I could announce my candidacy right now. Is that what you're doing? No, no, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> and that's, I just have this energy of, I don't know if it's possible without like a massive regime change because it feels top down to me. Mm. It feels like, and maybe I'm wrong. I wasn't alive then, but it feels like the MLK and uh, JFK really had energy that could have led to monumental changes in our internal energy and our outward energy towards all people, and they were sniped. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, then like, how dangerous is it to be that good person that is lighting the souls of people on fire in a good way for life and love and... I don't like the word equality. I don't believe it exists. I don't like equity. I don't think that it like, there's just no, there's nothing equitable about life. Like there's just not. And to think that like, everybody's going to live in the same size house and eat the same foods. It's like, it's not what's it's happening. It shouldn't be the it's, goal. That's, it yeah. should. Yeah, I agree. It shouldn't be the goal, but it feels like that's what, uh, when people talk about, uh, progressiveness or whatever, that seems to be the energy kind of, of like, yeah. I want people to be able to eat what I'm eating for dinner. My dog eats better than most human beings yeah. on earth eats. And like, I, I even ramped it up today, getting some farmer's dog Good food. For you. Like yeah. that doesn't feel great to me to know yeah. that my dog is eating like <laughs> <laughs> human grade quality food across the board. Yeah. But that's where I am in life at the moment. And I don't feel that my dog should be eating horse meat mm -hmm. like your dog, because that's, what you can afford. So like, how do we get out of this? Is it, is it top down or is it bottom up or is it both? Well, you can notice that MLK and JFK still affected people even in death. Still today. <clears throat> so this Absolutely. is the thing is that you can't even necessarily kill your way out of that. Like the okay. progress continues nonetheless. I, I would say that yes. that was a different time and that was the game. And that is the game largely right now. Um, but it is changing as far as I can see. I think the internet has a lot to do with that. I think that's simply a step in the process. There's more to be built there. Um, the trick is that in the 60s and 70s, there were only a few information channels. Therefore, what you knew was easily curated, right? Like three television stations, four major newspapers. You were lucky if you got any good information mm. and you read the paper every day to make sure whatever it might be, you were getting it. But that was it. There was no ability to sit outside of any curated information set and think, well, what else might be going on, right? It, it just it wasn't even a question to be asked back then, truly, like maybe in a, a few niche circumstances, right? There were always conspiracy theorists. But at the end of the day, this was what it was. And it took us how long to figure out that JFK was probably murdered by, you know, an inside scoop, so sure. to speak, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. It, you know, it, these things seem intuitively compelling now, but... Back then it was just like, well, yeah, of course, it was just that one guy. He's crazy. And like now he's dead. So that's over, you know, mm -hmm. and then it's on to the next. I, I don't think that exists now in the same way. I do think it is a very dangerous game to stand out in front and speak for change. So mm -hmm. I had to decide in myself very early on, like, is there anything I'm worth die I'm willing to die for? Mm -hmm. Is there anything? I don't know know what that is necessarily, but is the answer yes to anything? And if so, what am I willing to do to find that out? And how far are you willing to go to put yourself out there to affect change meaningfully uh, before you start to get to lines that seem very scary and dangerous, et cetera? And mm -hmm. It's like when I decided, of course, yeah, there must be something I'm willing to die for. This is like 
why your dad's generation went to Vietnam. And it's not mm -hmm. necessarily why, but like that was the ethos of freedom and, you know, right orientation around, you know, property rights and capitalistic principles necessitate that we defeat the communists, right? Or whatever it is. Now, in this uh, decentralized component of, let's say, warfare, it's just informational now in ways it used to be very kinetic. Um, yeah, of course, you're putting your whole life on the, your, your reputation on the line, let's say. Maybe it's not your life anymore. Maybe. It's Same your reputation. Thing. Same thing, maybe. I would agree. Um, you, can, you can still be alive and have a tarnished reputation, right? This is what I think about with RFK Jr. right now, is yes. that you can imagine somebody saying things like that is very much putting themselves in danger. Especially when it happened to well, his uncle? Right. What is it? Is it well, his uncle? Yeah. I don't know, uh, grandfather? Uncle. Yeah, uncle. I believe. Okay. And, and father, by the way. Uh, so, yeah, RFK was murdered also. You know, we forget. but You're right. Um, I did not remember. So, you know, he, there, there's a lineage there, and, and still he's standing out in front. Like, he's... He's saying now, hey, the reason my voice sounds like this is because of the flu shot. You know, that's a pretty dangerous thing to say as far as I can mm -hmm. tell. Um, but is it is it a fight worth fighting, right? This is the thing I think about often is what is worth doing even to the degree of extreme consequence. And mm -hmm. I do think that there are things that exist that are worth doing to that degree. I don't think everybody's meant to do it. My hope is that eventually enough people say the right thing that, I don't know, this sounds kind of dark, but they can't kill us all, yeah. you know, like yeah. I, I, that's how it feels right now is, is we're finding a way to collectively organize in a decentralized fashion just to say what's true and right such Amen. that, yes, um, we are. So, you know, loop this back to Bitcoin for a second. Yeah. Keep going. Uh, Peter Always. Thiel, yeah. Peter Thiel talked about, you know, PayPal mafia. They were trying to do the currency thing from an internet mm -hmm. perspective long ago. And he, he has this point that he made along the way that you, to do this well, you have to create it such that in order to corrupt it or usurp it, you would have to shut down the entire global telecommunications network to accomplish that. It's a big task. That's where we're at, is they, you, you, the only thing that could stop it now is like a global catastrophe, solar mm -hmm. flare, whatever it is, maybe we, it's human induced, but at the end of the day, you can't squash it just by right. killing a politician anymore. Like we're mm -hmm. past that game. That game exists in third world countries where they're still behind us to some degree and they still operate on that analog information distribution um, that we used to operate on back when MLK and JFK did their thing. Um, in the digital age, right? So digital, think about that word for a second. Digital is simply um, bits in distributed fashion uh, all over the place, right? So like the digitization of ideas in humans is creating this component on earth where um, this ideal of freedom is now decentralized. It's no longer that you have to go to America to believe right. in the ideal of freedom. Uh, we were the gravitational force vector for that idea set. That was corrupted along the way, of course, and th there are arguments about how free we are here. But I would say we've done the best of, of anybody thus far. We have Twitter. <clears throat> yeah, we do. It's amazing. Um, we have presidential candidates announcing their candidacy on Twitter. So that, Twitter's it. That's like the kind of thing. It literally that's, says it right in the middle. That's right. And that's where you can <laughs> see. So DeSantis, to, to your point about DeSantis, it's like, is he kind of playing the same game? Yeah, I would say so. Like, mm -hmm. you probably have to. This is the sure. kayfabe. Of yes. It. Um, how much of him is genuine versus, you know, just playing the part, playing the character? I don't, I don't know. But playing the character and opening up the information distribution to things like Twitter in a meaningful sense is that's flipping the bit. Like we've done that now. Now yeah. we're, now we're through that line and now uh, it's more open than it ever was. And therefore we should be more open to the serendipity of things we couldn't expect. Like DeSantis announcing on Twitter is you trying to go to Capitol records to get that job. Mm -hmm. You just opened a door by showing up there in that Avenue mm -hmm the real magic comes in back behind you and around you in yeah. ways you can't see yet. Yes. And so we, we just haven't seen it yet, what yes. that means. Elon said, biggest story in, on earth today was Elon's. Sure. And that was, he was like, oh, it, all the outlets, it was a tweet that said like, CNN called it this. MSNBC called DeSantis saying he's going to announce on yeah. Twitter this. Another outlet called it this. And Elon responded to it and said, I call it the biggest news story on earth today. Yeah. And that is really, that's what you need to win as president, you need to, be, it's a popularity contest and it has been, 
But is it a popularity contest of ideas or is it truly just a fucking popularity contest of, of not, not even, a, it's not about ideas. It's more about just the name. And like, I guess that could be some ideas, but I don't have any, I don't know any of, I, of DeSantis's ideas. I mean, I could pair it some things I think. Ban Disney, like no transgenders. <laughs> in, there are some ideas, yeah. <laughs> the, some uh, ideas. All these people, all of us, we're vectors. We, we are uh, information channels through which ideas will participate. They're not their ideas. They're just the okay. people the ideas I, have captured in the moment. Yes, yes. Um, it's not about what they think necessarily. So like to the popularity contest, yes. Uh, it is about what do people see as possible through them and can they, uh, I, I think the idea space is more about funding than it is anything else. Mm -hmm. I need to say the right things to make sure that the people with money give me their money. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, I need to have their ideas come through. This is, this is where I see politics in a lot of respects is um, I'm curating the narrative to a small group but I'm blasting it out far and, far and wide to hopefully capture the spirit and attention of the broad group, but those are very different aims and for their very different purposes. And so the people voting for DeSantis are not the people giving DeSantis money, if that like, right. makes sense, right? So it's it, they're actually very different things. How do you curate the message to speak to both at the same time? I think Trump did that really effectively. Really well. Spoke really simply about ideas that his donors were really behind, like the wall or whatever it is. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean either that that's what they believe. This is the other part of it too, is that I know that these people are not saying what they believe. Right. They are representatives of something, yes. right? Yes. The ideal was that they would be representatives of all the people they represent. The reality is they are representatives of a curated small group of very powerful people. And this is how you end up where we are. So to your point, uh, how do we get out of that or past that? I think Elon is directionally correct in that you allow access to the megaphone in ways that it was never allowable before. Before, to run for president, you had to have that access. That access was only a few channels, and it was very heavily curated. Mm -hmm. You had to get Expensive, through the party. All of it. You yeah. had to get to the media, and they only let certain people do that. There is no way you get a a Ron Paul even in mm -hmm. 1970 and 1980. Simply, and even, yeah, in the 80s, he would got close, but he just didn't get the out. He never had the outlet. That's right. That was what held him back, was not enough... FaceTime. He was not there to play for the party, right? Yes. That was the thing, and the party demanded. And in 2008, we were in that moment where the internet was there, and then all of a sudden, his message got out. Like, they couldn't mm -hmm. stop the signal, right? There's no stopping an idea whose time has come. Mm -hmm. uh, this is where we're at now, I think, even further along, which is that we've opened up the distribution channels enough for them to be a loud enough microphone for others to come through. So like, this is actually how RFK finds a moment. This is how Vivek finds a moment. This is how Andrew Yang did it before. This mm -hmm. is how Tulsi did it before. We're creating these distribution channels and we're building the interconnectivity amongst them for this to resonate totally outside of the mainstream entirely. Like you no longer need CNN to play the game. Yes. You, they are done. 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 It's over. They're irrelevant. They what well, they are relevant to a diminishing population of people, and, and you can see that advertising yeah. dollar drop in yeah. the same way. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, um, you know, f find those people who are still paying attention to CNN and feel safe ignoring what they think right now because they are totally in the bubble of isolation yes. of information. And the people who are swimming outside of that, I would say to some degree, yeah, it's still curated, but it's much more open and allowable for possibilities we've not realized before, and therefore the possibility of candidate, the possibility of idea to come through, totally new ball game. So mm -hmm. I, like, I feel like we're young enough that that's our lifetime. That's the next 20 years sure. for us is really noticing how to be You're that not even guy. old enough to run for president yet, That's right? true. Yeah. I, have, I have time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm in no rush. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it, but it's, we're so early and we're, we're young enough that we, we'll get to be there when the time is right. It's not going to take very long, like that 10-year time frame. In 10 years, I think we're going to look back and go, oh, my God, like, mm -hmm. what happened here? In, in a good way, I think, uh, but it's, it's largely unknowable to us because we've never been able to do this before. And I would say we've not been able to have the volume of people with the courage to do it because the stakes are that real. Uh, there, there have yes, been very several common. moments in my life over the last month where I've looked at the circumstances I'm involving myself in, and mm -hmm. I, it's like that... Uh, the Ralphie Simpsons meme, where it's like, ah, I'm in danger. <laughs> you know? And that's, that's real. Like, I'm like, uh -huh. oh, these are real games, huh? 
And when you find your yourself life. in the middle of them, exactly, um, it's no longer pretend stakes. We're yes. not playing with fake money anymore, yes. right? So that's it, it feels like Fuck that's money. where we're at. Well, right. And to get back to the, you know, everything is money. Like you are the money. Right. I am the money. This is this, uh, <laughs> let's it. get to it. Is yes. the energy is is within us and exudes from us and you know without us to a lot of degree. And, and so what we are doing right now is creating coherence. We're all resonating. We are just like a like a hive. We're attuning to each other, and in that, the coherence and frequencies are elevating. And because of that. I think a new politic emerges. Like emergence is such that you can't necessarily predict it from the the root behavior, mm -hmm. but we're we're in that moment. We're like the the caterpillar turning into a butterfly mm -hmm. and we're we're wriggling out of the cocoon right now and it, it absolutely feels like that moment and so um I would say like guys like Trump, guys like DeSantis aren't that. I would absolutely say that they have opened the door for it. And I think that is valuable in and of itself. So Trump's not going to be the guy to build the new cities, mm -hmm. but if he can plant that seed in a hundred really sharp minds, and then those young guys go and you know, young gals go and build those new things. Um, can you say that's because of Trump? And maybe not totally, but I can say that I'm here today because a guy like Ron Paul planted a seed in me of sound monetary principle at a time when I was not paying attention to that whatsoever yeah. and a time in which he couldn't win the game he was supposed to be playing. I don't even look at it like that anymore. I know the game he was playing was plant seeds. Mm -hmm. See what happens, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's all we're doing, just plant seeds. It feels like we're at a it feels it feels to me for a while that we're at like a pretty big turning point humanity-wise. But something that really stood out to me, I did real estate in 2012. I got my real estate license in 2012, so I did real estate from 12 to 14 here in Columbus. And something that really stood out to me is like, these houses suck. I don't mean it like, uh, I'm very grateful. I love my little place. I love what it provides for me. But it feels like it was thought up in a very different time. Uh, they, they were not thinking about life the same way we are today. They were not thinking about layouts the same way we are today. They were thinking about like shelter, like very basic necessities of just like, yeah. I need a roof, I need four walls, I need electricity in the wall and like one on each side or whatever. And it's like, yeah. okay, so now we rarely are even plugging in regular things. Like we have USB plugs and USB Cs mm -hmm. and houses aren't built for that. It feels that we are in a place where there's such better ideas, but they're not proliferating. They're not getting out. And as you're talking about, like any any a new politic, a new any candidate can reach people now. That feels very possible, mm. but it still feels like Elon Tap DeSantis, not RFK Jr., not mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. unknown guy with great energy that just turned 37 or 36, and like he's like, I'm gonna be president. I got these great ideas. I've been thinking about this for 18 fucking years. I'm Gen Y or whatever. And you know, I'm, I've got, I know where we're going. I grew up outdoors and with the internet. Mm -hmm. This has been my whole life. I'm a digital native. I understand the future. And it, that's, it feels like we have all this potential. Like Elon's talking about uh, the, the Roadster having like rockets in the back. And like they are building a dragon rocket every day. Sure. So like... How many are you going to put on the back? You're going to put two on the back, four on the back. What's the purpose of this? What's it going to do? And like, mm -hmm. I've, I know some inside scoop of like what the idea of that would look like. Yep. But that vehicle isn't for today's world. Mm -hmm. And that's, I just look at like, he's not changing the world. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to change the world by giving us a vehicle that the world is not ready for. Yeah. You change the world by like implanting the idea into someone that will be able to execute when the world is ready. And the idea time is the time for that idea has not arrived. For, and from my perspective yet of, yes. of a, I even look at like model threes and think like, why is a car going zero to 60 in like three seconds? Like, what is the purpose? And I actually asked this on Twitter the other day, just randomly to a Tesla or to Elon or something. And somebody responded, I excel out of more danger uh, then I break out of. And I just did not respond to that of like, <laughs> I'm not engaging with this <laughs> human that thinks this way. But like, no, you've definitely not accelerated out of more danger in your life than you've slowed down for. Mm. Like, 
you're not when traffic stops you don't just fucking gun it and go around or like if is that dangerous slow though? down yeah, that's I mean, a different kind of danger but yeah. you, you're that's the that i'm saying danger period just because yeah, you changed yeah. the danger aspect yeah, doesn't yeah. you didn't escape well, yeah. Yeah, yeah and so like are we it feels like we're almost playing a game with ourselves mm-hmm. of not being honest. Hmm. We're like we're allowing delusion because it feels good. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, can we take a break? The way this is going to be moving forward, just I'm starting to think about it quite a bit more. I good. love it. Evan, mm-hmm. Evan wants to join all the time. And he texts today. He's like, "What time are you at Andrew podcast?" And I was like, three. And he was like, "Ah, oh, so you're going to join?" He's like, "I'd like to." And yeah, I was like, would. "Feel free to call." Love that. So what I'm going to do is, I think I'm going to open up. Uh, a call. I'm gonna get a line and let people call in anytime, and I'm gonna put a <laughs> schedule for my kings. Yeah, with who the guests are, and then just like have the time and who the guest is, and just allow any of you kings to call in at any time and just I be like, that. "Oh, we're having one of the kings join." Yeah, and bam, now we're now we have a third person that joined randomly. Like if Evan called right now, I just patch him in. Sure, and we'd have another another component here just like they walked up and that's what i I really like to do i don't want it to always be uh just the one-off and i want other people to be able to be like oh andrew's on like if chris wanted to pop in and i want to i want to talk to andrew and ask andrew some questions like i know it's not going to be like that for a couple months but at some point we'll get there. it's good to have the vision i think this is um you get to make it what you want to be and What's possible is not what was possible before. So yes. this is back to what we were talking to, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and but did you do it with Evan over the phone? Like was mm-hmm. that? How, mm-hmm. Yeah, two of them. Good, 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 good. Um, and that is so seamless now that you know you don't lose much in translation there. Whereas mm-hmm. before, maybe that was tricky. Lose a little bit of audio quality, but I yeah. think people are willing to put. I think most people don't even know about audio quality. Like most people think hearing things on a radio or something is good audio quality, and mm-hmm. you know there's audio files or whatever but most of those people don't even know that spotify has a upgrade audio right. in the settings like right. you can literally just go in and make it lossless 24 bit 192k that's what i upload that's what i export that's yeah. what i upload you can hear exactly what came out of my machine wow but it's data heavy you uh-huh, know so uh-huh. well i got I mean, that unlimited plan amen, so let's get baby. it going <laughs> you got and in spotify they also have an eq if you're not yeah. hip to that eq and audio quality, two big features of Spotify that I mm. really love. Um, but I was asking so, you if you wanted to go golfing. Yeah. Um, my idea here is since it's time is the only luxury, the only thing I can give people back is time. Mm. So I don't want to give a gift unless that gift is like my time mm. outside of here or giving them time back. So like food, gift cards. And I'm, that's what I'm thinking. Like yesterday I gave Evan a DoorDash gift card and I was like, well, you gave me hours from your family. Yeah have some hours back so no cooking you guys enjoy and he was like that's a fucking great and kendra's like i love that so like eventually it's going to be a title i got a title podcast logo that i made and stuff i'm gonna make a sweatshirt and a t-shirt and then ask people like of course just give us a t-shirt to every guest good and i'm excited I about it I, cam we were here a year ago talking about this and i'm yeah. so I, like i'm so excited always to see dreams manifest and come to fruition like they this always is, do come to fruition you just, I, I didn't believe that before mm-hmm. i met you if i'm frank mm. so this is when amen you, when you talk about what is the goal of inspiration it is that exact thing that you have been doing for all of us so you talk about giving Thank time you. back like no 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 i'll give you all the time you need because i know how I much you. you've saved me and i, I love you. you too i, I was just talking that. about this with jamie the other day um jamie in 2008 uh was watching maybe 2009, watching Red Band and Joe uh, on Justin TV. This is before all streaming stuff. This is no Twitch. This is no like, YouTube. It's just beginning, no streaming, no nothing. Um, and he said he wanted to work for Joe. And I didn't even know who Joe was. I didn't know. He's like the UFC guy. I was like, I don't fucking know who that is. He's like, okay, well, he's pretty popular. <laughs> <laughs> like, all right. What are you and doing? Yeah. I asked him very specifically the other day this question. Okay. How long did it take for him to realize that like his idea of the dream actually came true of like, Hey, you said, this is what I want. And something that Jamie and I have both and like largely Jamie, uh, his dad is the one that everything's going to turn out extraordinarily better Mm -hmm. than you imagine. He grew up with that energy. Yeah. Um, the other, the other part of that was you need to be doing 
you need to be the man for the job that you want. Mm -hmm. You have to actually be it today. You can't, you're not preparing for the job. Then you're not qualified. There's no preparation. You're either ready for the job today or you're Mm -hmm. fucking not the guy. Yeah. So Jamie started dedicating a lot of his time to me, taking photos, uh, making videos, editing things, uh, get helping with websites and stuff. And, and then he went into other people, started doing weddings, started working with other artists, started doing photo shoots and stuff for big people out in LA. Got a photo shoot with Gambino and crew here in Columbus. That opened up a lot of doors for him. It took him actually doing all the things. He had to be really good at all the things. And then it just happened one day. Mm-hmm. And it went from like, I wanted to do this thing to now I literally do the exact dream job I wanted. And, you know, it took me a while. That was 2012 when he really got kicking on it. And that took us a while. We were really starting to see our dreams manifest. We were starting to see things happen, but mine weren't happening in the magnificent way that his had. And I was like, why? What's holding me back? And it was that I wasn't exuding the energy or I didn't have the energy in my soul of I am the rapper I thought I was, or I am the producer I thought I was, I wasn't. Mm. I had to work really hard. Like I didn't make the best beats then. And I was like, I just decided like, I'm going to make the fucking best beats. Next time I talk to a motherfucker, I'm going to have a hundred beats to show him. And I'm a nonstop banger, 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 banger. And like, it took a literal years. It took me from 2012. um, Jamie brought me out 2014. He's like, come stay with me. And that really opened up a lot of doors of being present mm-hmm. where everybody I wanted to be around was. And once you're starting to get around those people, the veil of separation between who you are and who you want to be uh, thins. And you also thin the veil of who you are versus who you think these other people are that you've been looking up to and that you uh, admire. And once you can kind of defeat that per that false perception, your own delusion, you you can see how to do it everywhere. So I'm asking, I was asking Jamie, like, how long did it really take from thought of I want to do this to I'm doing it? And he like three and a half years. Hmm. And I don't think that time is the, something anyone should consider. I think it's more about faith. And that's what I keep experimenting with right now. And that's where our energies are going. Like We've had a lot of big, I'm not going to give other people's good news out, but a lot of good things are happening. Like I I literally just got hit up. I don't, I didn't share this with the Kings chat, but I just got hit up by a record label again, two days ago. Another one. And yeah. And they want to talk to me about my music and I'm just flat out not interested. Mm. And why would I be interested? I wanted to talk to them from 2008 until a year ago. Yeah. They could have called me any time between 2008 to a year ago. The songs they're calling about, I wrote many of them over 10 years ago. Like the songs that are popping are 10 fucking years old. Yeah. And they slept. And now it's to a place where I know I am who I am. And other people are recognizing that I am that. And now I'm not the guy who wants mm. from them. And I'm mm. trying to put this into play for the next phase of my life. Now that I'm no longer a very young man that is inexperienced, I do have experience of me and my friends' dreams actually coming true. Mm -hmm. So if things do, if our biggest, wildest dreams all came true, which they have, Mm -hmm. like literally the dumbest shit we wanted to happen has happened. And like, if if that's the case, then what's next? Mm -hmm. And the thing that really, uh, the thing that still gets in my way on a day-to-day basis Uh, hour to hour even minute to minute sometimes is faith Hmm. and it's really about like my conviction of and and i can always come back to it there's just moments of weakness where i'm like oh this thing's not going to go through or that thing's not going to go through but then it comes back to the it's going to be fucking better yeah than i thought it was going to be and it always is it's really hold how do Holding on to that and like, how do you manifest what's next? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if it's about manifesting. It's about believing it's true. That that just makes it true. Manifesting has nothing to do with. No, we don't make it happen. Yes, we allow it. Allow. We are open to get out of the way. That's right. Yes. Hold on loosely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm the same way. I had this 
real epiphany, I think, this past weekend in Miami. And I think some of it has to do with simply being in a state of relaxation enough Amen. to yes. sort through that. Because often we're, we're intense. We're in tension, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And in doing that, I noticed that I wasn't even appreciating the moment that I was in then in Miami at some penthouse apartment in the nicest part of the, the beach, just really like already living my best life, but thinking, man, when am I going to get to that next, you know, like that thing that I really want, it's not here as soon as I want it. And mm-hmm. boy, you know, I got bills to pay and there's all mm-hmm. these things. And then I, I you, know, you stop for a second and you go, Oh my God, like I already made it. Mm-hmm. I am here right now. This yes. is it. And, I'm sipping the drink right now, yeah. looking at the view right now. The sunset. I'm, and I'm, I'm rich here with, right now. I'm here with you know my my business People partner and best yeah. friend, yes. and just like uh, like all the things that I could map out in terms of what I would have ten years ago just extremely desired yes. and thought was not necessarily possible. And then you go, oh man, like you said, if that's true, what else is true, mm-hmm. right? And then that's where you get to the faith part of it because you can't see it but you can know it in an intuitive sense. Like there is something really good coming down the line for us. How do I make that possible? Stop trying. Yes. How do I, it's not like don't do, but it is getting out of that. I liked how you put it, that um, that delusion of what you think we are limited to be, right? Mm-hmm. And the time dilation of it, like even going back to the earlier conversation about the, the Tesla and the speed and the acceleration, et cetera, et cetera, the the time dilation factor of all of this, which is that things that are realizable are not necessarily immediately realizable and in all places at once, right? So you can notice where we're being pulled forward from sometimes. Mm -hmm. I like to think that if, if it's all like omnipresent, right, then past, future, you know, present, it's all kind of a, an erroneous distinction that we make. And, and therefore like, like the the time dilation and acceleration of us moving forward towards that goal is is us just from there going yeah right it's come on in it's yes. water's warm you know what yes. I mean and in order to do that effectively I think you hit the nail on the head which is um, when you meet the Buddha on the road kill him like mm-hmm. show up to where your idols are and realize that they're just people mm-hmm. and then you're a person in the room with them and you go oh I could do that mm-hmm. right like it's a it's a leveling mechanism through showing up, through doing the work to get in the room and then realizing, yeah, I can swim in this room just like I swim in that mm-hmm. other room. And like that old me that thought I couldn't mm-hmm. was the problem, right? So Is the problem. Literally is, is the problem. Still is. It still yeah. exists. Still and is. Like, <clears throat> yes, that's, so, that's where I try to pull from. Yeah, and, and so it's a good question to ask, like where am I limiting myself right now? Mm-hmm. Like what thoughts do I have that are keeping me from that abundance, yes. right? And then maintaining the humility to say it's likely always something. And... What can you do about that often just looks like, I don't know, um, going to play golf. Yeah. I, I've really learned this actually about golf specifically. Why is golf such a business-oriented game? And you play enough of it, you realize when you're out there golfing, and it's you know it's either a really nice day or it's a crappy day. It doesn't matter either way. Both true. You're focused on this shot. You've got these dimensions of where the ball is, where you want the ball to go, how you're playing relative to this other person. You know, do you do you have a sandwich? Are you hungry? It's like all these variables that are intunely personal. You realize that like all of the business variables aren't present there. You're focused on the golf, but in doing that, you're better at the business. Mm-hmm. You you left it alone enough for you to just kind of be in tune with the process, and then before you know it, like hole seventeen, you're doing some business deal, right? Because you sort of stepped outside of the business of it for a while. And I think that's everything. To be frank, is mm-hmm. just. Um, step outside of the thinking mode enough to be feeling and intuitive and then see what comes of it. And this Mm -hmm. is like what flow states are about as far as I can tell. I just think golf's one way to get there. I think there are many ways you can walk along the beach barefoot and, and, you know, sit in the sun. It's just all, it's all means to heaven in terms of what it looks like for the human body to articulate Mm -hmm. the spirit, like, and, and the tension of the last, well, I mean, maybe thousands of years, but let's just focus on the last 150. The tension of the last 150 was it's all about the work. Mm -hmm. Work, 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 work. Um, Do the work because the work needs done. Go to church once a day or once a week and and really try to figure out, like, 
where the spirit comes through most efficiently because most of the time you're just working. Like, no, the spirit's always there. We just forget about it most of the time. So how do you let go of that external circumstance and say, it's always with me, it's always working through me, it's always working for my benefit. Yes. Even when those things don't work out that I think they were supposed to work out. Like that, we're not. Great. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah amen. So, so my practice right now in that dimension is anytime something doesn't go my way or I think it doesn't, I thank you. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Better. I really try yeah. to say thank you because I know it's somehow, some way gonna yes. work out for my benefit down the line. I agree with that. Um an appeal to heaven. Mm. Um Something that, you know, I, I like, I haven't told this, that's my, only my second podcast, so I haven't told this story and I haven't t- really told it to many people outside of my life, but if you really think about what heaven is, and that's, you know, that's really my, my energy I try to give to everybody is this is heaven and you're in the way of it not being heaven and not anyone else. You can, you could just die like Jesus did. You could just run out on the street and be like, if you're going to kill me, then I guess then do it then. That's what Jesus was literally like, then do it, bitch. <laughs> 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 do it then. And like, it's the most gangster shit ever when you really Truly. get... So heaven means no wants. Hmm. If you're talking, if you ask a human what heaven would be, they, they could say all the words they want. It literally boils down to no wants. Mm-hmm. When COVID hit, Kendra lost her job, uh, several jobs, and she was our breadwinner, our consistent breadwinner. I was hitting licks. I had good jobs. I'd get money here and there, good chunks of money. But Kendra always made every day. You know, she bartending, bringing home cash, two, four hundred dollars, five hundred on a weekend, clockwork. Never, never sick. Bang, 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 could count on it. COVID came, that went away. And I had a real decision to make. My music wasn't popping. The studios were closed down. I wasn't getting a lot of audio work, podcasting work. So what did I, I'm sitting on the couch thinking to myself, am I going to, I can't tell Kendra to like, go, go figure it out. You know, like that's not the man I, I want to be. Yeah. So I had to decide who do I want to be and then I have to be it. And that to me, I was like, oh, I'm going to sign up for Uber. Mm. Well, I tried to sign up for Uber. I couldn't do that because I have an assault charge. Mm. So they're like, no, nah, and that's probably great. And they were like, no. And then after like a week of thinking about it, everybody in my life was like, that's really, you should not be an you're Uber right. driver. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you're right. I would, I would definitely like day two, I'd beat the shit out of yeah. somebody for sure. And, um, or get hurt, you know, do something dumb. You never know. Um, I decided to do Instacart. I wanted a gig that I could do. And I was like, I can deliver groceries. Like that'd be easy. I could go. And it's like, it's COVID. I was like, tips will be real high because people are scared to go out. So like, I could just dive in there and I could just go deliver groceries. So I started that in like August. And I just started with like one day. I just, I was like, I'm going to turn my phone on. I just told Kay, I was like, I feel really weird about it. You know, I never really worked a job ever in my life. I've always done music stuff and audio stuff. I never had to. I, we're always good. And, um, I was like, I'm just going to go do it. So I just went out and did it one day. I went to Laguna Beach and I just drove around for a couple hours. I did like two orders. One was a bottle of wine and one was like four items at CVS or some shit. And then I went home. I made like 25 or 30 bucks. And I was like, that was fucking way too easy to make 30 bucks. And these people were very happy. And like, that was just day one with no ratings, no, no experience. Like, I'm going to do it again in a couple of days. So like a couple of days later, I did it again. And that was like a Thursday or Friday. And then I was like, all right, Sunday I'm banging. I'm going all fucking day and I'm going to see what happens. Well, went to Laguna, made like 200 bucks and I was so pumped. I was so happy. I was like, oh my God, I can pay all of our bills. I could literally pay all, I could do this every day. I was like, I could do it every day. I wasn't tired. Mm-hmm. Not the fucking grocery store driving around Laguna. Like, what do you want? You want eight bags of groceries? Just tell me what you want, fam. I'll bring it. I will be the best grocery deliverer of all time. And just like I'll clean the toilets, I just... I, I was doing it for other than me. I was doing it for Kay mm. and myself, and I was doing it so Kay could feel comfortable. Like she had been breadwinner for a while, making all the money bartending. So I was like, I'm going to do this. Up until that point, my music had not popped at all. This is 2020. I've been putting out music since 2008. Something happened where I got so happy just driving around delivering groceries that I quit caring about it, every fucking thing on earth other than like my bills being paid. Great. I was just super grateful. I wake up and I just drive to Laguna yeah. and I'm driving down PCH in my Camry. And I'm like, this is incredible. Like all I have to do is deliver groceries. I was like, I'll do, I was just thinking, I'll, I'll do this till I'm 70. I'll, I don't give a fuck. I'll deliver groceries forever. This is incredible that I can just go out and deliver groceries. And that went on for about a month, month and a half, maybe two months. And I drive home at, and then the drive home every day was beautiful up 
up PCH back to Huntington Beach, mm. right up the coast. The sun's coming down. I'm driving. So the sun's like just northwest of you as it's coming down. Insanely beautiful the whole fucking drive. Yeah. And every day I was just so grateful. And I'd be looking at my phone, check my Spotify, and it'd be like two people listening. Didn't think nothing of it. Like, cool, get home. And then one day it was seven people listening. And I told Kendra, I was like, I cannot believe that seven people are listening to my music. Like, I literally ran around the apartment. Whole, like, I ran around. I was like, I cannot believe it. Like, who are these mother... Who is listening to Cam Gray right now? Where are they? Yeah. Who are they with? What songs are they listening to? What is going on? Who's playing my music? And I just... Then the next day I got up and go to work feeling even better of like, I'm delivering groceries and people are listening to my music. Like, this is incredible. Like, I couldn't ask for it anymore. I was making beats at night, playing Fortnite with my friends. All my bills were paid. It didn't feel like I worked. Mm. It felt like I wanted nothing. It felt like I had everything. And I started telling everybody that was in my life, I was like, I'm the richest man alive. You cannot tell me Elon's richer than me. There's no fucking way, dog. No way. Me and Elon in the same room, I'm the richest. I'm serious. I really, I'm the richest man. Like, no way, dog. Kendra's bad as fuck. I got everything. I'm beautiful. My body is so great. I work out. Like, I'm so blessed. I cannot ask for anything more. I would not ask for anything more. Get up the next day, and there's 80 people listening to my music. Not the next day, you know, mm -hmm. like a couple days later. But, like, check Spotify, and it's fucking popping. And mm -hmm. I'm like, what the fuck is happening? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, I'm getting emails. I'm getting messages on my YouTube of, like, this is incredible. How have I not heard about you? what is going on here? I'm like, this is fire music. I didn't know, I didn't ever, never heard of you in my life. I found you on Shazam. Next thing you know, I'm charting in Shazam in like 40 fucking countries at the same time. And it, I really believe that to enter the gates of heaven, I had to stop thinking I was not in heaven. Mm. I had to stop thinking about everything I did. I didn't, I didn't choose this. I didn't, I didn't choose to have this new mentality it was like what God placed in my life over and over, just like less and less and less and less and less and failure, 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 bigger failure, bigger failure. Meanwhile, my boy sold a company for $3 million. My brother's murdering it, working at the biggest tech companies in the world. Jamie runs the biggest show on earth. All of them looking at me like Cam's excellent. Cam's great at everything he does, but it was not, it, it was not showing in the world. There was nothing to say like Cam is doing well out here and that all went away when i started just paying bills with proof of work mm -hmm. showing up every day and being grateful that i could do that of like my body works my car works i got a phone i got this app these people out here that want my service they really appreciate it that energy and instilling that every day i really truly believe that not wanting led to gratefulness led to heaven led to dreams coming true. And that is it. That was literally it of, I didn't want anymore. And then there was nothing else to want. Then everything was there. And it's like, okay, mm -hmm. so now it's just, I make music and I do what I want to do. I have a great job. And it was not, I swear, it was not wanting that yeah. led to that change. And it's, I don't have anybody else, you know, we were talking about earlier. It's like, I think the heaven idea is really starting to kick. Kay and I actually just talked about this on Monday. Um, on a, we had a two hour drive and I brought up to her, I said, it just feels like other people are starting to realize that this is actually heaven. And she was like, they definitely are. Mm. And it's like, what, what does this place look like in 20 years Yeah, when a message like this can resonate in the people and people can message me? Like somebody listening to this could easily message me and be like, yo, I heard what you were saying and I want that. Mm -hmm. Be like, don't want that. Just have that. It is. Just stop wanting. Yeah. yeah. Like, just show up and do what you need to do. Dig the hole, yeah. whatever it is you got to do that day, and everything is going to fall into place. Like it's literally just about trusting God. Yes. And I know it sounds so corny and so weird, and like especially if you're not into that mindset, it does sound. It doesn't sound weird to me. It sounds sounds very normal to me to say trust we, God these days. We were conditioned to think it was weird in order to separate us from it, I think. Mm. And I, you know, there may be good reasons why you would want to do that. And at the end of the day, it's all of God as far as I can see. But you're, you're absolutely right that the proof of work was you showing up yes in that dimension. The proof of work in this sort of heavenly dimension is the gratitude part of it. Like mm -hmm. that's the spirited intention 
of a person to have that faith that it is what you're saying it is um, gets recorded, right? This is the thing of it. Yeah. There's weight to that. There yes. is a gravity to gratitude. And what you were able to do was flip the bit. You went zero to one, right? This is the mindset shift. Mindset shift. And you know, I was talking with others this weekend about this because you know, the frequency harmonizes. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think I would be where I am had I not undergone the evolutionary process of just interacting with like the kings on Twitter to mm -hmm. find myself in a position to be open to these other ideas because I was in a, let's say, a very um, uh, like. Uh, a perspective of lack was what I had most. I yeah. wanted, wanted, yes. wanted, right? And then, you know, I would start to see others start you want, talking. Were you wanting money, relationship, house, yeah, just like job? What'd you want? Comfort, you know? Like, I, I wanted to have this ability to... Imagine comfort, like greater level of comfort, better drinks. Like, what was it? That's like, the thing, is that I can look back even now at what I had then and go, that's what I think most people in this world would be desperate for. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what I was yeah, was yeah. just ungrateful for the yes, comfort I did Yes, that's how I was have. too, yeah, amen. So it's the same yes. thing, is that it didn't actually matter what I wanted. You know, maybe yes. I, I wanted a boat and I didn't yep. have a boat, that yep. kind of di dimensionality. Um, and it, it was exactly when it started to sync with me that I didn't have to go anywhere to get it, right? And But that could be true anywhere. I always thought I needed to move out of Ohio to be happy. Me I always too. thought I needed a different yep. job to be happy. And to be frank, some of those things do provide fleeting happiness, right? This is the dopamine addiction yep. of our of our time is uh, happiness is outside of me, it's elsewhere, and just a quick hit will get me through. Mm -hmm. But it's a never-ending series of hits. There was a moment probably, I would say around the same time, and maybe through the following year that you're kind of going through this Instacart process where I started to reorient myself towards um, purpose mm -hmm. instead of monetary reward. And that took leaving a good job to find purpose mm -hmm. that resulted in the loss of relationships that maybe were meaningful, but not deriving that higher order purpose. Um, and that led to exactly what this is that you're saying, which is in being grateful, yeah, maybe you don't have a boat right away, mm -hmm. right? Like gratitude, uh, you can't just go, I'm really grateful. <laughs> where's that boat he's looking you around know, I, know, yeah. I know i know you can see him yeah, he's looking right. around like where's my right. boat where's, <laughs> that, where's that boat at I'm, I'm pretty grateful right now i'm feeling super grateful <laughs> but it's 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 that time dilation it's directionally correct mm -hmm. it is that is the path that once you flip the bit you're on the path to abundance yes. and it just gets more abundant as you go yes. maintaining that gratefulness and you know exactly like you said with the sort of ever evolving process of even just the monetary unit of views or clicks or downloads, et cetera, mm -hmm. right? You can see the exponential curve in that, right? Two, seven, 80, mm -hmm. a thousand. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you're up to now, but I bet it's millions overall over the last. I mean, it went from, it went from, I probably had 200,000 total views in 2018 to I'm at 45 million, just on the big three now, probably closer to like 60 That's overall. That's incredible. Incredible. Right? And, yeah, I mean, and, Never saw it coming. Two years from now, right? Never saw it coming, but always saw it coming. Mm. And that's, that's you know, I, I somebody tweeted the other day, um, Zamuel. Do you follow Zamuel? I think so. Yeah. Great. Um, I don't know his real name, but he's sure. great. He tweeted, how did Kanye know he's going to be a superstar? Hmm. And I, I typed a response and I deleted it because sometimes on Twitter, I feel like I come across the wrong way. But Kanye knew he was a superstar because he was a superstar. Mm -hmm. And like, I resonated with that comment of like, I've known I was Cam Gray since I was 10 years old. Hmm. I knew, I knew who I was in that, in a, in, if you put me in a room, I'm going to shine in that room. I don't, I didn't know what it meant at the time. I had a lot of ideas about what I thought it meant. Yeah. But I really didn't know what it meant to be totally, I knew when I showed up, I was present. That's, Looking back now, I know that I was always where I was. When I was performing, I was performing 
like Cam Gray's on the biggest stage ever, mm -hmm. every performance I ever did. And that was without a doubt of like, I'm not, I'm not here to perform for the five people in the crowd. And that was what's, you know, like literally I performed many nights. People listening to this will definitely know that they were at shows where I fucking rocked out to three, five, 10 people and yeah. they know it. And like some di someday, so many people will hear this and be like, I, I was there. I watched him at Busy Bone and there was only four of us Busy and Bone. he fucking ripped it. And I, I was opening for Busy Bone yeah. at like a little tiny club in Toledo. And knowing is all it takes. It's like, what do you know about yourself? And like, yeah. if you asked me in 2008, 9, 10, I'd be like, I know that I am a super famous rapper. Hmm. And like, I was telling everybody that forever, but nobody, nobody else saw it. And it's because... Nobody else saw it. Why I didn't really internalize the belief, and I was not living as the dude that was the super famous rapper. I didn't. Something I know now is uh, that I didn't know then is you think you want things uh, when you don't have them. Like people that smoke cigarettes often don't have a lot of money, and it's because you can get that thing. You can go spend the six dollars. Now you got the things. Now you got twenty things that you can just have. You, they're all yours. You get to have them. That's what I think smoking really is. I think it's really about like having this moment that this thing that is mine. Now I go on vacation. I can smoke a cigarette. I don't even want the whole pack. I know there's infinite fucking cigarettes. Yeah. I don't need, I just, if I just wanted to smoke cigarettes, I'd just smoke cigarettes all the time. I just chain smoke cigarettes. That's not what I want. Mm. What, I, what I want is to keep being. That is, I don't even want that. Like I'm just doing it. And I trust that it's, God is going to show me up where I'm supposed to be of service next. And I don't have a question of what I'm supposed to do. I know that that moment will present yeah. itself. Well, this and, is this is exactly what you asked me about when you were saying, Miami, what'd you do? How'd you, mm -hmm. Where'd you go? Who'd mm -hmm. you talk to? What'd mm -hmm. you see? I showed up with no agenda and I said, this, this is just going to be what it is. And thankfully, I have people around me. This is the part of it. We don't build these things alone. Mm -hmm. um, there are angels among us that Absolutely. we walk with that allow us to fully participate exactly as we were meant to in those contexts. When I go up and give a speech or a presentation, I will do worse if I prepare it and practice yes. it ahead of time. It, it, I noticed something the first time I stood out in front with this blockchain council and spoke to a group of 100 people on a podium. I've never done that before. Um, if you would have asked me my whole life, I've been petrified of public speaking. Wow, really? Truly. Yeah, Most you don't, you don't seem like see that at all. I didn't see right? it at all. Yeah, not at all. That's the thing. Is it, I've watched it, you speak three or four times. Yeah. I've been making beats by myself for 20 years. Mm -hmm. It's just that, you know what I mean? Like I, I had to do the work to get there. Mm -hmm. That wasn't natural state in that, you know, 16-year-old self. Mm -hmm. uh, but the difference, of course, is that me versus that 16-year-old self, that 16-year-old self was full of doubt that yes. I wasn't that person. So what's interesting is that I think you, you sort of said maybe 10-year-old, and I think there's, there's like this uh, generational component of what it means to be a child in this world, and we sort of grow up as a very early kid, and it's like you can be anything you want to be. Mm -hmm. And like that's the energy that's given to us a lot of times. And then you sort of grow up, and the realities of the world lean into you, and they say... Yeah, not really though, mm -hmm. you know, and like, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of got a temper, or you act out in class mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe you're you not. You can't be an Uber driver. You're not an astronaut, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 whatever um, it is. Whatever yeah. it is. <laughs> and so I, I simply believed that for a very long time. Yeah. I think, you know, what you're saying about you, you know, at that young age or a world famous rapper, I had that in me in spirit very early. And then I had a lot of people that themselves were diminished and therefore didn't like any bright light shining period. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think I just gave into that for a really long time. And so I didn't believe it. I didn't see it. I was, you know, extremely depressed as a result of it because ultimately that was the reality I was curating. And then, you know, being able to build myself out of that to even get to a point where I'm able to stand out in front of a room of a hundred people and speak eloquently and with conviction um, would seem like a long shot to that 16 year old person. But I noticed in that moment that I wasn't even the one speaking. Yeah. Like that was what it came to. Yes. It was like, I truly felt 
yep. the Spirit of God flow through Amen. me in that in ways that I've never been able to do yes. before by letting go, by mm-hmm. you know just just being in the room and doing the thing. Uh, this weekend, uh, um, I don't know the Russian, so Max, please forgive me, but um, I was told a saying that is sort of a, a, a Russian, you know, and I, it, it's like the work must be done. All right. Mm-hmm. So this is the nature of having to show up and do it no matter what, right? This is, you know, you're either looking at the map and studying the territory and trying to figure out the way through, or you're digging the fucking trench and like digging the fucking trench is actually the work that needs to be done. And don't get distracted by looking at the map. And this is kind of the thing of it is that you were just digging trenches forever. Mm -hmm. You didn't, you didn't necessarily know. Looking at the map gets you confused, distracted, yeah. may, hurts your feelings, make you cry, <laughs> make you feel like a piece of shit. Like, the <laughs> maps are pretty, but... Because you look at the treasure. Exactly. That's the problem, is when you're looking, you look at the treasure when you're looking at the map instead of enjoying the ride. And that's... I, I resonate with this so hard. I'd ask you, are you nervous now when you speak? Do you, when you Before you go on, do you get butterflies? Do you feel nerves? Do you feel energy ramp up that, that you would call? Not, I don't mean nervous in a negative yeah, sense. Right. I mean nervous in a anticipatory sense. I like how you distinguish that because before I would have described it as anxiety. Now I'm learning yes. that this is actually energy that I can yes. harness. Yes. So yes, um, and I can I can feel that, and I can I can store it. You know, I hold on to it real tight, and then you get up and you croak, and you get you know you're twitchy, and somehow I've been able to develop the practice of allowing it to f- flow through me more effectively, and therefore, mm-hmm. like I just did this on Monday, it was a small thing, but didn't know I was going to go to a place and have to stand up and speak in front of a group of people. Didn't know the people. Didn't prepare anything right. Mm-hmm. And felt those same things come up, like, oh, what do I say? And mm-hmm. how am I going to look to these people? And are my shorts dirty? Like all those mm-hmm. weird thoughts. And then I just get up there and I don't think about it. I just say what feels right. Mm-hmm. And it seems fine. You know, maybe I'm fine. not as great as I think I am, but no. I got a lot of people great. telling me you're pretty good at this. <laughs> uh-huh. So it's okay. I'll listen to that. And then then it just becomes looking at every one of those circumstances as practice. This is the thing of it too, as far as I see it is, Every time, it doesn't matter if you are at the pinnacle, still practice for the thing you don't know is next, right? Mm -hmm. It's always practice. And looking at it through that lens, I'm always practicing. It's, I never have to feel bad or worried that it's not perfect Mm -hmm. because I know it'll help me be better the next time, right? And that, that's like the removal of the ego Heaven. and yes. it truly like it. it and so then you're just in the I'm not the, it. The I'm just state. here. Yeah. That's right. And I'm just participating in the process. Mm-hmm. And then it just becomes a process of making sure my vocal cords are ready for the moment, right? Yeah. This is the thing, you know, my... Um, say, the th- say the words is digging the trench. Just say the words now, sir. What just, words? <clears throat> just open your mouth. It'll come. Exactly. It'll come. Yeah. You're, you were just digging trenches. And, and, and that that has taught me that there is so much more coming knowing that this yes. is the practice. If yes. this is the practice and yes. the stakes are this, right, which is pretty serious cool stuff, King. Yes. It's, it's unbelievable. And then I get into these rooms with these people that are up, and I go, oh, I can mm-hmm. do that, right? Mm-hmm. And it just it's a continual process of evolution of expectation. Yes. And I'm noticing also that as it elevates, my ability to enjoy it elevates because I'm learning. It's like the iterative process of, Enjoying, learning, evolving, enjoying, learn, right? Like it mm-hmm. never stops at that mm-hmm. point. There is no... Mm-hmm. You can't fail. There, yeah, and there's no mountaintop no, either. There's no, the journey is you it. Just you're literally at the highest point all the time. Exactly. That's, yeah. People talk about like, oh, once you're all the way up, they can tear you down. Not if not if you're it. Uh, my up is bigger than I your up. I am the mountain. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, what are you talking... I can see all of the levels of yeah. the mountain. I'm literally still nine-year-old Cam. I'm still yeah. hungry Cam. Your and, up is not my up, Cam. Yeah. So... Uh, 2005, maybe early six, 2006, um, I just met Billy Mace. Shout mm-hmm. out Infinite Third. I love you so much, my king. Call me soon. Um, he, We were in a class together, and uh, I have a funny story about how I found out who his dad was, and we became really good friends through a mutual friend of ours. And uh, we were in a group project, and it was like Thursday and he invited me and another dude. He's like, hey, do you guys want to come to my dad's house? He lives in Tampa. And I was like, uh, fuck yeah. Like, you know, kid from Bell Fountain, Ohio. I ain't really yeah. seen that. Like a $200,000 house, a lot to me, you know? Like, it's, you rich as 
fuck if you got a five bedroom. I, I want to see what oxyclean money Tahoe, looks like. Oh <laughs> yeah, like Tahoe and and a pool in the backyard. You were balling where I came from. So I'm like, yes, please. I would love to come to your house. Uh, so we go to his dad's house, and it's fucking incredible. Lives next door to Tiki Barber. Um, football, you know, f- star yeah. football player, ex, like one of the best running backs, at least, at least in the conversation. Super Bowl champion. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, sick house, incredible. And we go in. First thing I see is huge, beautiful uh, frames. And I'm and the picture changed. And I was like, what the fuck? I'm like, what is what is that? And Bill's like, oh, they're just TVs. I was like, holy shit, bro. <laughs> like, they just got TVs on the wall that nobody even fucking watches. Like, this is just an empty room. That's a TV. We're like, what are we doing? I was freaking out. And here comes his dad. And he's like, hey boys. Hype. You guys want some margaritas? And he's got like a cup in one hand and a fucking pitcher in the other hand. And we were like, absolutely. So he's like, come on out back. And like, great, and Billy Mays energy. Yeah. You know, come on, boys. So now we're 19, 20, 21, and uh, Bill's younger than me and uh, Stax. We go out in the back porch, beautiful, right on the lake, overlooking sunset coming. It's beautiful fire. And uh, we're sitting around talking. He's like, tell me what's going on. And it's just the four of us hanging out. He's like, what do you guys want for dinner? We'll order food. And we start talking about school and uh, this presentation, the reason we're all hanging out and we've got tight is because we are in a group project together. It's a very big project for our year and our years. We went to school 24 hours a day, seven days a week, pretty much 365. You get off Christmas, Thanksgiving, you get like little breaks, but like Easter, you get off like Easter. You don't get no fucking spring break. You, you get Sundays, no school. You're on school Saturday, you're in school Monday. Like you're literally 24 seven. And it's because it's the recording industry they're trying to make you ready mm-hmm. for you. You're not in control of this. You're you gotta working, weed people out. You're right? working with whoever, yeah. whoever tells you to come, and like yeah. they're telling you stories of like this motherfucker got fired from his great job because he didn't have the right mint ice cream for Prince or whoever it was. So we had done a couple um, presentations that were practiced for this big presentation that we had coming up, and when I mean big presentation, like we're literally presenting a business plan to VCs that are ready to invest in students right fucking now. And our buddy Stax, Stax Guitars, uh, shout out shout out Jared Stackowicz, uh, he builds the best guitars ever. He was uh, Pantera's, uh, he built a cu- guitar for Dimebag. Wow. He was uh, Metallica's guitar tech for several years. He's at, an incredible, builds the best guitars on earth. He, he fucking, every guitar you've ever seen is dog shit, except for the super old ones compared to my boy Stax, he fire. Um, and we're talking about talking in front of people to the king of talking in front of people, right? Mm-hmm. Like the king of it that we all know. And he was like, you boys get nervous? And I was like, I do. I get super nervous. And he was like, that is great. And we were like, what? He's like, you got to just use that. Like that energy, Yeah. let that energy build in you. And he was like, that means that you care. Yes. It does not mean you're anxious or nervous. And I never heard it like this. And he was like, I get butterflies and I get anxious before every shoot that I do. And I was like, what the fuck, dog? Like, this guy's done hundreds of commercials that I've seen. And he's like, I get nervous before every one. And I'm like, what? And he's like, so nervous. But the reason I'm nervous is because it means I care about the presentation. And he said, I just use that energy of, I know that I care and it's okay if I make a mistake. So go fucking hard, mm. go loud, go hard. And that energy, literally, I, I think about it all the time. I think about him saying this all the time. And RIP, my king, you were amazing. Um, it's, it really, hearing that from him, a superstar that I watched on TV for years. Yeah. And then that was the first superstar that I killed in my life. The first Buddha yes. that yes. I was like, oh, this is just a man. Mm-hmm doing things out here and he's telling me don't be nervous that energy you have is caring don't let that stop you let that propel you into doing it more and then we started doing these presentations we are the only present presenters that actually got investment of course uh, they offered us a quarter million dollars and we were, they wanted us to move to hawaii mm-hmm. and stack turned it stack was the guitar builder and he didn't want to do it huh uh, he just actually just started building the guitars maybe two years ago and um, like called all of us and like 
follow it up with us and be like, Hey, I'm going to push this business plan forward. Are you cool with it? Type shit. And we were like, yeah, that's dope dog. Like we should have done it 20 years ago. Sure. <laughs> like, but like it, the, the idea wasn't ready. He, he wasn't ready to do it. And now he is, mm -hmm. but it's very interesting to hear like the guy that's known for projecting advertising into the world was nervous. Like he is the, the fucking guy. He is literally it when it's talked about presenting pitching and he was doing it on boardwalks for years and like selling car wash stuff to people walking up and down like going to get cotton candy or like going to get a hot dog and he's like gotta get their attention gotta get them into them like yeah. have you ever cleaned a car like this you've never cleaned a car like and like and then people start watching and he turned that into an epic career but he was still nervous and I was like, well, if this guy's nervous, then how in the fuck could I not be nervous in front of a right. hundred kids, my peers at fucking 19 years old, 20 years old? Like, I'm supposed to be fucking nervous. If you ain't nervous, it's because you literally don't give a fuck. It's like not dressing nice. It's like not ironing your shirt. It's like not cleaning your house. Mm -hmm. Like th those things, you do those because you care. Yeah. You do it because you care. You push through the nervousness because you care. Mm -hmm. Like, sure, there could be anxiety and you have like stage fright, but like, how lucky are you to have fucking stage fright to know that? To know that, like, I can't get on stage. People want you to get on stage and you're fearful of it. Like, I just remember Lance Bass having stage fright for NSYNC. Okay. And I just remember being like, what the fuck, dog? Like, you guys are dancing like puppets and you have stage fright? Like, that should alleviate all fucking. Yeah, stage fright. Like you're literally like doing the like fake ass robot, like wiggling your arms and shit. Like that, out, that should yeah. free you up. Should. Like you should just be like, bitch, we're acting like we're on marionettes. Like it's fine. Like what are you worried? You're gonna make a mistake. Yeah, let the mistake go. Like the mistake is not a mistake. I this is I'm, I'll quit talking in a second. I'm not on a rant, but uh, and the other day I texted my dad and happy birthday again, pops. Shout uh, out to the king. Te texted him the other day and just said, I just want you to know. Like all things considered, you are an excellent parent. <clears throat> you guys did a great job. It's and very... he said, we made a ton of mistakes. And I said, I don't know what mistakes you made. And thank God for them because I don't think God makes mistakes. And if, if other things went differently, I wouldn't be this guy. That's and right. like, I'm so grateful to be who I am sitting here with you right now. Like, I can't imagine being anywhere else. Like, yeah. our, we're not checking our phones. We ain't doing nothing but sitting here looking each other in the eyes, having a conversation. And like, I could be the guy wanting energy and looking at my phone and yeah. seeing who's pinging me. What else is out there? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah and it's yeah. like, no, this is it. If this is the end, this That's is right. the end, baby. We made it. It's incredible. <laughs> Ain't my problem. It, like, it all went according to plan. And it, it does. That's very kind of you to, to do for your dad. And I know that's probably not something he is accustomed to hearing necessarily, but... Your point is the point that will be missed if you are only focused on the mistakes, which is that mm -hmm. all mistakes lead to the same place at the end of the day, and therefore are they mistakes, right? This is again, it's like if it doesn't work out, thank you. I how I many so Christians believe that. that though? How I, many Christians believe that God is in control and then they'll they blame themselves? Yeah. But when things go good, they give God the credit. That's right. And like what like why wouldn't you just like just always give God the credit and like know that like God did the thing and just let go yeah. of you making yeah. mistakes. And like, imagine, imagine going through your whole life just thinking you fucking up all the time. Like, of course you're depressed, dog. Right, right. <laughs> like, of course, well, if that's all you're thinking about. It, it, because it's you, you know, that's where, you know, I didn't grow up believing in God. And so I felt me like neither. it was all on me either way. And yeah. then of course it's like nothing but mistake, nothing but mistake. I look at it now and I go, it's fascinating to me how my whole life set me up to be here now. Yeah. In ways that I am still starting to just scratch okay. the surface yeah. of. And and so yeah, exactly that point, which is that, you know, the mistakes are not mistakes in the grand scheme. Therefore, let them go, right? This is part of it. Um, and also like with the Billy Mays thing, how lucky were you to receive Amen. that wisdom Amen. then? Right. Like how many people do you think overall got that message? from him the like, three of us me bill and stack that's yeah it. i mean that's and that's it and so how lucky are you guys to be heaven yeah it, it was curated just for you to receive at just that time and even though it didn't necessarily work out in the pitch it worked in the pitch you didn't get the thing mm -hmm. thank you because it led to all mm -hmm. these other things right you could be 
somewhere in Hawaii right now doing yeah. some other shit. I mean, we, that's what, we were yeah. like, literally, I'll never forget this. We had like, yeah. like $5,400 accounted for toilet paper. Like, uh. We literally had the business plan like down to the fucking dollar for everything. And like, it was five of us and we had it. I mean, we were ready to we were ready to build the best guitars on earth. And yeah. when when a nineteen year old kid is telling you like, yeah, it was Metallica's guitar tech for fucking seven years, and they're like, since you were twelve, and he's like, okay. yeah, I did it for a long, I did it several years. Every yeah. time they came to town, I was their guy. Okay, and it's like, yeah, I guess I'll let this fucker build. And like, he's showing you a guitar and like playing the sickest shit. He's like, and the yeah. whole class is like, wait, I'm in class with this yeah, kid. What are we doing? And like, yeah, and it's like this. This kid's 19. It's like, of course I'll give this fucking guy some money. And then right. he's like, I don't want it. I'm going to go work at Chicago Recording Studio. Amazing. And what a lesson that is. Yeah. It was a big, and that's a, I look at that a lot because we really wanted it. You know, we really wanted to go build the guitars and we didn't get to. And instead, I went and made a Bible. Mm. And as a non God believer, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, was, I would almost call myself an, I, not almost. I was like an atheist of yeah. like I, I thought I was on like it. Yeah. I thought I was like I make all decisions. I do right. all things, and now I can't even decide. Like my literally, I think about this all the time, every day. This is like my big thought right now, and I know you know this already, but everybody else listening, I can't decide if I'm actually the one like picking up this glass and having a sip, or if it's the universe, mm -hmm. because like. And like Evan said yesterday, he's like, gravity's pretty weak force overall. And I'm like, well, how high can you jump? And he like, he giggles, you yeah, know, and it's like, yeah. not that high. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, well, well, if gravity was a little bit weaker, let me tell you, you could jump higher. And I just, what's really causing somebody to swing a baseball bat and hit a baseball that's going 100 fucking miles an hour and they hit it 500 feet? That, yes, you did it. I guess. I guess. But like yeah. gravity's moving literal all things. Mm -hmm. So like if if you believe in one, how do you believe in the other? And it's these are the duality questions that, you know, get really deep philosophically, but how can you believe that the sun is turned by gravity and earth is spun around by gravity and all these things like all these things are happening due to gravity, but you're I'm fucking, I'm moving this microphone up and down. Blah, 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 blah. Like, yeah. oh, I'm the one doing that? <laughs> right. Or is this the gravity wave hit exactly right here that made me do this thing that yeah. I have no fucking control over? Sure. And when you make a Bible and then years later fall in love with God and the idea even of the Bible, like I, I look at the Bible as like the greatest work of all time. And mm -hmm. And it took me a long time to get there. And it, I think what the main turning point for me was 2016, uh, after meeting Kanye, I started working on some big projects. When I started doing real projects, it was 30, 50 people touching song, music. Uh, I made a, a box that was like an album, but like people are taking photos, people are designing the box, people are making sure that literally choosing fonts was yeah. a fucking big deal, you know? And um, box design, size, packaging, shipping, like all of these things went into this huge project that was really magical for me and a, a big boost to my career. But it wasn't me. I made a song. I literally made one fucking song. And like... I didn't even write all the song. I didn't perform the music. Kilhoffer made the music. A guy who made, all, he's won five Grammys, made all of, Con, worked with Kanye on every album. And like, how could I move forward in life and be like, bitch, I made this. <laughs> like. My name's Cameron Gray. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But like, and that's, and like, it all changed there. It really yeah. changed there of like, I just realized this isn't me. I'm not the guy. And like you were saying, like you're standing at the podium speaking. I, I, I swear this is true. This is really how my soul feels. I don't have song ideas. Song ideas happen yeah, to me. That's right. Hi-hat patterns occur mm. in my head. It is my job to click all the fucking buttons necessary to make it occur in your head. You're just translating. All I'm doing is taking this idea that like, I can literally hear, I'll sit and play a song, 
I can hear what's next. I know what's next. And it's like, okay, now I've got to make this sound. Yeah. And I've got to hit these fucking keys on the keyboard right there to make this sound come out. And once it comes out, I don't ever have to do it again. Uh-huh. But it has to happen or I'm not going to sleep tonight. <laughs> so I sit there and I fucking hit all the things and I hit the buttons. And then once I hit the buttons, it's done. Mm-hmm. But I don't feel like I did the thing. I feel like I caught that, th- like I almost captured it in a net. And now I get to show people it, but I don't really feel ownership over it. And I think that's, I think that's the key to not wanting is to not also have, to also not own things. Claim it as yours. Yeah. Like, <clears throat> like even Kendra and I's relationship. I was going to say, it makes marriage tricky, huh? It, well, Kay and I aren't married. Well, we just got yeah. engaged 17 yes, yes, years yes, yes, in. Yes. Well, yeah, any committed relationship, let's say, but go on. But that's what, like, the energy has been, I don't own her, and yeah. I don't want to have, I don't want her to choose me ever, any day, because we're married. I don't want her to wake up and be like, uh, but we're married. Guess I'm married today. Yeah. yeah. Like, I just would rather it be like, you're free to do whatever you want. Like, there ain't no court here, there ain't no law here, ain't no right. judge, and that... Some people would say like, oh, you're just not committed. Like, no, we're fucking super. We plan to have a child. Like, that's how committed, like, planned. We didn't just have one. Like, we, we, we plan to not have one for 16 years, and we did very well. Mission accomplished. Yeah. <laughs> shake, shake on that. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yes. And, but now we're to a place where we did plan on it, and here we are. But it's the commitment. It's the letting. It's allow. It's the letting, it's the being open to. Yes, yeah. That really, that is the marriage. That is the freedom. That is the relationship. Like our relationship is not an open relationship. I'm right. not okay with her doing right. anything that she right. wants to do that would that would hurt me uh, in the moment. But I'm okay with her doing whatever. Mm-hmm feels good to her Uh, and that's like would i be upset yes but like i just want her to be as happy of a being as she can be and if if that's not me then okay baby like Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay just say the say the spell that's right and we'll be we can figure it out together like it's not that's not saying that's easy either sure what you're saying is that 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 certainly beats the alternate of force right like trying to Yes, and I see so much force of marriage and people, like a lot of people, I know some people right now, some good friends of mine that are married because of the kids. Of course. And like, they're like, I fucking do not like this bitch. (laughs) And like, like, I don't, I I can't really speak on that because I don't have kids. Yeah. And I'm not married. Mm -hmm. But I I don't think that's good for anyone involved. I, I not the so. kids, not the not any of the individuals. Um, mm. I think it really it hurts everyone involved, and that's where I feel. I saw a tweet the other day that said uh, from Neville Goddard. If you guys don't follow Neville Goddard on Twitter, oh my gosh, Neville Goddard Daily, yeah, <laughs> click it follow, daily. Follow, yeah. baby, you got to follow. Um, they tweeted about about marriage. What they say. <clears throat> I wish I could pull it up, but just something about like faithfulness and like commitment and like, it's, it's not even up to you basically. Mm -hmm. Like you can be there. It's, it takes both people always like committing to that same thing. And that's, yeah, that's what I love all the energy of like the word uterus. Like it's literally you to us. Mm -hmm. And like, people are like, oh, it's just the uterus. Like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, what a spell. It's the best spell ever. And and like the, the people think these things are accidents, but they seem so hev- heavenly for lack of a better godly mm-hmm. uh just they seem so no, no word after so. They just seem so. Mm-hmm. It just seems like that's the way things should be. And like I'm not really sure any individual gets to choose that destination right as much as like how many people have kids with multiple women and do they feel like those kids shouldn't be like absolutely not those kids 
when Kane came, I really felt like Kane had always been here. I, this is a weird thing to say, but since Kay got pregnant, I can't see anyone on earth, literally anyone. A dude across from me the other day at, at the, that we went to the hospital Monday for a, like a super ultrasound and we were leaving. There's a dude at a stop sign in the parking lot. So like two big parking lots, stop sign facing. And he was waiting. He was like slow to come out. It was obviously he was there way before me. Yeah. And I'm like, what is he waiting on? And in the moment, I usually been like, you fucking idiot. Come on. Like, what are you doing? But coming out of this ultrasound, the thought of my mind was, this is somebody's child. He's 70 years old, this guy. Mm. And I'm thinking, that's just somebody's kid. Yeah. Hesitant to cross the street because there's some other cars around and he doesn't want, he's unsure. And that moment of that somebody's child really resonates so deeply with me in some moments right now, not totally, but often, sure. that it's very difficult to like take any anything for granted of it. This is all so magical. Or anything personally. Yes, So the, sure. the flip side of it is, fuck this guy, he's impeding my day. Yeah, and then you yeah, just yeah. realize, nah, it's our day. It's our day, Go my Go ahead, king. my king. Amen. Yeah, amen. Amen to that, right? Our and this day. is... Um, on the relationship bit, you're, you know, I forget where we were when we moved into the territory of marriage, but the kind of the concept of that commitment and the dedication to a, a, a vision, right? So I have a vision of how it's going to work out, and that is the vision. And if it strays from that, if I get distracted from that, no good. As it turns out, I have a vision that's directionally correct. How I get there will meander, and the end may not be exactly what I envisioned, but um, that was all part of the process of getting to that end goal. Mm -hmm. And therefore, yeah, let the man cross the street. Yes. Don't get offended when yes. somebody leaves you, right? And I thought, learned this a lot of hard ways and a lot of times in my life, and you have to realize this is true of relationships, friendships, parents right mm -hmm. you know we don't all get to choose when our parents leave us sometimes they leave us when they're still alive right i'm learning all kinds of dimensions of interconnection and i've noticed that the people that took it the hardest and hold on to it the longest are the ones that still struggle with mm -hmm. finding heaven here and now um, because we all want to be a victim of something you know, I think it's so easy to say, you did this to me. Mm. How dare you, right? Mm. It's not, this is what we did. It's not, um, yeah, I can see how my actions played into your actions, mm. right? It's always, you've done this to mm. me. Mm. That's, um, th you know, that's the opposite of godliness. That's the opposite of collective consciousness, right? That's the idea that I am here separate and there's nothing that can touch me, this thing that is I. No, we're, it's all vibing together no matter mm -hmm. what right like you saying what you're saying looking at me while you're saying it here in physical space will touch me in a way that it's not going to touch just the person listening to it that's not me it'll still have an effect there's a very direct connection right here in ways that are meaningful when you do that over time let's call it a relationship all of a sudden the human condition says well we made a choice. We made a choice to get married. Therefore, you must always choose to be married and like uh, being married to me, right? And then that expectation is what gets in the way of it. And then all of a sudden, maybe it made perfect sense that you were married for 10 years and then you went and did separate things. Always does. Always, yeah, no matter what. Uh, but if you hold on to it, you're just going to make it worse for everybody. Yes. And as long Amen, as you hold on King. to it, it will continue to be worse for everybody. And so like the allowing <laughs> of... So like the marriage, even the dimension of marriage is irrespective. You and Kay decided we're committed in this dimension, in this way, that is irrespective of the ring or the contract, et cetera. It was simply a choice you made every day when you woke up, and mm -hmm. that is its own form of commitment. And that's worth doing in and of itself. The lesson you've learned through that, of course, is it's always a choice. And so the question of... Is it us doing this? Is it outside of us moving through us? It's like, well, it's it's always kind of both in the weirdest way. The weirdest way. The weirdest way, which is like you were talking about with your music, the 30 to 50 people that did this project with you, right? Mm -hmm. You were the gravitational center of it. You were the tip of the spear of the project, but it took the whole team. Mm -hmm. But the whole team wouldn't be doing it if there weren't a Cameron Gray. 
Maybe. Always Maybe take. Maybe do something else. Maybe, yeah, something yeah, else yeah, sure. for but somebody yes, else. But, but that, in that this moment, specific yes. project, yes. for this specific reason, it was for Cameron Gray, but through all of those people. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, if there were no Cameron Gray to stand out in front and claim it and propel it forward into the world, all of that effort would have been lost anyway. So like, sure. no good for those people either. So it didn't need to be... Martina, whoever, who did the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the key grip on one of your VR shoots or whatever it is. Um, but it did need a Cameron Gray. And, and you have tweeted about Kanye in this way, which I think is interesting, and relating to this idea of nothing being a mistake. Mm -hmm. Even when I feel like, let's use you as an example, because we're here now. When you tweet something that I don't resonate with or mm -hmm. I don't agree with, that's not a mistake. That's not a problem. That's just moving us towards better understanding somewhere yes. down the line. Yes. And here we are. And yeah. I'm noticing now the way you were talking about Kanye maybe a little bit ago, maybe a year or two ago now, where you were saying Kanye is not the guy. It's, all, mm -hmm. it's always people behind him. Mm -hmm. Like those are the people making the beats. Those are the people mm -hmm. creating the lyrics, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, yeah, that's true. And also. And also. It's both, yeah, right? And it, it couldn't be done without him. Kanye's the light. He's the guy it, exactly. out front saying good morning. Exactly. <laughs> just, just like you were, yeah, right? And yeah, so yeah. this is um this is so it's it's such a weird duality because it will always take both. And that doesn't mean I love that you brought up Kanye here. Well because I've I've more to add to this. this yeah, is good. and 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 those two things are now inseparable to me because truly like I started paying attention to you when I noticed you had that moment with Kanye back mm -hmm. then, the TMZ clip. Mm-hmm. There, you're inextricably part of his story and he to you. And I think mm -hmm. that's so interesting to me for so many reasons. But as an analogy, it's kind of similar to me in that I'm noticing, yeah, I'm never going to claim he is doing all of it. I'm never going to claim you are doing all of it. I'm right. never going to claim I'm doing all of it. It is simply that some people are capable of being the light in ways others aren't. And therefore, the effort of in 50... In different ways, in ways others aren't. That's it's right. Line. Well, yes. and the effort of 50 people is amplified Mm -hmm. through that single voice sometimes. Yes. And then therefore, you are always uplifting all of the team through the process, sure. even if they're in the background and you're in the foreground. Mm -hmm. Not everybody wants to be in the foreground. True. Right? Mm -hmm. But you were saying this made you think of Kanye. I'm curious where that went in your head. Well, uh, we talked about marriage and stuff. Yeah. And I found it interesting the other day. I asked, did you see the clip going around of the dude that was hitting on Kanye's new wife, the Bianca no, girl? I've not seen it. So he's like, she's like at a mall shopping or something. He's recording. So he's like holding his phone like right here. He is recording himself. Not Kanye, some other dude. This is recording himself hitting Walking, on this Walking, hitting yeah. up to this. And he doesn't know who this is. And he's like, yo, yo, girl. He's like, like, what's going on with you? And like, yeah. she's like looking at him and like, you could tell, like, he's got the phone out. Like, she can clearly sell, see that, like, she's being recorded. And she's yep. like, short girl looking up at him. And he's, like, asking her questions. Like, what are you doing here? Just shopping, hanging out? Are you by yourself? What's going on? And he's like, who you with? Like, can I get your number? And she's like, oh, I'm, I'm actually with somebody. And it's posted on the internet. Of, like, this motherfucker is asking Kanye's wife yeah. what's up mm -hmm. and recording it. Right. It's interesting to me that Kanye so quickly moved on to another marriage and at the same time as encouraging Kim to not be uh, like loosely dating, hmm. but to make a commitment to somebody for her family, for the kids, to show them that like this is the way that families are. This has been a point of mine in my dad's relationship. My dad has been married five times and my mom was wife number three. And only two kids, my, my brother and I. Wow. And for a long time, I used that as a point of contention or a point of uh, belittling of like, my dad's been married five times. I've, I've been with Kendra for 17 years or whatever, you know? And like, that's the energy that I would project of like, don't, like he gave me, like try to give me relationship advice. But like, dog, come on. Like I literally told him one time, I was like, I don't need relationship advice from you. Like. My one relationship's longer than all, like, your total relationships mm -hmm. marriage-wise. And, like, I said it in, like, a hurtful way. Sure. As I've gotten older, I've got to a place where I really respect that he's been married five times and almost, not almost, like, definitely see it, like, I can't be certain that his energy uh, is the energy that I'm feeling, but I do feel some like almost happiness of like, he felt like he could get married five times 
and like he was in love five like that five times like yeah like i just can't imagine having that for five women uh, like abundance bro and like <laughs> and like that fact that he is choosing it and like he's yeah. the one like i'm marrying this mm-hmm. girl i'm gonna propose to you and the fact that five women said yes like what a fucking dog bro you the man yeah. and like not only that like to have the balls to do it mm-hmm. five times, like on Friends, dog Ross is tripping after two. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's like it's like half the series that he's like, I just can't be just marrying bitches all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like it can't be what I do. And like my dad is absolutely like the opposite of like, nah, I marry all these bitches. Any- Another one, yeah. That, yeah. And like not all of them, but like he yeah, yeah. he's not frivolous. You know, like mm-hmm. I don't feel like he's a frivolous man in any respects. Right. And, and um, it feels like. He's doing what he feels is right, and like he got married, again, like the, his fourth wife was uh, with a woman that I knew was in her life, and uh, it was good to see him get married as at the at the age it happened. Like I was like twelve, thirteen, and I was part of the wedding, and it like really did like make me feel like oh, this is what families are. Families can families can come together and be a new form of family as opposed to like. Oh, it's gotta be my mom and my dad, and or like, else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it and it took me years. You know, I'm t- I'm serious. I'm talking like twenty plus years, and now I'm to the point where like I'm I literally just texted my dad, and I'm like, "Hey, you didn't make any." And he said he made a bunch of mistakes, and I'm like, "Well," and he's you know he's I wouldn't say he's religious, but he's very godly man. And I said, "Well, that that would mean that God made mistakes," and like he does, he doesn't respond to that of like, and I don't know if he has doesn't have an answer or he disagrees. Like maybe he feels he has. Uh, free will sure uh, but i that's a that's a deep argument for christians and people yeah. that believe in uh, it's at the root God. of it though this is the nature yes. of sin is well you're you are a sinner but don't worry you're See, forgiven that's, right that's the whole like i just don't get this I whole energy that's the corruption well and this yeah directly adjacent to right you um your experience with the bible project i think was just a test along the way to lead you to god it wasn't meant to be your choice necessarily to say, well, if I do this, I guess I must walk towards God. You just said, I'm going to do this because it's a great job and also pretty prolific gig as far as I can tell. Like this project seems to be a pretty big project. Um, But you can look at it now and say, I recognize that for the test that it was. Yes. Because a real hardline atheist would have had nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. They would have said, no thanks, not taking that job. Yep. Don't believe well, in that. Well, I needed a job bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, right. Yeah. Right. It was like, go home or yeah. take this job. Well, and, 100%. And so you were led to it. And I, I, I think that's always the case. We are led to the learnings. Have you ever been religious? You got, you, are you a religious person? Are you, you ever been to, you got into church at all? Yeah. I mean, if you define religious as going to church, no. I think I do. I don't know. Fair. I don't know how I define it, but I, I would say like, there's like levels of like, I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there's like, you almost have to clarify their nuance of like, what do you believe? And like, like you have to go to church every Sunday. Which denomination are you? Yeah. And then like, like there are of course denominations, but like, I feel like going to church every Sunday is like a different type of religious than somebody who's like, I'm a Christian, but I uh, just live in the, like, I wouldn't even claim to be a Christian. You know, I, I don't believe Jesus is my savior. I believe my thoughts are responsible for my well-being, and I look at Jesus as like having the best thoughts. Jesus had the best thoughts. The best thoughts. <clears throat> we and can agree on that. Amen. Yeah. yeah amen. Jesus had the and best. And like, I thoughts. don't think he's like yeah. he's that. Sick. Um, maybe maybe that'll change uh, someday. Of like, maybe I will see him as. A, maybe I'll start to see his thoughts as the original thoughts that I am now holding. Mm-hmm. And I'm, thank goodness he had them first. But it's not like we're reading Jesus's works. You know, like, it's not like we're reading the book by Jesus. It's true. A lot and of it is what other people said about him, right? This is, the reason that I wanted to bring this up was because something I really like about the Bible is how many, like, people call it the Bible, mm. but, like, it's written by every, you know, it's all the writers. There's it's like so many books. hundred versions, yeah, just, all yeah, the books. Just and in then, English. And yeah. then when you find out more about it, you yeah. realize that they've actually even pulled books out mm-hmm. of it that they are not good for you. You, you can't have these books. Yeah, not those books. And that's Sorry, what those got washed away at sea. That's what interests me. Yeah, is this collective art project mm-hmm. that has been like sold to us in a way that's uh, 
beyond our time of recognition as humans. So like we have no choice but to believe in like its magical properties because of the time aspect mm. of like it's been around for long longer than everything that we know of. Not everything, but do you think that's why we take it so seriously? Because it endured? Or I think has it, en- it endured? I think it endured yeah. um, because, because it's so good. I mean, it's just... Okay. Compelling. Good. good or it, it's true. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't say true. I would just say good. It's, And this is where like a lot of people, people will say like the Bible is this or the Bible yeah. is an instruction manual. The other day, Goddard tweeted about like uh, the Bible needs to be psychologically interpreted as an individual to find its true meaning to you in the moment. Mm. And I really like that. I'd say that's really good then. Pretty that, impressive what that book can do. That's what I feel. I yeah. feel if you're coming in with gratitude and yeah. good energy that the book is good. Mm-hmm. But there are, like anybody could pick out their lines and be like, well, what about this line? Or what about that that's line? That's my favorite move. What it's, about this line? Oh gosh, yeah, bro. Yeah, yeah. It's so, like I'm not, even a, I'm not even a Bible defender. I'm just like a... I'm a lyricist. So like, <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, like exactly. I think about you and I think uh-huh. we talk about this with rap lyrics even. It's like, well... Um, did you mean that line in your song 10 years ago sure. in this way? Even if it is right? rape. Me Whenever and Miley Cyrus is, putting yeah. out a mix. My fucking godson tells me his favorite song is Hot Town. And I end the song with, and if that don't work, then me and Miley Cyrus putting out a sex tape, even if it is rape. That's how I end the song. And he's like, that's my favorite song? He's nine. I'm like, of course, God. Right. Of course, God is like, you record that. That's what we're making your godson's your favorite song, just so you learn this lesson that's, before Kane gets here. <laughs> it's still going to be there, though. It's, it's going to be both, yeah. So it's what do you put out there? What are you willing to stand behind? And like the artistic license, I think for you, and we've talked about this even specific to that, it's like what's the artistic license to do something like that as a, uh, a learning lesson? What are you doing when you write lyrics? You're trying to mm-hmm. communicate where you were at any given time, and then you're trying to say, you can be like me. You can choose not to be like me. It's actually secondary to the point. Um, am I the mirror for you enough to make a directional change that's mm-hmm. right for you? Because I'm not Cameron Gray, right? right? So if I hear that lyric and I think about it myself, I also have a choice. What do I think about that? Mm-hmm. What... Um, Ir- irrespective of what I think your motives are or were. Well, my or, motive know, in the it, moment was yeah. writing a song that was artistic and l- maybe make you giggle. Provocative. Maybe, yeah, provocative. Yeah, yeah. And like, I'm trans, I'm, I'm given the energy of I'm willing to, and I was, it was when I was writing Cocaine Ferrari, I was okay. literally willing to do anything. Yeah. Like, and that's, I, I moved to California. You know, I, I, we left our five miles from here, just in Hilliard, just yep. west of here. I left a three bedroom house to Kendra and three dogs mm. and was like, you figure it out. I'm out. Not, I, I mean, we still paid bills, yep. still was on her team, but like it was filled with our shit. And it was like, well, I'm going to California and I've got to go now. Mm. And wh- whatever you want to do, if you want to come to California, fine. But this is what I have to do for my life. Okay. Can I talk about that for a second? Any, Cause yeah, I'm, I'm really anything. curious yeah. about that. Um, and love being here now, being able to look at that, especially now. Um, Me too. Wh- Amen. How did you feel? Like, what What made... Is that nervousness in a, in a certain dimension? Were you... There was some energy in you that you had to move? Yeah. <clears throat> so, Jamie's a year older than me, and uh, we went to Cali together at 07. And we moved from, from Full Sail uh, to Columbus. He was in Columbus a year before me. I, I finished the, the bachelor's program. He only got associates. Then we met up here in Columbus... And then we went to LA together. When he turned 30, I could see it in him that it fucked him up. Sorry, Jamie, if that's not true. If I'm putting words in your mouth, I really apologize. But you know what I mean. He, he was definitely like, I need to move. I got to go. Things need to happen. And that September, we were in LA. And like Joe was there. And the things occurred to let him work for Joe. And... It took several months for that to fulfill, and that was 2011. That was, yeah, September 2011. And watching, so like, it didn't just pop for him, right? Like, he didn't, like, he didn't get this job and then got rich. You know, like, 
Like he didn't, Joe just didn't give him a huge fucking check. And it was like, oh, this, all this problems are solved. Like, no, he's still sleeping on our homie's couch. Like, I ain't going to tell his whole story. I hope he comes on and tells it. I'm not going to tell your whole shit. I love you, King. He should. He should. <clears throat> and, um, but like, it didn't happen overnight for him. So like, he still struggled. He still had bills. And like, I was watching all that play out while I wasn't struggling. I was doing just fine. And I didn't need no money. I had no real sense of urgency at like 28. Like I was, I was writing music. I was doing everything I wanted to do. I was writing music. Uh, I had my real estate license. I was, life was good. Um, had a, you know, awesome girl that was making a bunch of money, had a three bedroom house, living in the suburbs, a nice suburb, great school district. All the things were good. Um, but then I was getting ready to turn 30 and it got to be like my birthday, September 21st. It got to be probably beginning of June. And like right now, really like this time, uh, and Kay started telling me she was like yo you just seem fucking miserable and I was and I like I wasn't living miserable but there were moments where I was definitely sitting watching TV thinking like what the fuck am I doing here like is this I'm sitting here watching TV in Columbus and Hilliard like this is what I want to do am I where I want to be right now at the moment right now and like I've always thought like you know now being places showing up I've always had that energy so I was like watching the TV, two recliners, couch over here, love seat over there, three dogs laying all over all of our furniture, whole house, you know, like a life. Like we're baked in here. Is this what I want? And the answer was no. I don't know if it was totally no. It was not right now. It was not at this moment right now. Nope. This may be in some time, but not right now. Kay said... You're miserable. Just out of nowhere. It was like June 7th or something. She was like, you're miserable. And I was like, yes. And she was like, Cam, if you got to do it, then just go to LA. Mm. She knew Jamie was settling in. She knew like it, it Rogan was becoming a, the biggest show. And like the writing was, she knew, I, she knew Jamie and I see the future. There was a wave. And she knew yeah. like, it's about to go. If you're not going to go now, like when are you going to go? Like, it's not there yet, but like you should be there now. So she was like, if you got to go, go. And I was like, are you serious? And she was like, go. I literally leaned forward, grabbed my laptop, pulled it to my lap and just booked a ticket for like three days from now to LA. I called Jamie. I was like, I'm coming to LA. And he was like, yes, fuck yeah. Come on, baby. Let's go. Yeah. So went and when I got there right away was definitely like, okay, this is where I should be. I'm present here. Uh, this is the change I, I needed. I needed to know that they were right down the street. I needed mm -hmm. to know that the cats that was doing everything on earth that I thought possible, the biggest shit, I needed to know they were right here. I needed to know, I, I needed mm -hmm. to see them. Mm -hmm. And like, I had even told like my cat George, um, shout out G, what up baby? Um, I told, I told other people, many people I told, like, I'm going to meet Kanye. Mm -hmm. And I told people like, if I could just meet Kanye, I know everything will be different. I know Kanye will understand me. I know he'll know like what I went through. The Bible I made was all black Bible. I was only me and one other white person. I didn't know that. Me and Bill Wave Ravencraft. Uh, shout out Bill Baby. What up? Um, all black. Literally every, so it's like, I'm serious. The only white people were me and Bill, uh, an engineer, Bill Ravencraft. Right. And uh, there was an Asian dude. I think his name was Jason. Uh, there was an editor. The other, the, there's only three editors. The other editor black too. Everybody's black. Everybody's all the actors were black. It was a black project. Um, get to L.A. and I was like, Jamie, Jamie made me promise, uh, no more hustling. Mm. I can't even believe I'm saying this on here, but I'm gonna say it. No more hustling. Jamie's like, no more hustling. And I was like, man, I had I already had burners. I went and bought new burners. That's why I made, made him say it. Sure. No, no more. He's like, at least not out of here in his apartment. You know, I'm, I'm paying the bills. Mm -hmm. And that was like, okay. He's like, I want you to start going out every night. He was like, $10 ticket, $15 ticket. You need to be going out. You need to be where everybody is every night. He's like, that's what I need you to do. And I was like, all right. So like every night I just started getting a ticket. I just started looking and see what events were going on. I'd be pulling up whatever like yeah. show apps and I'd just buy a ticket like... Two chains show before two chains super popping. 
uh, I name all the rappers I went to. I went to all those shows, bro. Jamie and I went to so many shows that were $10 shows of big rappers now. And uh, started going out and just like meeting everybody, meeting agents, meeting managers, meeting rappers, uh, seeing who I vibe with and shit. And then I was still having to fly home to pay bills. So I was flying home uh, and I was doing real estate. So I fly home and do a showing. I'd do maybe a couple showings for like three days and then I'd fly out back to LA and like had nothing. You know, I wasn't I wasn't going there for no reason. I didn't have no appointments or nothing. Like it was just going to sleep on an air mattress. Yeah. <laughs> and uh but there's work to do. Yeah. Yeah. And I was anxious. You know, I was, I was pretty anxious of like I knew I knew I was great. I knew I was a really good rapper. I know I'm I'm the best editor ever. Like nobody fucks with me in editing. Anybody, anybody listening. Nobody has a cleaner toilet. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm, yeah. I'm a really good editor. Not that I'm just a really good editor, but the Bible experience was 88 hours long. And like, mm. how many movies did you edit that that uh, you make 44 fucking two hour long movies? Dog, I made a lot. And 88 like, hours? 88 hours per project. Mm. Yeah. And uh, and it's just audio Bible. It's audio Bible s- scripted. So like, it's like all their, imagine where they are. Mm-hmm. It's like te- conversations going on, it? and Buster's just like, I'm like, where would they be? And he's like, I don't know, dog, imagine it. A cave outside, you you figure it out. <laughs> Wherever like, you think yeah. is best. Yeah. And it's like, oh, and like I, know, like, I know the editors would be like, I'm making sounds, I'm doing all kinds of, and I respect that. Like, I'm just saying, when it comes to like quick edits and like really making things happen as far as vocals go, we edited all of God in Old Testament, and then Buster came in. I'm telling you, the whole Bible was done. All the Old Testament was done, mm. and Buster came in just out of nowhere, opened the door, and was like, hey, God doesn't breathe. Bro, I didn't breathe for like 30 seconds. I'm dead serious. He walked in the door. I'll never forget it. I'm sitting right here like this, and the door's like right there. Daniel uh, is, is the, uh, the non... Jason was the Asian cat. Big black dude, Daniel. Maybe the best engineer. He worked at the, uh, the foxhole for Jamie Foxx. Okay. Shout out, Jamie Foxx. I hope you're doing well, my king. Amen. Yes. Um, he, we had a window. We shared a window, and I could we could keep our door open. And he taught me so much about Pro Tools, dog. You, I don't even know if you know this, dog, but you the man taught know. me so much about Pro Tools. I love that. Guy. And uh, he walked in and was like, "God doesn't breathe." And I just looked at Buster. I just remember looking back, and I was like, "What?" <laughs> He's like, "God doesn't breathe." And I remember turning and looking at Daniel, and Daniel looking at me. And we, I just looked back at Buster. I'm like, "What?" And he's like, "You guys can charge overtime if you want. You stay here as long as you want." We had to go through the whole Bible now and cut out all of God's breaths. To in, gone. Can't have no more of that. God just speaks. There's yeah. no breaths in between. It had to make it to, to change. Not only does it change, so it's like when you cut out the breaths, the session was done. So it's all the whole set. So like if there's a breath at 12 seconds, everything from the 13th second all the way to the end of the file, you gotta get it all and move it back. You got to change the whole timing of the so he's like a whole run through of everything and like imagine going through numbers motherfuckers don't even God, read numbers. Through numbers. <laughs> 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 and like like and like you got to go through and like of course like I'm not I don't think God talks it was the narrator in in uh, Matt in uh, in numbers but you know what I mean like it's a lot it's a lot but and God uh, doesn't breathe is such a <laughs> such a wise shout out to that man, mm-hmm. um, oh, man. so. Yes, I got nervous and uh, like it made me go. So like that was that was uh, October ish, two thousand fourteen. November was still selling houses, coming back and forth. Uh, by March, um, but, but you know, in January I was meeting everybody. I met everybody. I met Drake. Uh, like I was, who knows who knows what was going on in Drake's mind. But I felt sure. like I was really close to having a real conversation with Drake that would have changed my life uh like two weeks before meeting kanye early february at the palladium uh for an asap rocky show and um my boy ran the palladium and i got close to drake and then once that happened once i got close to drake in 20, 2015 i knew i was like i can get close to anybody i can i can talk to anybody on earth i just yeah. knew it they're all and people the, yep and but it was like long story short you know i met kanye february 8th and it took from that June to February of panic of like, I wouldn't call it desperate. It definitely wasn't desperation because I had so many other things going. I had money, you know, it was, uh, it was more, 
I have to make this happen. I have to make this happen. And like, I knew I was happy in my life. I knew I loved Kendra. I knew that I could love Kendra forever, but not if I didn't love me forever. And that was like, I started to feel this energy of like, I have mm -hmm. to go if I don't. And like, I, and I saw it happen with Jamie. So like, Jamie has this whole story. I can't wait for him to share it. Um, I think I've told you before, but he, he didn't have reverse in his blazer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, he has this thing always moving forward and he always had to park. So when we'd be in his whip or whatever, he had to park where like he knew nobody could park in front of him because if somebody parked in front of him, he'd lose his job, everything, you know, like he can't even move. <laughs> so it's, Would you say it's <laughs> safe to say that he accelerates away from danger <laughs> in that car? Yes, yeah. I would yeah. say all like, right, he, right. and I would, I've almost even seen that of like yeah. him hit the gas harder because if he didn't, he stuck. Yep. Or something like that's ser serious. It's serious. It's a different dimension of bro, it. Bro, right? and you're thinking think differently. differently. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. So like I saw him really go through it and and I helped him go through it. And once I saw that happen, and then he got it. He didn't even know. I would say he didn't even know he had it once he had it. like he didn't like it. I don't think it was clicking. Like he knew he had to go all in. But like just like when I met Kanye, like I didn't know what was going to come from it. And I think he probably went in with the same thing of like, who knows how long this lasts or like this, this guy could be willy nilly. He could be fucking super, Joe could be super flaky and just be like, yeah, fired. See ya. You never know what comes. Never right? know. Never. Yeah. So yeah, I'd say I was nervous. I was, um, not, I was anxious. I had, I had some energy of like, I have to do it now. And, and I think it was a, a time that like it was, it was 2012. Instagram had just come out. Uh, mm -hmm. um, what was the other one? Vine. Okay. Vine had yeah. just come out and I was using Vine Shout and it was, Vine. I loved Vine. We need to talk about Twitter still. Okay. We'll get and um, so things were changing so fast and I knew we were in the mix. Like we were with, we were in the mix of the people that, um, before, even before Kanye, I had met so many people and I had such a great team of people around me that were in the industry, like new people in the industry and knew what was going on that I just felt so close. I felt so close of like, I'm a good writer. You know, I, I, I'm a good performer. Like what's holding me back? And it was just real relationships, I would say. And, and want, the wanting, like going back to earlier, like relationships and wanting the wanting made the relationships not work because in every relationship I went to, I wanted to extract as opposed to like feeding them or giving them good energy. So I was always showing up with this energy of I'm, I'm here to get something. And I think even if you, even if you can fake it good, that energy still comes off or like I'm owed something or like I'm cool. I'm too cool for this. Or, Entitlement versus yeah. you deserve to be in the room kind of thing. Yeah. 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 And like, and like, even them knowing it mm. of like, oh, what are you even here for type yeah. energy? And it's like, I had done some things, but like, I wasn't there for like real, like proving myself to anyone. Like they didn't know my work ethic or what I could do. They just like, here's my music. I, I could, I could just be a rich kid paying for that music. You yeah. know, so my parents paid for it or whatever. Shout and, out to Rebecca Black. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and I think it like once I, once once you get in the room with people and you start seeing who they are and you see start seeing who you are um and then i'd say you know the failure really the the cocaine ferrari not popping when it first came out mm. that was uh that was really good for me all the build up you know all the build up it's like i made it i literally called everybody i was like i made it you know, like it was a, a yeah. me with that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I had reality TV show offers. Ooh. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then like, and then like two weeks later, it's like, oh, but my music's not popping. <laughs> Why isn't my music popping? And it's like, well, it was popping for a week. And like, it's everybody's saying how fire it was, but now it's gone. And it's like, oh, okay. So like, what do you got to do to get it? And I still wanted for a long time. And, that, and it made me want and it made me bitter. All of those things. Like getting ready to turn 30 really pushed me. Because nobody was, nobody was really doing it over 30. Jay-Z was over 30. But that was really the only cat that like really did it over 30 at that point. At, at least from my perspective. I know there's other cats, but not like superstar, mm -hmm. uh, super commercial people. So 
it was like, am I going to be Jay Z? Like that's, I uh, I know no no I know but like yeah. the odds of of being that level is like he's a in my mind he's the best rapper ever so. Mm-hmm. That's how you gotta be the best rapper ever to be famous. There's, there's one of those. <laughs> yeah. And like, I was like, I, I know I'm good. I know I'm in the conversation. Like, I don't think anybody could listen to my music and say I'm not in the conversation. If they do, they just probably don't understand what I'm saying. So, like, no offense if you don't understand what I'm saying. But, um, but yes, it was things have to happen energy and they have to happen now energy. And uh, so what's fun about the Jay Z example is that uh, in a in an environment of selective communication channels, like I can think of when Jay Z arose, what was the way in which you got music? It was MTV. It was analog, like broadband distribution yeah. of a cable channel, tape record, and then or strictly radio. And, yeah, radio uh, and a TV, MTV. Yeah. So it wasn't internet. All right. Mm-hmm. So just the ability for you 96. to sure. Yeah. The, I remember when Michael Jordan, the Bulls, like all the way back. Yes. Yeah. Um, you get to a point where you say, Yeah, absolutely, height of the game, this person, let's look at the hierarchy of skill and let's say there's obviously levels to talent of music production. Mm-hmm. We hold this up and we say, Amazing, the best, etc. In an, in a digital environment, aren't there just like an order of magnitude more of that echelon of skill, yes. just unable to access, and therefore, if given the tools, widely speaking, this this is the the equity play of it, right? Mm-hmm. Is hey, there's seven billion people. It, it's not Jay Z's not special. It's man, let's elevate a, a million Jay Z's. You know, what I, mean? I love this. I love this conversation. I love that you take this here, and I would. How great are so like? Um, I'll share a thread with you later that's uh and i'll post it to my twitter okay that's uh all sculptures how many great sculptors would there have been from the year 1500 to now if they all had access to the tools available that the churches had to pay for a big block of clay yeah right how many people would be incredible like literally like one of the images i forget who did it it was they literally made a net dog it's a it, like a net covering a person, and it's like got all oh out of stone, out of out of clay, uh, ceramic, mar- like yeah. this, whatever. No, it's like they sculpted marble or whatever. You know what? I don't know. That's what it tough is. stuff, right? No, yeah. I don't know. I don't know exactly sure. what Call it, it is, marble. but all whatever. Right. Some some hard statue, it's rock <laughs> statuesque yeah. material. It depends, I'm not yeah. the guy. Yeah, uh, I'm not an art historian to call what this is, but like what you're saying, not you're saying not Jay Z's not not the guy. It's not, but yeah. like how many more guys are there there's so like imagine there's so much talent on the planet imagine if you had five nbas and the ability to cultivate an environment of nba players are there, amongst Th- think about this all right globally are, 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 globally i know but like you we're not missing any good basketball players like all right, fair <laughs> but are we because we're not able to train everybody in enough of a oh. fashion everywhere oh, yeah yeah right? okay so i mean yeah i would go i go there i fuck so. with that <laughs> I fuck with that. In this actually. example, Kobe, let's be, imagine Kobe be so mad if I didn't. Our economic that. development plan for the world is more basketball training, right? And so we, uh-huh. we uplift everybody through that. That's a good idea. If you do say. that, is is there five NBAs worth of talent on the planet? And shouldn't we uh-huh. um, appreciate that instead of trying to say, no, there should only be one NBA and like Michael Jordan's the best forever? Uh, like know? if we had NBA gyms, like we have bo- like cheap boxing gyms. Kind of get- what we do for soccer. Yeah, boxing gyms. Another great, I don't mm-hmm. go to boxing gyms. I don't get that example. Yeah, me much, neither but, but like they're it's usually people that can't like tyson mm. uh could he said t- a quote of tyson is if he had to pay one dollar to go to a boxing gym he would have never been a boxer because he had zero dollars thank you such a good analogy of this right <laughs> yeah 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 there are thresholds <laughs> yeah. so a dollar a dollar we almost missed a mike tyson because of a dollar how many like are there five more dollars what a line what a line yeah. that's a good line so Amazing. That's there. That tells me certainly there are at least five other guys that are probably like that. They just didn't have that dollar or whatever. You know what I mean? Like they were a dollar negative in some way. Man, um, five other guys. Is that's like crazy to think about five other isn't, Tyson's. Isn't you know? that abundance? Like to me, that's like it could be so much better than you could imagine. Just in that. Well, I don't know. This, okay, so this, the other side of this would be Mike Tyson is Mike Tyson because he is so extraordinarily rare, right? So like maybe it is valuable to have that degree of rarity somehow, right? Like he's special because how many people are going to do what he can do? You know, so there's like two sides of it, right? Which Mm -hmm. is 
um, does having a hundred of those diminish the spirit of it? Or is it just like, okay, our minds are elevated such that now that we recognize this is the thing about the human spirit in nature is that now that we recognize this level of talent is possible, it actually becomes a lot easier to yes. make that possible and aggregate down the line. This is like the four minute mile thing in action, right? Yep. Once it's done once, then yeah, okay, it's easy. So what's the next thing that we want to be really good at, right? It's like, that's the process of evolution mm-hmm. is it was good that there was just one Mike Tyson, but that flipped the bit. Now, you know, we're on to the next, it's like we're... I wonder what the best example of that is. Of The four minute mile is probably it. Of just where there was a major breakthrough that just changed everything. And it changed everything in a way of like everybody could then do the thing because they watched it be done one time. Is that kind of analogous to Ron DeSantis announcing on Twitter? Yeah. You know? Yeah. That, and that's like, that's kind of the. It's it not feels, a Jesus moment, right? But right. it's like, all right, something happened in the information stream here. Yes. Yeah. And that's what I like. There's kind of something to like, this is where I was telling you about Jamie earlier of like, he said what he wanted to do and then, then he did the thing. It feels, I just feel like reality has like this really thin layer to it. And like, I literally tweeted, the tweet's gone now, but I, and like, it's in article, like you can find that on like complex and other things. But like, I tweeted, like, I'm not kidding you. 72 hours before I met Kanye, let me run into Kanye. Hmm. That's it. Just let me run it. Let me. Let me run into Kanye. And literally like two and a half days later, it happened. Isn't that fun? Now, and this is serious. Why don't the bigger things occur? Like why doesn't when you think like, let me live in a city that is a breakthrough city where nobody's dying of weird illnesses anymore, cancer or whatever it is. Like, why isn't that idea get realized super quickly? Like, why isn't everybody like hyper focused on that to bring some ideas like that to reality as opposed to anything else? Like, wh- like, why aren't we, why aren't we as a collective humanity? And is it because we've been tricked? Like, is it because we're shown a world where people die at 60 to 80. So like the more you think about death, the closer you are to death. Mm -hmm. And like, then you're just going to die because that's what you're doing. Like you're literally. That's what happens. Yeah. Yes. That's the timeline. Yeah. Yes. Um, Hmm. It just feels like it's very thin. Like we could do whatever we want here, but like what's holding us back? And like what's holding us back from like absolute greatness as a species? It's the faith part of it, for sure. If a nut, like flip the bit, this is the the metaphor. We, I yes. joke about this with Evan sometimes. I just think it's fun to like conceptualize behavior as no matter what, flipping the bit. Flip the bit directionally towards the abundance mindset of, you know, Hey, if you don't think about death, maybe you live longer, right? Like yeah. reverse the orientation, at least in that way. What does it look like to have enough people flip the bit about that at the same time? Yes. That's actually a tricky problem. It isn't just about the one thing. It's about like everybody getting the one thing simultaneously enough to resonate it outward in a way that creates emergence, let's say. Um, so you get it. Great. I get it. Great. Do we talk to each other? Do we know each other? Are we able to communicate that to each other? Um, it usually was no. And therefore, like to carry that forward in isolation requires a really tremendous faith. To like believe something when nobody else you think is apparently believing that too, mm-hmm. really difficult. If you're in a tribe of people and Bitcoin. you are, <laughs> Shout out to. <too>, no. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, analogous to, I think in some respect, it's about like what's first principle to you, mm-hmm. what is... Um, What's the purpose that drives the behavior? And the only kind of purpose that would drive the kind of behavior that would sustain through, uh, let's just say, the, you're right. the trial and tribulation it? Yes, of it, you're right? Correct. Um, in order to get through it, it required, and therefore. Um, it's like, again, thinking that like there's no separation and like the person behind me at the grocery store in front of me at the grocery store that's short on money, like no hesitation, I got you, don't even stress about it. Mm-hmm they would also have to be checking out with honesty 
of actually thought they had the money as opposed to believing in the person behind them, which, which takes it, it's very difficult to get a society. If you're grifted, you're less trusting, right? So it's, um, uh, the fediment thing that with the fetty, right? Mm-hmm. We were talking about what I love about this concept and technically need to sharpen my sword, but I, I think directionally what I love that they're doing is saying at a certain level of organization, it makes sense to go as wide as possible. And in doing so, actually the best security is simply reputational from a small group perspective. Uh, a million federated mints of 11 people versus three institutional sort of, let's say, um, you know, centralizing forces within that network. And your reputation is essentially that thing that maintains the trust of the whole circle. So the individual is inherently part of the whole at that small group, nine Mm -hmm. people. You would only uh, assume to interact with trusted parties at the federated mint level, and therefore, if at any point uh, there's an untrustworthy action by one individual within a small tribe, the whole tribe's kind of segregated, right? Mm-hmm. So you start to think like cellular autonomy, so like these little things start to interact at scale. Um, it creates an incentive whereby, yeah, you, we're just all sort of like holding each other to account the unit of account just becomes a different thing at this point. Mm -hmm. This is where I love, like love as a dimension, right? Where we're, Mm -hmm. uh, the energy that we give and take is a a physical force in its own right. And there's a unit of account that allows us to measure it just like we would um, photons or, you know, like more simple uh, measures of physics, right? Like we would basically be saying the energy that we store now through the dollar currency is the energy that is recorded in the vibe of it in an intrasocial setting and then the relation of it through the business setting of just this digital network that we created. So it's like you hard code (laughs) your reputation necessarily into the process of just streamlining the transference of the bits, right? The bits can be, the bits can be backed by anything. It can be backed by wood. It can be backed by gold. Any, literally anything. anything. That's it's, why I don't understand the gold. Yeah. I don't understand the whole thing of connection to gold. Like it seems yeah. asinine. It seems insane to me. It seems absolutely insane that like most people agree that like gold and silver are valuable, but mm. like other things aren't. And I'm like, do you have them? Like you have the bricks? Like if you have the bricks, cool. Like I understand wood's harder to store than gold and silver, but like yeah. if you're holding, if you're holding, air quotes, holding it, you're not truly in your fucking you hands. Claim possession to a contract that represents yes. the physical. Yeah, yeah. You have lost your mind. Uh-huh. You are trusting in society in such a way that like you you honestly don't even trust society. That's you're, right. You're fucking gaslighting yourself. At the end of the day, you are like, you don't trust society to keep sustaining and keep the idea of money alive, yet you mm-hmm. keep the idea of a contract alive, which is like society in itself. I wish Fife were here to fucking give us the contract. I'm spit. thankful there are people smart enough like <laughs> yeah, Fife to help me. Too. You know what I'm like? Me too. I'm like, in danger. <laughs> <laughs> but it definitely seems like uh gold and silver are like the worst investments ever and especially if you if you are like technologist or you believe in like uh a future you're a futurist at all and you really believe that like things are accelerating at a at a decent pace to think that things like gold and silver are hard to come by is very short-sighted in my opinion i would agree at this point especially not in hand yeah 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 um, it is, well, it's not even like, it's actually transparently fake in a lot of respects, right? Like that's the meme of the tungsten bars or whatever. Yeah, going I think around so. With gold. And, yes. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's all, all this is fake. It's all, so it's all, who do you trust to verify and what's the cost of that verification? And then it becomes this, like uh, with the soil, right? How easy is it to transfer somewhere else at any given time for like proof of measure? Uh, so it all just became uh, contractual, relational, as far as I see. It was... You know, we really, we kind of did this thing in the 70s where we stopped even, like, trying to pretend that the two had anything to do with each other, like mm-hmm. the gold and the currency, right? So we 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 continued to evolve, and then we, you know, like a, a rocket with a, a 
booster ejecting as it enters the second stage or whatever it is. You're just kind of seeing this exit trajectory of digital cash. That's all it was. It was, you know, just like the, the you remember the Monopoly game of McDonald's where you would pull yeah, out the tabs it. and then you amazing. would create this. Somebody was talking about this at the Bitcoin Pizza Incredible. Day in Cincinnati. It's it just like, this is the game that got people to buy more McDonald's. I right? bought a lot just, of Mc, we, Me and my mom, my jacked. brother, we loved it. It was incredible. Uh, you wanted to get the boardwalk sticker. Yeah. You're like, you never know. I could yeah. get that jet ski. I was right there. I was right <laughs> that jet ski. It was like a million dollars. Don't sell There are sure. levels to it, right? <laughs> there was, <laughs> it there wasn't was a, a jet hierarchy. ski. I know <laughs> boardwalk least, was not a jet ski. <laughs> Maybe boardwalk wasn't. But. <laughs> you weren't going to McDonald's for a jet ski. You well, were going for it, the mail ticket. It did escalate too, right? This is the thing: is like year uh -huh. over year, you do it enough, or you had to like give out a bigger prize at the end of the day. Um, oh, it, did you see this? I don't want to change this too hard here, but did no, you no. see the uh, lo the recent Pokemon scandal? No. Oh, so speaking of the, the, the McDonald's, led me to this. Yeah. All the all the top Pokemon cards pulled off the fucking. Oh, I did see belt. that. Yeah, yeah. Of course, we know where it's going to be, and thanks, that's mine now. See ya. Yeah, right. And so it made the odds super high, and that's why the people went crazy on the internet for a period of time, is because they weren't getting any. Hmm. So since they weren't getting any, when there was one that was found, it was fucking incredible, and got all the views, and like, oh, you got the rare Pokemon card. But then it just came out that like for the last twenty years or so. None of it's real. Are we surprised? No, that's yeah. But this is that's the whole thing. Is like, I feel like none of this is surprising, and it's like it's almost like the side. It's not. It's so not surprising that like I would say to anyone listening, anyone that hears this spell for all time, bitch, <laughs> decide what's next. Yeah. It's so not surprising you can just decide what's next. Yeah. Just decide and hold that in your head duh. and that's done. Duh. Duh. Yeah, it, that's duh. duh. Yeah, duh, duh. is right. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's done. Is right it, like it is over and duh is absolute duh. You just what just decide to happen, really feel it. Like if you're hitting home runs, this is this is how like where my 10-year-old brain goes. Just see yourself hitting home runs over and over again. Just see it in your head and feel the home run energy. See it, feel it, feel it. it. Just yeah. feel it in your body. Yeah. What's it feel like to hit a home run? Just feel it right now. And if you're like, I don't know, I've never hit one, then you ain't never going to hit one. <laughs> I got bad news. You need to feel it. Feel what you feel it feels like. And like you'll feel like you'll know when you feel the home run. It's incredible. I can feel it right now. I can just do it right now. I'm doing it right now. I just home. I'm home running. I can feel it right now. It's home run. I don't like. I'm telling you, if you can just do that, it's over. This shit is. There's some. There's something going on here, Andrew. I don't know. I don't know how to convey it in words quite yet, mm. but I do know. Somebody, I saw a tweet this morning. I'd love to talk more with you about Twitter. I Go know, for it. I, well, we we are kind of talking about Twitter this whole we, time, but we always. You can't have a conversation since 2010 pretty much without Twitter and definitely mm -hmm. since 2016. Like, if you're talking politics, how do you not talk Twitter since 2016? Yeah. Period. I mean, you can't. Did you see what Jack tweeted, by the way, if you want to get into Twitter? No, but, I, I mm -hmm. muted Jack. What's Jack doing? Uh, going after three letters. He was, like, following the JFK, like, you know, dismantle the CIA, FBI, you know, splintered into a thousand. He tweeted that? Jack did, and then I saw uh, one of the congressmen or former congressmen re respond to it, right? So it's like, yeah, that was uh, that was just within the last day, I think. Get rid of them. You just, like, splinter them, you know, the whole line, you know, whatever it is. What does that yeah. even mean, splinter I don't know, whatever them. the language was. But it was, I think, JFK that was talking about it, right? Or at least that was the line. Mm -hmm. So he was just parroting that and I think adding a few and then, you know posting it on Twitter, right? Because you can do that. You can, I guess. You can air quotes. No way to see me. Biggest, <laughs> biggest air quotes I've ever made. You can like, just you tweet can it, you know? Yeah. I love that you the term JFK, RFK, and whatever is used in the term with you can do it. Like, <laughs> I guess, fam. But Well, he is <laughs> doing it, right? J uh, RFK Jr. in the He's same doing way. He's it. tweeting Amen. things that He's are, doing it. you know what I mean? Like, you can't always come out in front and say some of these things. Are we things. past that? Are we past the you're getting? We'll see. Do you uh, think we are? 
this so this is a this gets very deep for me because it gets it goes back to like um you see the memes going around right now of like uh they faked the moon they did the moon landing with cgi here cgi in 1969 sure. is the most <laughs> hilarious picture you've ever seen <laughs> and, like, and like sure fam like maybe they're not maybe it's not all uh faked you know like they're maybe they sent a probe or something like that but like and i don't know you know i'm just i'm just guessing i'm just uh yeah. playing theorist here um but isn't do we know will we ever know could uh, we know it's kind of like secondary to can you ask you know that's but can you ever ask and yeah. like and like are like and then you go further of like do any of the people that truly know even are they even here anymore? Right. And like how like I don't if you were really on some forever, some super really super duper 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 forever, uh none of this you're gonna you're gonna forgive me energy. Mm. How much do you do if you're on some real you're gonna forgive me energy if you're doing it with good intention? Hmm. So if you have really good intention but you have to off somebody to have the best intention. Is that good intention? Right. And like that's I would like this these are the thoughts that really get complex to me is, you know, where where do you this is so I wrote the book that and the this is fun. I'm so glad to say this. Thanks for the two drinks. Thank you for saying it in front of me. Yeah. You're welcome. Um so I wrote the book Time is the Only Luxury because of of this energy. Of like we don't we don't know how long we get and like what mm. are you doing where how are you spending your time and you know some people could probably look at me right now and be like you got a pregnant wife upstairs kicking it by herself while you know you're hanging out and I could say a thousand a, a mil infinite uh, things of like why I'm here with you I think it'd be better to ask Kendra why I'm here with you. And I think she'd have a better answer. And <clears throat> I think she knows me well enough to answer f for me of like, why am I here? Like she might literally just say Kane. <laughs> like, I don't know what her answer would be, but I believe that she knows why I'm here better than even I do. And I would say I'm here because, uh, I think the reason I started this was be because I feel like all of my conversations are so privileged that it's kind of fucked up for me to hold it to me. Like, it's not about me talking at all. Yeah. I feel, I'm dead serious. Everybody, everybody in my life knows this and I say it all the time. I have actually found the place where I'm like the dumbest cat in the room all the time and it is fire. And let me tell you, <laughs> Fam, it is, the best it is not the room most of you motherfuckers are in. I don't care what you think, but the room I'm in is with 130 plus IQs that I feel I feel like an idiot in all the time. And that's I've been searching for this for a long time. And I appreciate like your presence. I told you earlier like how brilliant I think you are. You know, uh you came into my our lives when Jamie and I were talking about Battelle every day. Mm. And then you came into our lives as a geologist from Battelle. And that, to me, it was very serendipitous. It was very strange, it, especially around Bitcoin. Like, I just kept finding such intelligent people in my circle. Like, most people weren't having the conversations I were having, and then they're in my circle. And it's like, how, how did this even occur? Sure. You know, like, yeah. what even is happening here? I forget what what you asked me, and I went on this super tangent. Now the the how is the unknowable part of it, right? Yes, this is what is. I notice when yes. I'm in Miami at a Bitcoin conference, right? I'm seeing like all of the smartest people just talking about ideas, right? Like it's the best. I could not put it any more simply than that. I mean, it's obviously mm -hmm. diverse in its dimensions of the ways in which that is expressed, but we're in space together, and we're talking about the the like the hardest work the interesting questions and um you know having a little fun too right like i noticed that's what i forget sometimes is the work is so interesting and i think it's so important mm -hmm. that i'll forget about the fun part 
you always have to be like an enjoyable part of the context of the work. And I definitely feel like I struggle with that in ways that I watch other people who are just natural party throwers. Mm -hmm. Like I, I don't know that I've thrown the most parties in life, but mm -hmm. I watch the people like you who are, and I notice, you know, even if it's just a small setting where you're trying to just bring a few good people together, do the simple things here and there, and it's a good party, right? Mm -hmm. This is the the life and the work of it is that, okay, you say lowest IQ, and I think great, like the... Don't be stupid, first of all. Like, yeah. obviously not. And also, like, there's so many dimensions. So. EQ, like, so. probably an XQ. I'm like, definitely the lowest at EQ. You are, uh, <laughs> you're, uh, sure. you're social no in a doubt. way that I'm not and that I learned from and that I appreciate because um, you decided to be the guy out in front of the door saying good morning before I figured mm. out that that was the game, right? Before, so, wow. Thank it took you, me a long thank time. you for shining that oh, light at that time. Yeah. Amen. I, you know, it feels good to be the guy that's saying good morning. Colby jokes around with me sometimes. Like I've probably been, it's probably been some months, six months, a year since he said something like this. He's like, I feel like you'd be like the best radio morning host ever. But that energy is so good morning coming to you yeah, live. Yeah, from yeah, yeah. And I could just never do that. Like, yeah. like I'd rather it be this type of conversation and be motivational of. Yes, so the, Ken and I have been having some super deep talks with Kane on the way. Okay. Um, and we've been driving a lot more, going to see more family, mm. doing things together. Um, just because I want to include my family and her family in the pregnancy. I want them to all to see her. I want them to feel like uh, they, you know, everybody's getting pictures. Everybody's getting updates. I, f I feel like that's important. I feel like if, they, <clears throat> if they're involved in that process, they're going to be involved in Kane's life. If if they're left out of that process, they they miss the seed, mm. and I think there's something to that. So Kay and I talking about like how how important it is to be present, and how important it is to to be honest in the presence of. If you're sitting here together and you're not truly there, whether you're trying to act in a way that you're not there or you're really truly not there mentally, I think it was Adam that shared a tweet with us yesterday that said like parenting matters, but only when it's dads. I didn't see that. In our King's chat. That's but like, funny. But okay. like mom's like imprint on the kid. They're going to be who the mom is anyway. Mm. Like the mom carried them. For, so it is what it is. It is what it is. Yeah. But the dad, like the dad, not being present or being mm -hmm. a bad father, yep. like that's the one side, and then the other side is like dad being present, <clears throat> being there, and it feels like we are we're kind of playing some some game with ourselves of like presence and like intention, all people, all the time of not just what the goal is in the moment, but like, all right, it's almost like our idea of everything is always playing out continuously and we can't fake that. Like you can't, you can't not do that period. So you're either with the person you're with in the room and they can feel it, whether they're lost on the subject or not, they feel it, they're with you, they're tuned in. If they're not, then like there's a disconnection and it, it feels like that's very obvious across the board. Do you feel like FaceTime can mimic that? Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Okay. I do. Tell me more about that then. I mean, I just, you're either there or you're not. Mm-hmm. On FaceTime is like attention is attention. It can be transmediated. Yeah, I mean, like I. Sh yes, hmm. it, I feel not. Even, I I don't even think it has to be fa FaceTime. Doesn't it, I think phone is fine. Video games is fine. Sure. I think Twitter interactions is fine. Like I think like you guys were such a president. The Kings were such a presence in my life. It changed everything about me. Like I literally in this dead serious. Um, any. Anybody listening, I'm fucking, I wish I was kidding. Like, no, no, I don't. Thank God I'm not kidding. <laughs> but like, this is so serious of, I went from like my net worth being like 
the money I had in my bank account plus my car plus my items I owned, like nothing at all. You know, like I literally had several hundred dollars ready to pay whatever bill was next, waiting on the day that like bills were paid and then I could start stacking rent money. And this is, I'm talking 2019, like this isn't long ago. To 2018, I met you all. 2019, I think five through the chat together, maybe 2020. Sure. And once that happened, my net worth went from like whatever I made that day plus the shit that I owned to like 50x that. And then a year after that, it went quite a bit higher. And here we are four years later. And it really matters who you're spending time with and who you're sharing ideas with. <laughs> I wish I could like Cheers say less. That, yeah. I wish I could say less. Say, say less. Say less. No, keep, yeah, Kobe would say, say, say less. It, yeah. No, it is good. Um, that's the the uh, resonance, right? This is all right. So small groups, though. There's something about just what happens when you go wide from a network effect. Mm -hmm. um, but like, it could be, let's say. 30 you know like you're you're bringing up people that you reference on twitter is like a this is kind of like the topology that gets mapped when you see a bunch of like user icons networked to each other when yeah. somebody shows that it's like circle of uh connectivity i think the uh that brand that we were talking about was uh mapping that pretty interestingly with elon right it always does make me laugh when like the elon goth interaction occurs because i don't i, I don't know i unfollowed goth i unfollowed yeah. goth today i followed right. i followed him on uh Chris's recommendation, a quick recommendation of like I should follow Goth. Right. And he was like, he was like, ah, oh, he's a good guy or something. Or I forget what he said. Oh, I, it was a logic joke. I made a logic joke to Chris. And he was like, he's like, come on, love what logic. What is it? About, yeah. And I was like, all right, I'll follow Goth. And I did. And I followed him for about two days and maybe a week. I just unfollowed. Couldn't do it anymore. Keep going. Yeah, the, uh, the topology of it, right? So this is relationships in space. We're um, mapping it through the medium of, you know, I, th I think you could consider Twitter a digital ledger if you just want to abstract it enough. Um, whether it's immutable is a secondary question. I think you can do yeah, this or that to it. a secondary question. Yeah. You're right. I mean, let's say, okay, it doesn't exist on the Twitter medium anymore, certainly with like the mirroring effect of all the information, like everybody's just scooping up all data all the time. So how many copies are out there? Well, an infinite, that's kind of a weird question. How many, I wonder, yeah. that's a great question. How many copies of Twitter are there? And like, I wonder if anybody would ever come forward and say like, we've copied all of Twitter data since X year. Yeah. And you think that's happening? So like, I know that's it is happening. So no, how, how, no, it is. How many copies is a fun question. What technically designates a copy? Where does it sit? Can we just say everything's in the cloud and then forget about that question for a while? Because that's how I think. Most so you people think, think all that. my deleted tweets still exist somewhere? Why not? Yeah, like at the time, I'm sure they were I pulled agree. by someone yeah. for something. You know what I mean? And no, just I mean a even I deleted. You it know? doesn't matter. Yeah, okay, it's yeah, like yeah. it's still. <laughs> oh, you think? So you think everything. I started tweeting 2008? You think 2013? Yeah. The CIA was like copy all Twitter, tw everything. Doesn't boom, have, to have to even have be it. that type of thing. It could just be like some really sophisticated computer programmer that was curious in Munich, right? Like at the end of the day, it's just how easy is it to do, and how much do you think you could do it for? And you know, a lot of this is just hey, data is valuable. Let's collect it and sell it to the open market. There are various ways you can do that. Um, then it just becomes a scaling problem, which is how quickly can you do this before it gets deleted? How much volume of information can you store before it gets expensive? And then you can see how that centralizes, right? This is why AWS conquers, what, 30% of the data center, like cloud storage market. Amazon Web Services is just a derivative product of that information stream. It's just, you know, this happens many different times over and it happens in many different dimensions, but the the broader question is how well okay so how easy is it to recall can it be used against you in any way like is there value in saying well you almost tweeted this thing one time almost. right i typed yeah. it in but didn't tweet put it. me in court you mean i all you mean i typed it and then deleted it and decided it's i don't want to put that out yes <laughs> <laughs> it's my friend prove those were my keystrokes yeah um but that's like you know, at the end of the day, this is the same thing with AI as far as I see it, which we have this enormous, complex 
idea that we don't quite understand even how to describe. And then we ask ourselves the question, well, with enough data, could it destroy the world? And I'm like, I don't know. Has it? Uh, Tell me about AI. Yeah, I Keep don't know anything AI. about Tell it. Tell me something. Tell me something about AI. What do you think? I'm always leery when people say this is the absolute thing to worry about. I do think that you can set logic in motion that can be dangerous. This is there. These are such obvious problems. The question becomes scale very quickly. Is it? Do we have enough neurons in the simula brain that we decide that it can actually like meaningfully interrupt flight systems in in you know northern Africa? Like there are just. I have so many questions. If we, if it's not true already that it has come to fruition, like where are we at, and why is this not actually destroying things like we think it would? Because certainly we're further ahead than we're telling people we are right now. You, <laughs> you would much, have to imagine, right? How much further? Well, ahead? okay, like decades. What are we really talking? You know, twenty years. Do you think somebody like Elon Musk knows this, and they're playing out a role? You would assume, yeah. Aren't they That's, all roles? I think they are all roles, but I sure. mean, this is a very deep conversation, especially for someone like me. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of things to say on this topic. And um, I don't know. I don't know that it's n that this isn't all planned for the last X amount of time. And it seems really difficult to me to think that it is of like, you can't like this is the hard part of duality is like you can't believe one narrative and like almost not the other if you accept duality. Mm -hmm. So like you can't just like rule one out of like this is the way and not the other way. So is the way like the Wright brothers figured out flight and mm. the best place for flight is in Dayton and that's where they flew all the spaceships to? Like why would you fly the spaceships to the place where the spaceships weren't? Well, it's just where we named the building that. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so, like, well, we got to put it in their hometown. <laughs> so, like, why? Like, I just don't understand. There seems to be weird uh, sequential events that, of course, happen. But, like, if they invented flight. And then the Air Force Base is the biggest and baddest Air Force Base that there is. And then they Roswell happens and they fly the spaceships there. Mm. Like at the end of the day, how do you not think like, oh, well, they've not like reverse engineered this stuff of like we have if there if there are elements we don't know, of, you and I don't know about on the table. Well, bitch, they've been named. Yeah. The the ones that they have have been It's the first thing you do, right? You give it a name. Give it a name. Do. What do we call the, this? Yeah. So it's like, yeah, you find one that doesn't fit the system, you name it, and now you have a second scale. Yeah. And like it just is what it is. You have a second table and like these people don't know about this table, but this table exists and these things exist and like whatever needs to happen happens. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, it's maybe these things aren't common around here to where if I scoop up some air, I have some or whatever, or I find a rock or a thing that's not everywhere. But it just feels like, it feels like we're being lied to. It feels like we're playing some game that is, uh, it feels like when the book The Secret came out, like that whole The Secret thing came out, like it felt like that, like I hate to say this, but it feels like that was really the surgeon's of the energy that is, hey, you're in control here. Do you think that's because of the book, The Secret? No, it's about the same time as the iPhone, right? I was just thinking, when was that? Is was, it? Okay, let's say 2007-ish, right? Okay. Maybe a few years before. What year did The Secret? 2006. Okay, directionally correct. Yes. So... Imagine 2006, we actually didn't have, I think it came out in 2007, maybe it was six, but point Think being, about 2006. It was six the world later. before. Instagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the great b before. Yeah, it was when we didn't have iPhones. So the secret Or was, MySpace. Ooh. Did you have a top eight? I, did, I don't think I did. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. For I mean, sure. I mean, I was in college in 2004, sure. so I definitely had a top eight. Mm. Graduated 2003, went to Wright State in 2004, had the top eight. Yeah, you didn't have a top eight. You're too young for a top eight. I don't know if I just did it meaningfully enough to have one, but I think I interacted. Did you have a MySpace? Facebook was kind of the first major entrant to so. I what think year so. were you born? 
um, 89. 89. Yeah. Okay. Close enough. Right? Yeah, you probably missed it by like, because the only reason for me to even use Facebook was because I was connecting really with college it was a shift. Yeah. yeah, it was like a yeah, shift yeah. of like, I wasn't connecting with high school. Like there were a few high school friends on there, but not many. So yeah. it wasn't like a reverse of like, oh, I'm turning on, I'm tapping into the last X amount of years. It was like, I literally just left them six months ago or, you know, a year ago, whatever it was. And here's Facebook. But yeah, I used, I used MySpace heavily. I loved it. I thought it was great. I actually had MySpace not gone away. I probably would have uh, recognized success a little bit earlier. You think you were a MySpace rapper at I that had, time? Yeah, I had like multiple record deal offers. Uh, I had people hit me up for like big art, a couple of big articles, just two in magazines uh, that were pretty big magazines at the time. At least I can say not big, but like notable. Of like, I was proud. I would have been proud to be in them. And I had, uh, I hate to even say this out loud, but. On second podcast, I'm saying how many MySpace friends I have. You can edit this out. Oh, you're right. You're right. I probably won't edit this right now. I had 17,000 MySpace friends. That's a lot. It was a lot. Mm -hmm. And like Tila Tequila and Dane Cook had just got famous off of it. And like I was starting to pick up steam and I knew what the game was. The game was just like building a community. Oh. It was literally like people were looking for connection. Mm -hmm. And if you were doing something, remotely special or posting anything good content wise people wanted to connect with you like hmm. people were floored by decent content yeah he's the best content what was me. the best content you watched in 2005 six seven it was like probably the the highlight of those years to even kimbo say slice yeah. don't yeah. on internet content? on the internet yeah sure kimbo or like anything on e-bomb some crazy dumb shit mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the dumbest shit it was nowhere, like, there's no YouTube sensation, right? Like, that's very early tech for that, even. Yeah. Like, there was no TikTok. Yeah, yeah, yeah. YouTube. It was, you. if you could send a video through your phone, you were living large. Yeah. yeah, you were really you out that. here. You got that. Especially if you could see yeah. it on the other end. Ooh. Like, if it wasn't, like, pixelated and fucked Man. up. Uh, we've come a long way very quickly there. I don't think people are really thinking about that. That's, you know, that's the whole time is the only luxury thing is it feels like, People aren't grasping how quickly things are moving. And it feels I'm I'll tell you I'm there right now with AI. I'd love to hear your thoughts on AI. I shared them I shared my thoughts with a few people, but I'd love to know what your thoughts are. Like right now on AI, like where you think we are, what you think is next, and like are you worried? I would say I'm not worried. Um where are we headed is kind of up to us. I think there's this real danger right now of saying, because it's unknown, don't study it. This is the hard problem in any like really deep science is, well, if we study it, we make it possible in the way that we're afraid of or worried about, et cetera, et cetera. So even if you're coming at it through good faith, which is we just want to build the most sophisticated thing and make it most useful for us in the, in the positive, how how much are we creating a weapon in the process? This is any like kinetic warfare, yeah, you know, rocket ships, yeah. right? Any of the things, Viruses. right? Fire itself, yeah. like hey, that sustained us, and also you can use it Amen. to burn people at the stake. So, it's the the fundamental question is to what degree do you participate in that? And the the through line is always, well, if you don't look at this other places will and then you're behind or then you're susceptible then you're not keeping up with the pace of the evolution globally because we're kind of a multipolar in that way um, so it almost necessitates that you must lean into it right out of a, out of a perspective of national defense right you gotta we gotta it's always that therefore defense. yeah so you know i think it's like anything where it's yeah sure we can create a malicious bot attack and do dangerous things. And also maybe we can diagnose cancer much more efficiently. Like it's always both. It then becomes a question of what's our intention with it. How do we safeguard against any potential effect? Um, to what degree do we um, try to stifle people from doing it themselves? This is mm -hmm. the like cyber attacks are generally to prevent other places from doing certain actions. And that could be physical infrastructure, but that could be just, 
the bits in the software. Mm -hmm. Like we mining Bitcoin. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> so easily. <laughs> you want to talk about like uh just the vectors through which things can be um affected, persuaded. You know, I, I really try not to speak in the language of like threats or danger or violence or anything like that. Cause you know, at the end of the day you can speak analogously and get yourself in trouble. And I was at a, a crypto energy conference in Pittsburgh recently, and there were a couple of guys from the, uh, I think they were from the army to some degree. And they were speaking about, they're supposed to be, you know, the headline was crypto in national security. They didn't talk about crypto at all. They just talked about like national security and the through line sure. of the intelligence report. They had very strict, you know, uh, talking points there and there was nothing to do with crypto. How um, would you even talk about cryptography as a government? You know, like that's if you're your in whole, the army and you study cryptography, of, yeah, you actually like can't at all. Yeah, yeah that's what yeah, I'm saying. For like, so it's many literally reasons. the only yeah. thing that matters. Yeah, not only can you not talk about it because it's important, but you can't talk about it because it's so hyper technical that you could never explain that to anybody sure. anyway. There's just a lot of degrees to it. So how do you simplify up the chain of communication to speak to a broad audience? This was just practice for them, I noticed. You know, mm -hmm. but they were just there, they got in, they said their thing, they left. I kind of wanted to talk to him, but I didn't. But anyway, I realized in that moment, like, no, we're not, like, nobody's talking about this is a threat to this or that. This is an mm -hmm. option. This is an opportunity and optionality that you get to try. And if we're prevented from trying for this or that a reason, let's look at those reasons. Let's figure out whether they're well-intentioned or not. Because I think there are a lot of well-intentioned people that are probably going to try to stop it. Probably some bad actors that are going to try to stop it. But either way, like, how do you speak to both of those people and say, all right, well, what's a way w w which we can all win here? And I think that sooner or later, optionality just in and of itself as a principle is going to be important enough to enough people. This is the whole, like, uh, you know, women's rights movement this is the mm -hmm. civil rights movement this is any time any population of people uplifts itself through providing for choice for themselves we are simply saying to ourselves as individuals as a collective people i just want a choice to try to do some new technology that might be a little better like remember that time when you had to decide whether you had a flip phone or an iphone and you struggled with it for a bit you're like i don't know i'm really used to that <laughs> t9 texting style right, right. and i don't like the overcomplication of having a camera on my phone i'll think about it later and then like 10 years later it's like yeah we just all have iphones because that's the only thing you can make mm -hmm. you know what i mean mm -hmm. i think we're just we're getting through that period of i don't know that seems risky you know there's there's the doubt the fear the uncertainty right this is what we talk about when we say fud it's it is the inability to recognize the abundance mindset of potential here, hey. right? So like bringing it back around. Why? Uh -huh. What is this all for? It is because, oh, actually, there's a way better way we can be doing all the things we're already doing, and we're not upsetting the apple cart too much. And you know, every, like everybody wins here, and then we all just win a little bit more over time together, right? Like that's unheard of. Is that what you think happens here? I, I think directionally, yes. I think it's going to be a long road. I'm not saying this is tomorrow or next year. I'm saying we've flipped the bit culturally to some degree, and we have the optionality if we choose it. It is not guaranteed that we can all flip the bit together. Like, how do you get all the ones to orient together mm -hmm. at once? This is the 21E8 of it, the, the eight or nine leading zeros of it, of the mathematical mm -hmm. impossibility. This is, what does it mean for that to actually happen in that dimension or in this dimension such that something really unexpected emerges out of it, right? Like, I absolutely think that's possible. I don't think it takes... Poss possible. But I don't this think is it takes so, everybody. I like that you're saying possible, yeah. but I like that you're not saying has happened. Well, that's be different. Be yeah. Because that's what I feel like everybody's acting like right now, like something special's happened with AI. Okay. And I just feel like it's not. I feel like everybody's hyped by AI right now and nothing has happened. I don't think it will to the degree they're saying it is. I right? feel like what we're looking at is like we want AGI and nothing that's occurring is even close to AI. Like it's not even in the ballpark mm -hmm. of AGI. From my perspective, sure. It's not even worth the conversation like that where i'm not willing to debate like right. is it is it agi like can we admit that that's just a really hard problem i think it's i think we need i think we need to admit and this is where like my whole i my whole energy on ai is is that like not only is it a hard problem it's in i think it's impossible that's fair and i keep hearing elon talk about the, like not hearing hearing and seeing but mostly seeing, I would say, about like worrying about AI. Thinking back to like the Rogan interview, and he's like, it's so terrifying. No, it's fucking not. 
No, it's not. It's not writing any good raps. Hmm. It's it can't even produce a lifelike picture. Everybody's up in arms this week over the Adobe click and replace feature for Photoshop. All of the comments are this is not real. Huh. All the comments are like, I'm using it right now. Yeah. The the additions are laughable. They are not what is happening okay. in your video. And Adobe's like, can you please email support about that? That's what they say publicly. Uh-huh. Well, of course they'll fucking email support, but you guys are using this as a marketing tool that is, it's a lie. It's all a lie. Like until the stock market fucking plummets to zero because one company owns everything and one company goes to whatever the total of spy is, until that happens, AI has not happened. AGI mm-hmm. has not happened. Mm-hmm. And when there is total general, general intelligence, general, I'm talking retard intelligence with all the data average, available. Yeah. At the basic, I have all. Th- the, the problem is they use the word general. Mm. There's no option of general. When you have all of the data mm-hmm. and you have intelligence. You flip the bit. You fuck everything up today. Yeah. Right. There's no more like, a, is there a cure for cancer? It's like a bitch, are you retarded? Of course there's been a cure for cancer. You've been lied to. Mm. Here's the cure for cancer. Here's why it doesn't exist for you. Here's the company that held it back. Mm. Here are the decisions that that al- allowed this to happen. Mm-hmm. Here's the infrastructure put in place in 1937 or 1942 that led to this decision, that led it to not be approved by the FDA. Mm-hmm. Like It would literally be the entire lineage. That's intelligence. With all data, it would just explain everything to you that has ever happened. And like until we have that, we are lying to ourselves and we're being idiots about what this uh, new tool set is. Yeah. And uh, anybody that's hyping it up is a grifter. They're looking to uh, be smart. They're trying to be smarter than you in an arena that they are not smarter than you in. Hmm. They might be smarter than you in some arena, but it's not the arena that you're placating it to be. Understood. And like... Yeah. To me, it just like gets very complex quickly of explain to me how I'm wrong about what general intelligence with all fucking data would be able to do. And like the only argument I can see fit is not enough compute. Hmm. And then if they say not enough compute, then you have to, time is the only luxury, baby. Compute is a matter of time. So if we're talking about you don't have enough compute, then tell me how long it would take to get the answer with the current compute. Mm. I'm not retarded. <laughs> like it's very this is very simple. Straightforward that. It's very simple. Yeah. And like everybody wants to make it so complex of uh-huh. like it literal it cannot literally make an image. It can't even copy the image that I have or like make me move. Mm-hmm. Like it can't take a picture of me and bring it to life forever. If it could do that, that would be intel. That's the minimum. That is literally the minimum level of intelligence. Mm. The minimum, as soon as it becomes air quotes intelligent, I can feed it one image of me, period, and it will bring an entire life of me Hmm. to life Hmm. in video form of me moving. It could just follow everywhere. And then once it does that, once it does that, just give me a vacuum of literal fucking dirt devil button push vacuum that I can just walk around earth with, with a chip in that just can smell. (laughs) And then it can actually, once I sweep up the whole earth, it could tell me, it could show a video of like almost exactly what I did, at least where my asshole was. Mm. It could show me. Ex- I wish I was kidding. This is actually true. The vacuum. It, this is yeah. if you could actually show me. This is what analytics are. Yep. It's called analytics, <laughs> and everybody acts like it's not real. It could actually trace the next tech is it everywhere your butthole is leaking, your DNA, 
Everywhere you go, you have a full trail, a line coming out of your butthole everywhere you go for all time. So this little vacuum could just sweep around and so exactly, if you just sweep up the whole world, it could show exactly where you've been. Just a trail, literally on the ground. That's how gravity works. And a trail of your shit on the ground, you could just send a Roomba all over Earth and show you exactly where Andrew went, mm -hmm. all the places. That's, that's literally minimum intelligence because if it has minimum intelligence i mean i don't even know if that requires intelligence like it would almost just be hey go find this dna self-sort over these molecules exactly. within this database yeah, this all, is yeah. intelligence is mm -hmm. so far beyond yeah what we're talking about today and right. everybody's like this is it this is it i saw somebody tweet the other day the agi is here okay that's. I don't believe that, but okay. I I, I understand why they want to say it. But. I do, no, I don't believe it. I yeah. don't. I don't. I don't even know if it's po like intelligence is being able to connect two things and always make a joke. In my mind, like anything on the table in front of us, make a joke. Yeah. And if it can't figure out a joke that works, literally, it needs to be like our partner sitting here, our king sitting here that can make a joke that is contextually relevant to our lives in this moment right now and really make us laugh of like, holy shit, I can't believe you remember that. I can't believe that you're recalling this moment mm -hmm. and uh, a call back. And I need a call back that is actually culturally relevant in the moment. It's like familiarity, striking, yes. yeah, the engagement factor. All timing, yeah. mm -hmm. all of it. And until it can do that with like the right cadence, all these things that like it takes to make a good rap or tell a good joke, mm. then like I'm just super out on like talking about AI as like a yeah. good thing. And like everybody's like, it's gonna replace you. Like, bitch, ain't nothing replacing me. This is what I've been thinking. Everybody's like, nah, it's the new hotness. I'm like, okay, that's fine. It's not. It's great if that's your goal. You know, that's my whole thing is live and let live. That's fine. The AGI of it is is like, yeah, I'm with you. And I also think there are still tools that will be developed that are disruptive enough, right? Like, so it's kind of the yes and of it, which is I'm not afraid of a nuclear hypothesis of disaster where it takes over all the weapon systems and self-destructs because of, you know, paperclip sorting or, or whatever the fear is. No, I'm, I'm worried that a human will program a certain set of logics that will lead to a, you know, cascade effect of bad decisions being made in some autonomous system. Uh, Palmer Lucky. So this guy, um, Andrew, I forget his company. He's like a defense contractor guy. He's a super smart tech guy. Um, was talking about the automated systems of it all. Like, oh, we can just design, you know, uh, this or that sort of wartime component, whether that's a, a vehicle or a drone or whatever it is, and we can give it AI instruction, right? Mm -hmm. So like it'll make its own decisions on the field. Just like that in and of itself is like, all right, well, we've decided certain people say this set of logics is appropriate for this level of munition and I'm going to let it go. It is what it is now. Uh, you know, you hope there's a self-destruct or whatever it is, right? But like the logic, it's gone. It's out there. It's, there's no human. There's no Gaia with the joystick anymore, right? It's just like, you do you. You do you, it's fam. Not yeah. And that's, um, so I, I worry about that kind of thing because that feels like then we're, we're giving up the responsibility of saying, you know, when we affect meaningful aims, when we harm people in any dimension, Buildings, property, persons, etc. Like, imagine anything that can be used out there being used here, and then start from the perspective of what do you feel yes. about it. I don't think that that leads to something that allows more empathy. You know, like we're trying to create this intelligence because I think some people think, ah, oh, well, it can be smarter than the human without the emotion or without the right. Like that's the whole theory behind it. I feel like the emotion is supremely part of it. I don't it feel like you, it has to be. And so therefore, those of us that emote, that understand, like the vibe is everything, like this Every, is vibes, right? Yes. Like, And so if you can't do that, we've had to like isolate and isolate and isolate the skill set to be able to do it in any setting. I think you remove the human from it entirely. Of course, that goes haywire quickly. That's like obviously a bad result, no matter what. It's just like, even at the level of, oh, we- It's never going to be intelligence. 
And it's never going to be. Yes, it is disastrous, and it's never going to be what we think it's going to be. Yeah. I, I like. I don't. I would love to hear anyone tell. Like, I would love to hear an explanation of why someone thinks it's going to end up intelligent. Hmm. Evan and Colby have told both said like it's because compute's not high enough yet. That's not true. Hmm. It's just not true. Com- that's only the one dimension too. Compute over space and time is actually really part of it because there's a latency between computes. Um, we forget the physical distribution of compute sometimes when we think of the total network of compute. Mm-hmm. It does. It matters to a small degree if you have compute in China versus compute in the U.S. If the centralizing aggregator is somewhere that's non-local to that, then there's a triangulation problem, right? You do some Euclidean probably- geometry. I agree. I agree with what you're saying, but I think yeah. it, like I'm not trying to interrupt you, but it Go feels it. like yeah. it just feels like if you're talking about compute, yeah. it needs to be in relation to the total population outside of the space of the compute. So like, yeah. however much time it would take for that compute to like reach everyone is mm-hmm. really mm-hmm. what matters. So. But and also fractally, it matters the propagation path that it takes to get yes. there. Yes. Right. So like, it's yes. the sum aggregate of total yes. and also. Um, so the like compute... it would actually need to go through like the biggest influencers of all time yeah. first uh-huh, to, uh-huh, uh-huh. to matter Well, and you're, you're thinking attention. I start thinking energy, and I start thinking the biggest influencers are just the largest power generators yes, at each internodal absolutely. point, right? Like yep. we're playing a logistics distribution game of information transference, whether that attention is love or mm-hmm. you know like electrons, right? Um, so yeah, the compute is not enough. Is probably directionally there with the tandem of the distribution of compute is not complete. Like it needs much more and it needs in more spaces and it needs two more degrees, right? Like we do need the hundred, the 50, Mm -hmm. the 10, the one, like, but we're, we're, we're kind of far from that. We're working our way towards it. In this conversation, I just, I mean, I'm sure other people have had this thought, but it feels to me like, General intelligence should not be. Uh, I feel like we've always been looking at AI and like brain power for an individual, and mm. it feels like that shouldn't be the goal because I'm not an individual right. at, at this moment. The it mastermind feels, theory, yeah, yeah. It feels like yeah. it feels like the only way to be a total human is to be tapped into the hive totally. Mm. So, like, not only would I am, I am not doing all the compute that I'm doing. I'm offset. Like, I don't remember all the phone numbers I remember. That's true. I don't remember. I have so much memory stored in you. Hmm. I don't have any phone numbers for you, but I understand what you mean. But like you are feeding me information Mm -hmm. as I, maybe as I need it, actually. Maybe Maybe, like perfectly as I need it. Is that God's plan? Yeah. This is what I'm saying is if, if we're talking about AGI, like how could we not say that it would need total compute of the entire existence of humanity yeah. that we know of mm-hmm. to actually relegate some meaningful power? Oh, like it, it's almost hash power. So like it needs more hash power than we mm. do mm-hmm. for it to appear intelligent. Mm, there's some Like it needs to outsmart us totally yeah before our collective feels outsmarted because like if if we're all working together in tandem and all of our ideas are capable of being shared on twitter how could it ever collect those ideas and put them in a new way that was better than what we already had i know it could never throw a ball that's for sure (laughs) It figured out a way to transmute the energy of a lot of like distracted potential and it like signal was found in the noise by being persistent. We started the conversation with this. Just keep showing up. I, yes. I, I think this dollar. is AI. This is AI. Twitter is AI. Say Twitter more. is uh put out your thoughts if you feel worth if you feel they're worth sharing. I think more people should be I think more I would think Earth would be better if more people felt like their ideas were worthy of being shared. I agree. And like just sharing the ideas is everything. And that's that's what Twitter is to me, is a place mm. where anybody can post their idea. And if you have an idea that matches that keyword, do a search, see what comes up. Like if you miss it, cool. Mm-hmm. But... It wasn't meant for you at that time. Yeah, 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 yeah. It just wasn't right at the moment. 
All right. Well, my king, I've had so much fun speaking with you. I could Thank do this. You for I could me. literally do yeah. this another ten hours. I could do this. We'll nonstop. do it again. We yeah. will do it again. Do you have anything that you want to talk about or anything that you would like to plug before we, we finish here? Well, I want to thank you for doing this. I know we've talked about it. I was thinking, you know, it's it's really fun to have seen the initial vision of this when you first move in here. And it's like, all right, here we are. We're doing the thing we said we would do. Mm-hmm. It keeps moving. It's really fun. And I'm really grateful to be a part of that process. Um, other than that, I mean... You're I, the first to sit in that chair. Well, that I respect and appreciate. We'll Amen. see what happens from here, right? I'm, mm-hmm. uh, you know, thankful to be on that floor. That's... um. That's beautiful, and, and it is a, a Columbus, Ohio thing. This is Amen. something that... in the built in Ohio, sure. That's right, yeah. Shout out to Ohio X. This is uh, the movement. This is the wave. This is the next 10 years of it. So, you know, all I want to talk about is the fact that, like, this is it. This is the place to be. I'm really grateful to be here with, like you said, the, the smartest minds, right? Like, we find ourselves mm-hmm. in these rooms full of people that always give us insight, and you're um, definitely one of those people to me, and I really appreciate Thank you, you appreciate as you. always, so... Nothing else really to say other than, uh, you know, look forward to round two and amen. Uh, amen. Thanks for coming. When uh, you're doing, you, you have like the Bitcoin meetups here in Columbus. What are mm. those? Uh, every other Tuesday at 16 Bit Bar in Dublin, Ohio, there's a Bitcoin meetup. So people who are just interested in meeting people who are into that or learning a little bit more about it, uh, you know, six o'clock, show up, just hang out with some people that are really. Is that uh, casual? Kicking yeah, it? it's just uh, hanging out at a bar, pretty much. We get a table. It's a small group. Is it Bitcoin so. talk? For the most part. I mean, some of it's just life, right? Like, how, right, sh- how are your kids? You know what I mean? Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. there's, um, it, you know, it's a Bitcoin meetup specifically, and so there's a lot of uh, attention around that. So, And uh, how about the uh, Ohio Blockchain Council? What's going on with that, and what's next with that? Yeah, we are, you know, trying to push forward this idea that uh, blockchain technology, Bitcoin, these other types of... Um, software effects that we can implement into our systems to make them better, faster, more secure, um, belong in Ohio, and that those businesses should build in Ohio. And I think that similarly, the state of Ohio, because of its uniqueness, because of its richness, because of its heritage of innovation and trying hard things, new things, should be a place for this technology flourishes. So we're just standing out in front and saying that, and we'll see what happens from there. But I think it's the truth. So. Amen, my king. Follow Andrew Birchwell on Twitter, Salinotter. Yes. Uh, S-A-A-L. Two A's. Yeah. Uh, my king is brilliant, and uh, I'm very grateful that we cross paths, and uh, very happy that you live locally. It's been awesome to connect with you. been awesome to spend the time we have together. And Likewise. looking forward to much more, my king. Thanks for joining us today, and I look forward to having you again soon. Peace. Bye.